Chapter thirty six of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter thirty six China joins the fighting democracies. The circumstances connected with the entrance of the Republic of China into the World War were as follows. On February fourth, nineteen seventeen, the American minister, Dr. Reinsch, requested the Chinese government to follow the United States in protesting against the German use of the submarine against neutral ships. On February 9th, Pekin made such a protest to Germany and declared its intention of severing diplomatic relations if the protest were ineffectual. The immediate answer of Germany was to torpedo the French ship Atlas in the Mediterranean, on which were over 700 Chinese laborers. On March 10th, the Chinese parliament empowered the government to break with Germany. On the same afternoon, a reply was received from the German government to the Chinese protest of a very mild character. The reply produced a great deal of surprise in China. A Chinese statesman made this comment on the German change of attitude. The troops under Count Waldersee, leaving Germany for the relief of Pekin, were instructed by the warlord to grant no quarter to the Chinese. On the other hand, the latter were to be so disciplined that they would never dare look a German in the face again. The whirligig of time brings its own revenge, and today, after the lapse of scarcely seventeen years, we hear the Vosica Zeitung commenting on the diplomatic rupture between China and Germany, lamenting that even so weak a state as the Far Eastern Republic dares to look defiantly at the German nation. The breaking off of relations with Germany led to trouble between the President of the Republic and the Premier. The Premier desired to break off relations without consulting Parliament. The President insisted that Parliament should be consulted, which was actually done. The next move was to declare war, but here the Chinese statesmen hesitated, and their hesitation arose through their feeling toward Japan. They sympathized with the Allies, but to Chinese eyes Japan had stood for all that Germany, as depicted by its worst enemies, stood for. The Japanese government was professing friendliness to China, but that profession the Chinese could not reconcile with Japan's action in the Chino-Japanese War and on many other occasions since that war. In Chinese hearts, there was a strong feeling of distrust, fear, and hatred for their Japanese neighbor. There were other reasons also why they hesitated to declare war. Indeed, the devotion to peace, which is deep-rooted in the nation, would be a sufficient reason in itself. Moreover, China, like other neutral nations, was a strong center for German propaganda. German councils and diplomatic officers, who were scholars in Chinese literature and philosophy, and who also had sufficient funds to entertain Chinese officials as they liked to be entertained, were actively endeavoring to influence Chinese statesmen. The Chinese government, however, was determined to declare war, and to secure support, the Chinese premier summoned a council of military governors to consider the question. The majority of the conference agreed with the premier, but a vigorous opposition began to develop. On May 7th, the President sent a formal request to Parliament to approve a declaration of war. Parliament delayed and was threatened by a mob. The Premier was accused of having instigated the riot, and support began to gather for Parliament, and an attack was made on the Premier as being willing to sell China. Day by day, the differences between the militants and the Democrats became more bitter. The question of war was almost lost in the differences of opinion as to the comparative powers of Parliament and the Executive. A demand was made that the premier resign. He refused to resign and was dismissed from office by the president, who was supported in his action by the parliament. This was practically a success of the parliamentary party, when suddenly several of the northern generals and governors declared their independence, and the movement gradually developed into a revolution in favor of the restoration of the Manchu dynasty. This revolution was finally suppressed. The Japanese declared themselves, not the enemies, but the protectors of China, in terms that suggested the appearance of a Monroe Doctrine for Asia. They pledged themselves not to violate the political independence or territorial integrity of China, and declared strongly in favor of the principle of the open door and equal opportunity. On August 14th, China formally joined the Allies and declared war on Austria and Germany. She took no great part in the war, except to invade the German and Austrian settlements in Tientsin and Han Kao, which were taken over by the Chinese authorities. The Chinese officials also seized the Deutsche Asiatische Bank, which had been the financing agent in China for the German government, and 14 German vessels, which had been interned in Chinese ports. 
thousands of Chinese coolies were sent to Europe to work in the Allied interests behind the battle lines, and China has in all respects been faithful to her pledges. The official war proclamation of China, which was signed by President Feng Kao Chung, reviewed China's efforts to induce Germany to modify her submarine policy. It declared that China had been forced to sever relations with Germany and with Austria-Hungary to protect the lives and property of Chinese citizens. It promised that China would respect the Hague Convention regarding the humane conduct of the war and asserted that China's object was to hasten peace. On July 22nd, Siam officially entered the war and all German and Austrian subjects were interned and German ships seized. The Prince of Songkla, brother of the reigning monarch, declared that natural necessity and moral pressure forced Siam into the war on the side of the Entente. Neutrality had become increasingly difficult and it had become apparent that freedom and justice in states which were not strong from a military standpoint were not to be secured through the policy of the central powers. Sympathy for Belgium and the popular aversion to Teutonic methods had left no doubt as to the duty of Siam. The motive of Siam had a curious fitness, though there was a certain quaintness in her expression of a desire to make the world safe for democracy. The native name of Siam is Wong Tai, which means Kingdom of the Free, Siam is about as large as France and has a population of about eight millions. Its people, who are many shades of yellowish brown, have descended into this corner of Asia from the highlands north of Burma and east of Tibet. The tradition among these people was that the further south they descended the shorter they would grow and when they reached the southern plains they would be no larger than rabbits and that when they came to the sea they would vanish altogether. As a fact the northern tribes are much taller than the southern. The original population of the Siamese Peninsula was a race of black dwarfs, remnants of whom still dwell in caves and nests of palm leaves, so shy that it is almost impossible to catch a glimpse of them. The literary and religious culture of Siam comes mainly from southern India. Buddhism is the dominant religion, but there are many Mohammedans also. The accession of Siam to the ranks of the Allies did not make any great difference from a military point of view but it was another evidence of the general world feeling with regard to the Germans and their encroachments in all parts of the world. Germany had tried its best to keep these nations from participation in the war, but not only had her propaganda failed, but the feeling of these Oriental peoples was strongly anti-German. Much of this feeling, it is readily seen from their statements and their private letters, comes from a personal resentment of the boorish attitude of the individual German. By the end of 1918, the Teutonic influence in the Orient had completely disappeared. End of chapter 36。Chapter 37 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 37 The Defeat and Recovery of Italy. None of the surprises of the World War brought such sudden and stunning dismay to the Entente Allies as the news of the Italian disaster beginning October 24, 1917, and terminating in mid-November. It is a story in which propaganda was an important factor. It taught the Allies the dangers lying in fraternization between opposing armies. During the summer of 1917, the Second Italian Army was confronted by Austrian regiments composed largely of war-weary socialists. During that summer, skillful German propagandists operating from Spain had sown the seeds of pacifism throughout Italy. This was made easy by the distress then existing, particularly in the villages, where food was scanty and complaints against the conduct of the war were numerous. The propaganda extended from the civilized population to the army, and its channel was directed mainly toward the Second Army encamped along the Isonzo River. As a consequence of the pacifist preachments, both by word of mouth and document, the Second Army was ready for the friendly approaches that came from the front lines of the Austrians only a few hundred yards away. Daily communication was established, and at night the opposing soldiers fraternized generally. The Russian doctrine that an end of the fighting would come if the soldiers agreed to do no more shooting spread throughout the Italian trenches. This was all part of a plan carefully mapped out by the German high command. When the infection had spread, the fraternizing Austrian troops were withdrawn from the front trenches, and German shock troops took their places. On October 24th, these troops attacked in force. The Italians in the front line, mistaking them for the friendly Austrians, waved a greeting. 
German machine guns and rifles replied with a deadly fire, and the great flanking movement commenced. So well had the Germans played their game, the Italians lost more than 250,000 prisoners and 2,300 guns in the first week. The attack began in the Julian Alps and continued along the Isonzo southwestward to the plain of Venice. The Italian positions at Tolmino and Plezzo were captured, and the whole Italian force was compelled to retreat along a 75-mile front from the Carnic Alps to the sea. The most important point gained by the enemy in its early assault was the village of Caporetto on the upper Isonzo, where General Cardona held a great series of dams which could have drained the Isonzo River dry within twelve hours. The Italian retreat at places degenerated into a rout, and it was not until the Italians, reinforced by French and British, reached the Piave River that a stand was finally made. The defeat cost Cordona his command, and he was succeeded by General Armando Diaz, whose brilliant strategy during the remainder of the war marked him as a national hero and one of the outstanding military geniuses of the war. The order for general retreat was issued on October 27th. Poison gas shells rained blindness and death upon the retreating Italians and upon the heroic rear guards. The city of Udina and its environs were emptied of its inhabitants and Gorizia, which had been wrested after a desperate effort from the Austrians, was retaken on October 28th. That the entire Italian army escaped the fate that had come to the Russians at the Masurian Lakes was due mainly to the Third Army, commanded by the Duke of Osta. During the long-running fight, it faced about from time to time and drove the Germans back in bloody encounters. By November 10th, the Italian forces had come to the hastily prepared entrenchments on the west bank of the Piave River. The Austrians and the Germans dug in on the east bank from the village of Susagana in the Alpine foothills to the Adriatic Sea. Here a long drawn out battle was fought, resulting in enormous losses to the Germans and Austrians. By this time reinforcements had come up from the French front and every attempt by the enemy to gain ground met a bloody check. The hardest fighting was on the Asiago Plateau. There, Although the Italians were greatly outnumbered, the concentration of their artillery in the hills overlooking the great field completely dominated the situation. A factor that was of the utmost value in checking the Austrians was the system of lagoon defenses running from the lower Piave to the Gulf of Venice. From November 13th, when the Austrians in crossing the lower Piave in their headlong rush to Venice were suddenly checked by the Italian lagoon defenses, the entire Gulf of Venice with its endless canals and marshes, with islands disappearing and reappearing with the tide, was the scene of a continuous battle. A correspondent described the fighting as absolutely without precedent. The Teutons were desperately trying to turn the Italian right wing by working their way around the northern limits of the Venetian Gulf. The Italians inundated the region and sealed all the entrances into the Gulf by minefields. The Gulf, therefore, was converted into an isolated sea. Over this inland waterway, the conflict raged bitterly. The Italians had a lagoon fleet, ranging from the swiftest of motorboats, armed with machine guns, small cannon, and torpedo tubes, to huge, cumbersome, flat-bottomed British monitors, mounting the biggest guns. The Italian vessels navigated the secret channels dug in the bottom of the shallow lagoons. Only the Italian war pilots knew their courses. Even gondolas straying out of the channels were instantly and hopelessly stranded. Not only this, but as the muddy flats and marshy islands did not permit of artillery emplacements, the Italians developed an immense fleet of floating batteries. The guns ranged from three-inch field pieces to great fifteen-inch monsters. Each was camouflaged to represent a tiny island, a garden patch, or a houseboat. Floating on the glass-like surface of the lagoons, the guns fired a few shots and then changed position, making it utterly impossible for the enemy to locate them. The entire auxiliary service of supplying this floating army was adapted to meet the lagoon warfare. Munition dumps were on boats, constantly moved about to prevent the enemy spotting them. Gondolas and motorboats replaced the automobile supply lorries, customary in land warfare. Instead of motor ambulances, motorboats carried off the dead and wounded. Hydroaeroplanes replaced ordinary fighting aircraft. Along the northern limit of the Venetian Gulf were the Austrians, having filtered into the Piave Delta, sought to cross both the Sile and the Piave, the enemy each night hooked up pontoons. At daybreak every morning, one end of a huge pontoon structure was anchored to the east bank of the Piave, and the other flung out into the strong current, 
which soon stretched the makeshift bridge across. The moment this happened, the enemy infantry madly dashed across. Simultaneously, the Italian floating batteries opened a terrific fire. Practically every morning the Austrians tried the trick, and every morning they failed, with heavy losses, to effect a crossing. At last they gave up the attempt as hopeless, and the armies remained locked on Piave for several months. End of chapter 37、Chapter、38 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 38 Redemption of the Holy Land From the beginning of the war, the German General Staff and the British War Office planned the occupation of Palestine and Macedonia. Germany wanted dominion of that territory because through it lay the open road to Egypt and British prestige in the east. Turkey was the cat's paw of the Hun in this enterprise. German officers and German guns were supplied to the Turks, but the terrible privations necessary in a long campaign that must be spent largely in the desert, and the inevitable great loss in human life, were both demanded from Turkey. Great Britain made no such demands upon any of its allies. Unflinchingly, England faced virtually alone the rigors, the disease, and the deaths consequent upon an expedition having as its object the redemption of the Holy Land from the unspeakable Turk. Volunteers for the expedition came by the thousands. Canada, the United States, Australia, and other countries furnished whole regiments of Jewish eager youths for the campaign. The inspiration and the devotion radiating from Palestine, and particularly from Jerusalem and Bethlehem, drew Jew and Gentile, hardy adventurer, and zealous churchman into Allenby's great army. It was a long campaign. On February 26, 1917, Kut el Amara was recaptured from the Turks by the British expedition under command of General Sir Stanley Maud, and on March 11th following, General Maud captured Baghdad. From that time forward, pressure upon the Turks was continuous. On September 29, 1917, the Turkish Mesopotamian army, commanded by Ahmed Bey, was routed by the British. And historic Beersheba in Palestine was occupied on October 31st. The untimely death of General Maud, the hero of Mesopotamia, on November 18, 1917, temporarily cast gloom over the Allied forces, but it had no deterrent effect upon their successful operations. Siege was laid to Jerusalem and its environs late in November, and on December 8, 1917, the holy city, which had been held by the Turks for 673 years, surrendered to General Allenby and his British army. Thus ended a struggle for possession of the holiest shrines, both of the Old and New Testaments, that had cost millions of lives during fruitless crusades, and had been the center of religious aspirations for ages. General Allenby's official report follows. I entered the city officially at noon, December 11th, with a few of my staff, the commanders of the French and Italian detachments, the heads of the political missions, and the military attaches of France, England, and America. The procession was all afoot, and at Jaffa Gate I was received by the guards representing England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Australia, New Zealand, India, France, and Italy. The population received me well. Guards have been placed over the holy places. My military governor is in contact with the acting custodians and the Latin and Greek representatives. The governor has detailed an officer to supervise the holy places. The Mosque of Omar and the area around it have been placed under Muslim control, and a military cordon of Mohammedan officers and soldiers has been established around the mosque. Orders have been issued that no non-Muslim is to pass within the cordon without permission of the military governor and the Muslim in charge. A proclamation in Arabic, Hebrew, English, French, Italian, Greek, and Russian was posted in the citadel, and on all the walls, proclaiming martial law and intimating that all the holy places would be maintained and protected according to the customs and beliefs of those to whose faith they were sacred. The proclamation read, Proclamation To the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the blessed, and the people dwelling in its vicinity. The defeat inflicted upon the Turks by the troops under my command has resulted in the occupation of your city by my forces. I, therefore, proclaim it to be under martial law, under which form of administration it will remain so long as military consideration makes necessary. However, lest any of you be alarmed by reason of your experience at the hands of the enemy who has retired, I hereby inform you that it is my desire that every person should pursue his lawful business without fear of interruption. 
furthermore since your city is regarded with affection by the adherents of three of the great religions of mankind and its soil has been consecrated by the prayers and pilgrimages of multitudes of devout people of these three religions for many centuries therefore do i make it known to you that every sacred building monument holy spot shrine traditional site endowment pious bequest or customary place of prayer of whatsoever form of the three religions will be maintained and protected according to the existing customs and beliefs of those to whose faith they are sacred guardians have been established at bethlehem and on rachel's tomb the tomb at hebron has been placed under exclusive muslim control the hereditary custodians at the gates of the holy sepulchre have been requested to take up their accustomed duties in remembrance of the magnanimous act of the caliph omar who protected that church jerusalem was now made the center of the british operations against the turks in palestine mohammed v sultan of turkey died july third nineteen eighteen and many superstitious turks looked upon that event as forecasting the end of the turkish empire the turkish army in palestine was left largely to its fate by germany and austria and although it was numerically a formidable opponent for general allenby's forces that distinguished strategist fairly outmaneuvered the turkish high command in every encounter the beginning of the end for the turkish misrule in palestine came on september twentieth when the ancient town of nazareth was captured by the british a military net was thereupon closed upon the turkish army the fortified towns of bison and afula follow the fate of nazareth in one day's fighting eighteen thousand turkish prisoners one hundred and twenty guns four airplanes a number of locomotives and cars and a great quantity of military and food supplies were bagged by the victorious british so well did allenby plan that the british losses were far the smallest suffered in any large operation of the entire war it was the swiftest and most decisive victory of any scored by the allies it ended the grandiose dream of germany for an invasion of egypt in stark disaster and swept the holy land clear of the turks this great battle on the biblical field of armageddon was remarkable in that it was virtually the only engagement during the entire war offering the freest scope to cavalry operations british cavalry commands operated over a radius of sixty miles between the jordan and the mediterranean sweeping the turks before them by september twenty fifth the total bag of turkish prisoners exceeded forty thousand munitions depots covering acres of ground were taken whole companies of turkish soldiers were found sitting on their white flags waiting for the british to accept their terms two hundred and sixty five pieces of artillery were captured damascus was captured on tuesday october first after an advance of one hundred and thirty miles by general allenby since september first the day of his surprise attack north of jerusalem during that period a total of seventy three thousand prisoners were captured palestine's delivery from the turks was complete official announcement was made by the british war office that total casualties from all sources in this final campaign was less than four thousand plans for the government of the people of palestine were announced immediately the general scope was outlined in an agreement made between the british french and russian governments in nineteen sixteen under that arrangement republican france was charged with the preparation of a scheme of self-government the town of alexandretta was fixed upon as a free port of entry for the new nation End of chapter thirty eight Chapter thirty nine of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter thirty nine America's Transportation Problems. When America entered the war, there was a very great increase in the volume of business of the railroads of the country. The roads were already so crowded by what the Allies had done in purchasing war supplies that a great deal of confusion had resulted. The Allies had expended more than $3 billion in the United States, and as nearly all of their purchases had to be sent to a few definite points for shipment to Europe, the congestion at these points had become a serious difficulty. Thousands of loaded cars had to stand for long periods, awaiting the transfer of their contents to ships. This meant that thousands of cars, which had been taken from lines in other parts of the country, would be in a traffic blockade for weeks at a time. The main difficulty appeared to be that of getting trains unloaded promptly. The declaration of war by the United States made the situation very much worse. Not only did the railroads have to handle the freight destined for the Allies, but there was a very large addition to the passenger movement on account of the thousands of men that were being sent to the various training camps, 
and the immense masses of supplies that had to be sent to these camps. This included not only the ordinary supplies to the men, but thousands of carloads of lumber. Moreover, all over the country mills and factories were now being handed over to the government for war work, and to them, too, great quantities of raw material had to be sent, and the finished product removed to its destination. A vigorous endeavor to meet the new difficulties was instituted by the railroads themselves. They themselves named a war board, which was to cooperate with the government, and which was to have absolute authority. But this arrangement soon proved unsatisfactory. Each government official would do his best to obtain preference for what his department required, and to obtain that preference a system of priority tags was established, which became a great abuse. The result was that priority freight soon began to crowd out the freight which the railroads could handle according to their own discretion, thus seriously interfering with business all over the country. Naturally, the railroad executives and the government authorities studied the question with the greatest care, but they could not reach an understanding among themselves, nor with the administration. At last, the President settled the matter by announcing his decision to have the government take over complete control of the roads. The President derived his power from an act of Congress dated August 29, 1916, which reads as follows. The President in time of war is empowered, through the Secretary of War, to take possession and assume control of any system or system of transportation, or any part thereof, and to utilize the same to the exclusion, as far as may be necessary, of all other traffic thereon, for the transfer or transportation of troops, war material and equipment, or for such other purposes connected with the emergency as may be needful or desirable. The proclamation went into effect on December 28, 1917, and the President declared that it applied to each and every system of transportation and the appurtenances thereof, located wholly or in part within the boundaries of the continental United States, and consisting of railroads and owned or controlled systems of coastwise and inland transportation, engaged in general transportation, whether operated by steam or by electric power, including also terminals, terminal companies, and terminal associations, sleeping and parlor cars, private cars and private car lines, elevators, warehouses, telegraph and telephone lines, and all other equipment and appurtenances commonly used upon or operated as a part of such rail or combined rail and water systems of transportation that the possession, control, operation, and utilization of such transportation systems shall be exercised by and through William G. McAdoo, who is hereby appointed and designated Director General of Railroads. Said Director may perform the duties imposed upon him so long and to such extent as he shall determine through the boards of directors, receivers, officers, and employees of said system of transportation. President Wilson issued an explanation with this proclamation in which he said, This is a war of resources no less than of men, perhaps even more than of men, and it is necessary for the complete mobilization of our resources that the transportation systems of the country should be organized and employed under a single authority, and to simplify methods for coordination which have not proved possible under private management and control. A committee of railway executives, who have been cooperating with the government in this all-important matter, have done the utmost that was possible for them to do, but there were differences that they could neither escape nor neutralize. Complete unity of administration in the present circumstances involves upon occasion, and at many points, a serious dislocation of earnings, and the committee was, of course, without power or authority to rearrange charges or effect proper compensations in adjustment of earnings. Several roads which were willingly, and with admirable public spirit, accepting the orders of the committee, have already suffered from these circumstances, and should not be required to suffer further. In mere fairness to them, the full authority of the government must be substituted. The public interest must be first served, and in addition, the financial interests of the government and the financial interests of the railways must be brought under a common direction. The financial operations of the railway need not, then, interfere with the borrowings of the government, and they themselves can be conducted at a great advantage. Investors in railway securities may rest assured that their rights and interests will be as scrupulously looked after by the government as they could be by the directors of the several railway systems. Immediately upon the reassembling of Congress, I shall recommend that these different guarantees be given. The Secretary of War and I are agreed that, all the circumstances being taken into consideration, the best results can be obtained under the immediate executive direction of the Honorable William G. McAdoo whose practical experience particularly fits him for the service, 
and whose authority as Secretary of Treasury will enable him to coordinate, as no other man could, the many financial interests which will be involved and which might, unless systematically directed, suffer very embarrassing entanglements. President Wilson's proclamation stirred up great excitement on the stock market. Speculators rushed to buy back railroad stocks which they had previously sold short, and the market value of such stocks was raised more than $350 million as a result. The federal government's assumption of control of the railroads was generally recognized as the proper act under existing circumstances, and the guarantee of pre-war earnings made them a good investment. The railroad system in the United States consists of 260,000 miles of railroad, owned by 441 distinct corporations, with about 650,000 shareholders. It employs 1,600,000 men and represents a property investment of $17,500,000,000. The outstanding capital in round numbers is $16 billion, $9 billion of which is represented by a funded debt. The rolling stock comprises 61,000 locomotives, 2,250,000 freight cars, 52,000 passenger cars, and 95,000 service cars. All of this was now under the charge of William G. McAdoo. On January 4, 1918, President Wilson explained his plan to Congress and recommended legislation to put the new system of control into effect and to guarantee to the holders of railroad stocks and bonds a net annual income equal to the average net income for the three years ending June 30, 1917. The wise recommendations of President Wilson were at once approved by Congress. Provision was made for guaranteeing the railroads the income which he recommended and for financing the roads. The Railroad's War Board was abolished and Mr. McAdoo appointed an advisory board to assist him. This board consisted of John Skelton Williams, Controller of the Currency, Hale Holden, President of the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad, Henry Walters, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Atlantic Coast Line, Edward Chambers, Vice President of the Santa Fe Railroad and Head of the Transportation Division of the United States Food Administration, Walter D. Hines, Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Santa Fe. Specific duties were assigned to the various members of this committee. Mr. Williams was to deal with the financial problem, Mr. Holden to assume direction of committees and subcommittees, and other phases of the work were allotted to other members. Mr. Walter D. Hines was made assistant to the Director General. Mr. McAdoo's first order was to pool all terminals, ports, locomotives, rolling stock, and other transportation facilities. Another order had as its object to end the congestion of traffic in New York City and Chicago. It gave all lines entering these centers equal rights in trackage and water terminal facilities. This wiped out the identity of the great Pennsylvania Terminal Station in New York and gave all railroads the use of the Pennsylvania tubes under the Hudson River. The effect of government control of the railroads was felt from the very first. Coal was given the right-of-way, giving great relief to such sections as were suffering from fuel shortage. Many passenger trains were taken off, more than 250 of such trains being dropped from the schedules of the eastern roads. This permitted a great increase in the freight traffic. Orders were also given that all empty boxcars were to be sent to wheat-producing centers so that wheat could be moved to the Atlantic seacoast for shipment to England and France. These orders preceded the adoption of the Railroad Control Bill, which was not passed by Congress until March 14th. A feature of the bill is the proviso that government control of the railroads shall not continue more than 21 months after the war. After the passing of the bill, plans were made to make contracts with each railroad company for government compensation on the basis provided in the bill. The action of the government in thus assuming control of the railroads very naturally led to wide differences of opinion some of which were sharply expressed in the Congress of the United States. On the whole, however, public opinion decided that the government acted wisely. Certain inconveniences to the traveling public were easily excused when it was realized that the movement of troops throughout the country to the camps or from the camps to the ports which were to take them across the sea from Texas to Toul was being accomplished with great success, that the movement of war material was now possible, and that the gigantic railroad system was working without a hitch. Many details, in connection with the railroad management, were not at once worked out, and many months passed without complete agreements regarding the railway operating contracts. But this was a matter of greater interest to the owners than it was to patriotic citizens, anxious for the winning of the war. Governmental control of the railroads was only a beginning. On July 16th, President Wilson took control, for the period of the war, of all telegraph, telephone, cable, and radio lines, 
signing a bill on that day passed by Congress authorizing such action. The transportation of the American army across the ocean was the greatest military feat of its kind ever accomplished in history. The transportation of English troops during the Boer War meant a longer journey, but the number of troops sent on that journey was but a small fraction of America's army. The railroads in existence were not sufficient. The ships that were necessary could not be found in America's navy. It was necessary to build new roads, new docks, new terminals, new bases of supplies in America, and to send abroad thousands of trained workmen and experienced railroad engineers to build similar necessities in France. To convey the millions of men across the water, England had to come to the rescue, and though hundreds of American ships were built with a speed that was almost miraculous, they were in constant need of the assistance of the Allies. But wonderful men were put in charge of the work, wonderful organizers with wonderful assistance, and the great task was accomplished. As soon as the army was trained, it was sent across, first by thousands, then by tens of thousands, then by hundreds of thousands, until before the war was over, more than two million men had made the great trip over there. And throughout that trip, they were watched over as carefully as if they were at home. Every want was supplied. Food, clothing, munitions were all where they were needed. Even their leisure hours were looked after. Their health was attended to. Books, games, theaters, classes for those who cared to study, all were there. It was a wonderful performance, and the whole movement was conducted with clock-like precision. On such a day, at such an hour, the trained soldier would start. At such an hour, he would report in some Atlantic port. At such an hour, and such a minute, he would board ship. With equal precision, that ship would sail upon the appointed moment. Perhaps on the journey over, some submarine might delay the ship, but the destroyers were there on the alert, and the submarine was but an amusing episode. On the other side, the process was carried out with equal efficiency. Before the American doughboy could realize that he was in France, he was in his quarters, just like home, in the base camps behind the fighting line, and it was this miracle of transportation that won the war. A study of transportation construction in other countries showed that actual construction of railroads had been suspended in some cases, and in others retarded, but in not a few instances hastened by the war. Brazil experienced a more nearly complete suspension of railroad building than any of the other countries, but preparation was made for prompt resumption of construction with the return of more normal conditions. The Chinese building program also had been affected unfavorably by the war. Nevertheless, there were important additions made, aggregating approximately 800 miles during the war. Of the lines completed in 1917, two are of especial significance. One of these, a 140-mile section of the canton hankow line, a link in the route between South China and Peking. The other is a 60-mile feeder of the Trans-Siberian Railway in Manchuria. A line was extended from South Manchuria into Mongolia, the first railroad to penetrate this territory. Financial arrangements were made for the early construction of a line across southern Manchuria and for another connecting the peking Hankou and tianxin Pukau lines. Construction in Siberia proceeded rapidly. The completion, in 1915, of the Amur River Division of the Trans-Siberian in the east, together with the extension in 1913 of the ekaterinburg tumen line in Omsk, in the west, gave virtually a double track from European Russia to Vladivostok. A notable achievement in Africa was the continuation of the southern rail link in the Cape to Cairo route. This line was completed to Burkama on the navigable Congo, 2,600 miles from Cape Town. The railway in German East Africa was extended to Lake Tanganyika on the eve of the war, making a rail water line across the center of the continent. The railroad from Libito Bay was extended eastward to Kantanga, a rich mineral region of the Belgian Congo, and, with the road already reaching the Indian Ocean at Biera, gave a second east and west transcontinental line. A permanent standard gauge railroad was laid by the British Expeditionary Forces from Egypt into Palestine. Despite the magnitude of the Australian contribution to the Allied military and naval forces, the East and West Transcontinental Railway, begun in 1912, was completed in 1917. In all, more than 3,500 miles of track were built in the Commonwealth in the years 1915 to 1917. In Canada, the work of providing two transcontinental railroads was completed. Feeders were added, and a line from La Pa to Hudson Bay was under construction. From 1912 to 1916, more than 10,000 miles of track were put in operation 
nearly 7,000 of which were added in the first two years of the war. End of chapter 39Chapter 40 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 40 Ships and the Men Who Made Them. When the United States of America entered the World War, she was confronted at once by a serious question. The great Allied nations were struggling against the attempt of the Germans, through the piratical use of submarines, to blockade the coast of the Allied countries. It was this German action which had led America to take part in the war. It is true that America had other motives. Few wars ever take place among democratic nations as a result of the calculation of the nation's leaders. The people must be interested, and the people must sympathize with the cause for which they are going to fight. The people of America had sympathized with Belgium, and had become indignant at the brutal treatment of that inoffensive nation. They had sympathized with France in its gallant endeavor to protect its soil from the inroads of the Hun. This feeling had become a personal one as they reviewed the list of Americans lost in the sinking of the Lusitania, and this sympathy had gradually grown into indignation when the Germans, after having promised to conduct submarine warfare according to international law, again and again violated that promise. When, then, the Germans declared that they would no longer even pretend to treat neutral shipping according to the laws of maritime warfare, the people with one accord approved the action of the President of the United States in declaring war. The Germans at this time were making a desperate effort to starve England by destroying its commerce, and it was in the endeavor to accomplish this purpose that they thought it necessary to attack American ships. The first effort of Americans, therefore, was naturally to use every power of navy to destroy the lurking submarines, and in the second place to use every means in their power to supply the Allies with food. But America had for many years neglected to give encouragement to her merchant fleets. Her commerce was very largely carried on in foreign bottoms. Ships were needed, and needed urgently, and one of the very first acts of the American government was to authorize their production. Congress therefore appropriated for this purpose what was then the extraordinary sum of $1,135,000,000, and General Goethals, recently returned from his work in the building of the Panama Canal, was appointed manager of the Emergency Fleet Corporation, and entrusted with the execution of the government's shipbuilding program. The Emergency Fleet Corporation, however, was then independent of the United States Shipping Board, of which Mr. William Denman was made chairman and friction between General Gotals and Mr. Denman at the very start caused long delay. The difference of opinion between them arose over the comparative merits of wooden and steel ships. The matter was finally laid before President Wilson, and ended in the resignation of both men and the complete reorganization of the board and the fleet corporation, in which reorganization the fleet corporation was made subordinate to the shipping board, but given entire control of construction. Rear Admiral Capps succeeded General Gothals, but was compelled to resign on account of ill health. Rear Admiral Harris, who had been chief of the Navy's Bureau of Yards and Docks, then had the job for two weeks, but resigned because, in his opinion, he had not enough authority. Then came Mr. Charles Piez, who held the position for a longer period. Mr. Edward N. Hurley had been made chairman of the United States Shipping Board, and under the direction of these two men much progress was made. In the spring of 1918, the boards themselves were not satisfied with their progress, and on April 16, 1918, Mr. Charles M. Schwab, chairman of the board of directors of the Bethlehem Steel Corporation, was made director general of the Emergency Fleet Corporation. Mr. Schwab was one of the most prominent businessmen in the United States, and one of the best known, and his appointment was received all over the country with the greatest satisfaction. His wonderful work in building up the Bethlehem Steel plant not only showed his great ability, but especially fitted him for a task in which the steel industry bore such a vital part. The official statement issued from the White House read as follows. Edward N. Hurley, Charles M. Schwab, Bainbridge Colby, and Charles Piez were received by the President at the White House today. It was stated that the subject discussed was the progress and condition of a national shipbuilding program. The carrying forward of the construction work in the 130 shipyards now in operation is so vast 
that it requires a reinforcement of the shipbuilding organization throughout the country. Later in the day, Chairman Hurley of the Shipping Board announced that a new office with wide powers had been created by the trustees of the Emergency Fleet Corporation. The new position is that of Director General, and Mr. Schwab has been asked, and has agreed, to accept this position in answer to the call of the nation. Charles Piez, Vice President of the Emergency Fleet Corporation, recommended that the post of General Manager of the Corporation be at once abolished, so that Mr. Schwab, as the Director General, should be wholly unhampered in carrying on the large task entrusted to him. Mr. Piez, since the retirement of Admiral Harris, has been filling both the position of Vice President and that of General Manager. Mr. Schwab will have complete supervision and direction of the work of shipbuilding. He agreed to take up the work at the sacrifice of his personal wishes in the matter. His services were virtually commandeered. His great experience as a steelmaker and builder of ships has been drafted for the nation. Although the fact that the production during the month of March had not been as great as had been hoped probably brought about this change, it should also be said that those who had been responsible deserved much credit for what had actually been done. They had been handicapped constantly by poor transportation and shortages of materials, but had worked faithfully and with what under ordinary circumstances would be regarded as remarkable success. The call upon Mr. Schwab was simply an effort to draft into the service of the country its very highest executive ability. Mr. Schwab's name had been mentioned before for more than one government post, and it was thought that here was the place where his talents could have the fullest play. It was stated in Washington that he would receive a salary of one dollar a year. Mr. Schwab at once proceeded to speed up the shipping program. It took him just one day to arrange his own business affairs, and then he began his work. His first day was spent in going over the details of his task with Chairman Hurley and Mr. Piez. He then received newspaper men, beginning the campaign of publicity which turned out to be so successful. He was full of compliments for the work which had already been done. It is prodigious, splendid, magnificent, he said. It is far greater than any man who hasn't seen the inside of things can appreciate. The foundation is laid. That task is well done. We are going to get the results which are needed, and I should be proud if I could have any part in the accomplishment. All I can say for myself is that I am filled with enthusiasm, energy, and confidence. Mr. Hurley and I are in full accord on everything, and we are going to work shoulder to shoulder to make the work a success. But the large burden must fall upon the people at the yards, and they are entitled to any credit for success. I do not want to have any man in the shipyards working for me. I want them all to be working with me. Nothing is going to be worth while unless we win this war, and everyone must do the task to which he is called. One of the first steps that Mr. Schwab took to speed up ship production was to establish his headquarters in Philadelphia as the center of the shipbuilding region. Chairman Hurley remained at Washington, and the operating department, which included agencies such as the Inter-Allied Ship Control Committee, was removed to New York City. It was stated that nearly 50% of the work in progress was within a short radius of Philadelphia. The year before the war, the total output of the United States shipyards was only 250,000 tons. The program of the shipping board contemplated the construction of 1,145 steel ships, with a tonnage of 8,164,508 and 490 wooden ships, with a tonnage of 1,715,000. These, of course, could not be built in the shipyards then in existence. New shipyards had to be built in various parts of the country. In the first year after the shipping board took control, 188 ships were put in the water, and through requisition and by building, 103 more were added to the American merchant fleet. By April 1918, the government had at its service 2,762,605 tons of shipping. During the month of May, the first month after Mr. Schwab began his work, the record of production had mounted from 160,286 tons to 263,571. American shipyards had completed and delivered during that month 43 steel ships and one wooden ship. Mr. Hurley, in an address on June 10th, said, On June 1st, we had increased the American-built tonnage to over 3.5 million deadweight tons of shipping. This gives us a total of more than 1,400 ships, with an approximate total deadweight tonnage of 7 million, now under control of the United States Shipping Board. 
in round numbers and from all sources we have added to the american flag since our war against germany began nearly four point five million tons of shipping our program calls for the building of one thousand eight hundred and fifty six passenger cargo and refrigerator ships and tankers ranging from five thousand to twelve thousand tons each with an aggregate dead weight of thirteen million exclusive of these we have two hundred and forty five commandeered vessels taken over from foreign and domestic owners which are being completed by the emergency fleet corporation these will aggregate a total dead weight tonnage of one million seven hundred and fifteen thousand this makes a total of two thousand one hundred and one vessels exclusive of tugs and barges which are being built and will be put on the seas in the course of carrying out our present program with an aggregate dead weight tonnage of fourteen million seven hundred and fifteen thousand five billion dollars will be required to finish our program but the expenditure of this enormous sum will give to the american people the greatest merchant fleet ever assembled in the history of the world american workmen have made the expansion of recent months possible and they will make possible the successful conclusion of the whole program in the wonderful work that followed his appointment mr schwab constantly came before the public mainly through his addresses to the working men of the different yards his main endeavor was to stimulate enthusiasm and rivalry among the men a ten thousand dollar prize was offered to the yard producing the largest surplus above its program and he traveled throughout the country urging the employees at all the great yards to break their records the result of this work was that it was not long before it was announced that the monthly tonnage of ships completed by the allies exceeded the tonnage of those sunk by the german submarine the menace of the submarine which had seemed so formidable had disappeared the most important of the great shipyards which were producing the american cargo ships was at hog island in the southwest part of philadelphia this shipyard may indeed be called the greatest shipyard in the world before mr schwab became director general much criticism had been launched at the work that was going on there and an investigation had been made which resulted in a favorable report on august fifth the new shipyard launched its first ship the seventy five hundred ton freight steamer quisconk in the presence of a distinguished throng among whom were the president of the united states and mrs woodrow wilson the ship was christened by mrs wilson and the president swung his hat and led the cheers as the great ship glided down the ways the name quistconk is the ancient indian name of hog island the crowd numbered more than sixty thousand people and special trains from washington and new york brought many notable guests president and mrs wilson were escorted by mr hurley and mr schwab and apparently thoroughly enjoyed the occasion an enormous banquet was presented to mrs wilson by foreman mcmillan who had driven the first rivet in the quisconk's keel shortly after the armistice it was announced that the hog island plant would be acquired by the united states government the real estate valued at one million seven hundred sixty thousand dollars was owned by the american international shipbuilding company and the government had invested about sixty million dollars in equipping the plant at the time the war ended thirty five thousand persons were at work and a hundred and eighty ships were in the various stages of completion an interesting feature in connection with the endeavor to speed up was the competition in riveting early in the year in yard after yard expert riveters were reported as making extraordinary records and prizes were offered to the winners of such records later however such contests were discouraged by chairman hurley and by others the best record was made by john omer who drove twelve thousand two hundred and nine rivets in nine hours at the belfast yards of workman and clark in the accomplishment of this feat on two occasions he passed the mark of one thousand four hundred rivets an hour in his best minute he drove twenty-six rivets the ships constructed by the shipping board were of steel of wood and of concrete and at times considerable difference of opinion existed with regard to which form of ship should receive the most attention the policy of the government seemed finally to favor the steel as it was claimed that the wooden type was not only more expensive but that it was less efficient however until the very end wooden ships in great numbers were being built on may thirty first the steamship agawam described as the first fabricated ship in the world was launched in the yards of the submarine boat corporation at newark this was essentially a standardized steel cargo ship fabricated is the technical term applied to ships built from numbered shapes made from patterns president Kars of the submarine boat corporation 
said that the Agawam was the first of a hundred and fifty vessels of that type which would be constructed in the yard. The parts were made, he said, in bridge and tank shops throughout the country, and were assembled at the yard. Ninety-five percent of the work in forming the parts entering into the hull of this vessel, and punching rivet holes, is done at shops widely separated from drawings furnished by the company, and these drawings have been of such exactitude, and the work has been so carefully performed by the different bridge shops, that when they are brought together at this yard they fit perfectly, and the ship, as you see it, is absolutely fair. The construction of the hull of this vessel requires the driving of over 400,000 rivets, and by our method more than one quarter of these rivets are driven at the distant shops, the different parts being brought into the yard in sections as large as can be transported on the railroad. Each part is numbered and lettered, and as they are shaped perfectly, all that is necessary is to place them in position, bolt them, and finally fasten them with rivets. Officials of the company said that they expected to launch in the course of time two such vessels each week. A standard ship of this type has a deadweight carrying capacity of 5,500 tons. It is 343 feet long and 46 feet wide, and is expected to show an average speed of 10 and a half knots. Fuel oil is used to generate steam, to drive a turbine operating 3,600 revolutions a minute. The oil is carried in compartments of the double bottom of the ship, in sufficient quantity for more than a round trip to Europe. 27 steel mills, 56 fabricating plants, and 200 foundries and equipment shops are drawn upon to construct the ship. In addition to the steel and wood vessels, the Emergency Fleet Corporation also constructed a number of concrete ships. The first step in this direction was taken on April 3rd, when the construction of four 7,500-ton concrete ships at a Pacific Coast shipyard was authorized. This action was taken as a result of a report on the trials made with the concrete ship Faith, which was built in San Francisco by private capital. The test of this ship had been satisfactory, and Mr. R. J. Wigg, an agent of the Emergency Fleet Corporation, who had made a careful inspection of the Faith and watched the tests, reported his confidence in the new cargo carrier. The successful trial trip of the Faith led, on the 17th of May, to the government order that 58 more such ships be constructed. Sites for yards were leased and contracts awarded. The concrete ship turned out to be a great success. The extraordinary success of the American shipbuilding program during the World War was due to the enthusiasm of the workmen employed at the government plants, and that same enthusiasm was found in connection with their work in every industry on which the government made demands. American labor was thoroughly loyal. It recognized that in the war for democracy against autocracy it had a vital concern. The attitude of the great American labor unions must, however, be sharply distinguished from that of the extreme socialists who refused to take any part in helping to win the war. From the very beginning, the American Federation of Labor took a patriotic stand. Its leader was Mr. Samuel Gompers, and it was fortunate for America that the leadership of this great organization was in such patriotic hands. Mr. Gompers had been for many years president of this great labor organization, and was so often called in consultation by the President of the United States in connection with labor affairs that he might almost be called an unofficial member of the President's cabinet. Mr. Gompers was by birth an Englishman, but he had left his home when still a boy, and was thoroughly filled with true American patriotism. From the beginning he devoted himself with the greatest enthusiasm not only to the protection of the interests of which he was in charge, but to the prosecution of a successful war. He had to contend, as labor leaders in other countries had been compelled to contend, with socialistic and anarchistic organizations. During the period of America's participation in the war, there were certain disturbances caused by the IWW, but from such movements the American Federation of Labor held itself aloof. Occasional strikes on account of special conditions were easily settled. The governmental assumption of control over railroads and other essential industries had much to do with the peaceful attitude of the workmen. The very high wages which were offered to the workmen at munitions works, shipbuilding plants, and other governmental enterprises enabled the workmen there to live in reasonable comfort, though it caused a great deal of trouble in private industry, and compelled an increase in pay to labor all over the land. In the latter part of the war, Mr. Gompers traveled abroad, as a representative of American labor, and was greeted everywhere with the utmost enthusiasm while his influence was strongly felt in favor of moderate and sane views as to labor's rights. 
The American situation with regard to labor was made much simpler by the organization of the United States Employment Service. This was made an arm of the Department of Labor, with branch offices in nearly all the large cities of every state. It had a large corps of traveling examiners, men skilled in determining the fitness of workers for particular jobs, and it undertook to recruit labor for the various war industries in which they were needed. During the last year of the war, from 150,000 to 200,000 workers of all kinds were given work each month. In addition to this, the employment service was a clearinghouse of information for manufacturers. The director general of this service was Mr. John B. Densmore. Labor throughout the country, except when influenced by men of foreign birth who were not in touch with the spirit of America, was universally loyal, and its sharing in the winning of the war will always remain a matter for pride. End of chapter 40、Chapter、41 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 41 Germany's Dying Desperate Effort. In the spring of 1918, it must have been plain to the German High Command that if the war was to be won, it must be won at once. In spite of all their leaders said of the impossibility of bringing an American army to France, they must have been well informed of what the Americans were doing. They knew that there were already more than two million men in active training in the American army, and while at that time only a small proportion of them were available on the battlefront, yet every day that proportion was growing greater, and by the middle of the summer the little American army would have become a tremendous fighting force. Their own armies on their western front had been enormously increased in size by the removal to that front of troops from Russia. Hundreds of thousands of their best regiments were now withdrawn from the east, and incorporated under the command of their great generals, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, in the armies of the west. They must, therefore, take advantage of this increased force and win the war before the Americans could come. The problem of the Allies was also simple. It was not necessary for them to plan a great offensive. All they had to do was to hold out until, through the American aid which was coming now in such numbers, their armies would be so increased that German resistance would be futile. Under such circumstances began the last great offensive of the German army. At that time it seems probable that the armies of Great Britain and France numbered about 3,500,000 men, and that, of these, 670,000 were on the front lines when the German attack began leaving an army of reserve of about 2,850,000 men. A considerable number of these were probably in England on leave. The number of French soldiers must have been between 4 and 5 million, of whom about 1,500,000 were on the front line. Adding to these the American, Belgian, Portuguese, Russian, and Polish troops, the Allied forces could not have been short of 8,500,000 men. The strength of the Germans on the Western Front before the Russian Revolution was probably about 4,500,000 men, and the withdrawal of Russia from the war had added to that number probably as many as 1,500,000 men, making an army of 6 million men to oppose that of the Allies. The Allies, therefore, must have considerably outnumbered the Germans. In spite of this fact, in nearly all the engagements in the early part of the Great Offensive, the Allied forces were outnumbered in a ratio varying from 3 to 1 to 5 to 3. This was possible, first, because in any offensive the attacking side naturally concentrates as many troops as it can gather at the point from which the offense is to begin, and second, since the Allies were not under one command, it was with great difficulty that arrangements could be made by which the forces of one nation could reinforce the armies of another. The first difficulty, of course, could not be obviated, but the solution of the second difficulty was the appointment of General Foch as Commander-in-Chief of all the Allied forces. The appointment was made on March 28th, and all the influence of the United States had been exerted in its favor. General Pershing at once offered to General Foch the unrestricted use of the American force in France, and it was agreed that a large part of the American army should be brigaded with the Allied troops wherever there were weak spots. Folk was already famous as the greatest strategist in Europe. He comes of a Basque family and was born in the town of Tarbes, in the department of the Hoyt Pyrenees, which is on the border of Spain, on October 2, 1851. Folk served as a subaltern in the Franco-Prussian War, and at 26 he was made captain in the artillery. Later he became professor of tactics in the École de Guerre, 
where he remained for five years. He then returned to regimental work and won steady promotion until he became a brigadier general. He was sent back to the War College as director and wrote two books, The Principles of War and Conduct of War, which have been translated into English, German, and Italian, and are considered standard works. He is now recognized as a man of unusual ability, and was appointed to the command first of the 13th Division, then of the 8th Corps at Berg, and then to the command of the 20th Corps at Nancy. Unlike Marshal Joffrey, who was cool, careful, slow-moving, Marshal Falk is full of daring and impetuosity. Everything is calculated scientifically, but his strategy is full of dash. Many of his sayings have been passed from mouth to mouth among the Allies. Find out the weak point of your enemy and deliver your blow there, he said once at a staff banquet. But suppose, General, said an officer, that the enemy has no weak point. If the enemy has no weak point, replied the commander, make one. It was he who telegraphed to Joffrey during the first battle of the Marne, the enemy is attacking my flank, my rear is threatened, I am therefore attacking in front. Folk is a great student, and a special admirer of Napoleon, whose campaigns he had thoroughly studied. Even the campaigns of Caesar he had found valuable, and had gathered from them practical suggestions for his own campaigns. He is the hero of the Marne, the man who on September ninth marched his army between von Bülow and von Hausen's Saxons, drove the Prussian guards into the marshes of St. Gond, and forced both Prussians and Saxons into their first great retreat. Later his armies fought on the Iser, while the British were battling at Ypres. During the Battle of the Somme he was on the English right, pressing to Peronne. For a time he became chief of the French staff, until he was called into the field again to his great command. Folk was one of those French officers who had felt that war was sure to come, and had constantly urged that France should be kept in a state of preparedness. The appointment of General Folk to the supreme command was largely the result of American urgency. General March, the American chief of staff, in one of his weekly announcements, stated, One of the most striking things noticeable in the situation, as it is shown on the Western Front, is the supreme importance of having a single command. The acceptance of the principle of having a single command, which was advocated by the President of the United States, and carried through under his constant pressure, is one of the most important single military things that has been done as far as the Allies are concerned. The unity of command which Germany has had from the start of the war has been a very important military asset, and we already see the supreme value of having that central command which now has been concentrated in General Folk. General March, who had earlier been appointed Chief of Staff of the United States Army, was sending a steady stream of American troops to Europe, a fact whose importance was well understood by the new Commander-in-Chief. On General March's promotion, General Falk sent him the following message. I hear with deep satisfaction of your promotion to the rank of General. I associate myself to the just pride which you must feel in evoking the names of your glorious predecessors, Grant and Sheridan. I convey to you my sincere congratulations, and I am happy to see you assume permanently the huge task of Chief of Staff of the United States Army, which you are already performing in so brilliant a way. General March replied, Your message of congratulation upon my promotion to the grade of General Chief of Staff, United States Army, was personally conveyed to me by General Vignal, French military attaché. I appreciate deeply your most kindly greetings and in expressing my most sincere thanks, avail myself of the opportunity to assure you of every assistance and constant support which may lie in my power to aid you in the furtherance and successful accomplishment of your great task. General Folk took command at a very critical time. The Germans had prepared the most formidable drive in the history of the war. They had gathered immense masses of munitions and supplies. Their great armies had been refitted, and they were in hopes of a victory which would end the war. Their great offensive had many phases. It resulted in the development of three great salients, the first in Picardy, and in the direction of Amiens, along the Somme, which was launched on March 21st, the second on the Lys, which was launched on April 9th, and the third, which is called the Oismarne salient, launched on May 27th. Between the attacks which developed these salients, there were also some unsuccessful attacks of almost equal power. On March 28th there was a desperate struggle to capture Arras, preceded by a bombardment as great as any during the whole offensive, but this attack was defeated with enormous losses to the German troops. A fourth phase of the German offensive took place on June 9th, on a front twenty miles between Noyon and Montdidier, 
which gained a few miles at an enormous cost. On July 15th came the last of the great offensives. It was a smash on a sixty-mile line from Chateau Trier, up the Marne, around Reims, and then east to a few miles west of the Argonne Forest. This offensive at the start made a penetration of from three to five miles, but was held firmly and much of the gain lost through the counterattacks of the Allies. It was at this point that the American troops first began to be seriously felt, and it was at this point that General Folk took up the story and began the great series of Allied drives which were to crush the German power. But there had been many days of great anxiety before the turn of the tide. The objects of the German drives were doubtless more or less dependent upon their success. The first drive in Picardy, in the direction of Armines, had apparently as its object to drive a wedge between the French and British, and the object was so nearly attained that only the heroic work of General Clary saved the Allies from disaster. The 5th British Army, which had borne the brunt of the German attack, had found itself almost crushed by the sheer weight of numbers. The whole line was broken up, and it seemed as if the road was open to a means. French reinforcements could not come up in time. Bridges could not be blown up, because the engineers were all killed. Orders came to General Carey at two o'clock in the morning, March 26th, to hold the gap. He at once proceeded to gather an extemporized army. Every available man was rounded up, among others a body of American engineers, laborers, sappers, raw recruits, as well as soldiers of every arm. There were plenty of machine guns, but few men who knew how to handle them. With this scratch army in temporary trenches, he lay for six days, and, as Lloyd George said, they held the German army and closed that gap on the way to the Amines. During this fight, General Carey rode along the lines, shouting encouraging words to his hard-pressed men. He did not know whether he would get supplies of ammunition and provisions or not, but he stuck to it. Later on, the regular troops arrived. The American engineers, who had been fighting, immediately returned to their base and resumed work laying out trenches. General Rawlinson, commander of the British Army at that point, sent the commanding officer of the Americans engaged the following letter. The Army commander wishes to record officially his appreciation of the excellent work your regiment has done in assisting the British Army to resist the enemy's powerful offensive during the last ten days. I fully realize that it has been largely due to your assistance that the enemy has been checked, and I rely on you to assist us still further during the days that are still to come before I shall be able to relieve you in the line. I consider your work in the line to be greatly enhanced by the fact that for six weeks previous to your taking your place in the front line, your men had been working at such high pressure erecting heavy bridges on the Somme. My best congratulations and warm thanks to all. Rawlinson the demoralization of General Goh's Fifth Army, which had thus left an eight-mile gap on the left, and which had been saved at that point by General Carey, permitted also the opening of another gap between its right wing and the Sixth French Army. Here General Fayol did with organized troops what Carey had done with his volunteers further north. The reason for the success of both Carey and Fayol appears to have been that the German armies had been so thoroughly battered that they were unable to take advantage of the situation. Their regiments had been mixed up, their officers had been separated from their men in the rush of the attack, and before they could recover the opportunity was lost. The first days of April saw the end of the drive toward Amain. The Germans claimed the capture of 90,000 prisoners and 1,300 guns. They had penetrated into the Allies' territory in some points a distance of 35 miles. Their new line extended southwest from Arras beyond Albert to the west of Muriel which is about nine miles south of Amiens, and then went on west of Perpont and Montdidier, curving out at Noyon, to the region of the Oise. The first part of April was a comparative calm. Then suddenly there developed the second drive of the German offensive. This drive was not so extensive as the first one, and its object appeared to be to break through the British forces in Flanders and reach the Channel ports. It resulted in a salient embracing an area about 320 square miles, and the Germans claimed the capture of 20,000 prisoners and 200 guns. It was at this point that General Haig issued his famous order, in which he described the British armies as standing with their backs to the wall. It reads as follows. Three weeks ago today, the enemy began his terrific attacks against us on a 50-mile front. Its objects are to separate us from the French, to take the channel ports, and to destroy the British army. 
in spite of throwing already one hundred and six divisions into the battle and enduring the most reckless sacrifice of human life he has yet made little progress toward his goals we owe this to the determined fighting and self-sacrifice of our troops words fail me to express the admiration which i feel for the splendid resistance offered by all ranks of our army under the most trying circumstances many among us now are tired to those i would say that victory will belong to the side which holds out the longest the french army is moving rapidly and in great force to our support there is no other course open to us but to fight it out every position must be held to the last man there must be no retiring with our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause each one of us must fight to the end the safety of our homes the freedom of mankind depend alike upon the conduct of each one of us at this critical moment the british commander's order made the situation clear to the british people and to the world the germans had given up for the moment their attempt to divide the british and french armies and were now attempting to seize the channel ports and the british were fighting with true british pluck with their backs to the wall one can imagine the anxiety in the villages of flanders where they watched the german advance and heard the terrible bombardment which was destroying their beautiful little cities and threatening to put them under the dominion of the brutal conquerors of belgium town after town fell to the enemy until at last the german attack began to weaken counter-attacks on april seventeenth recaptured the villages of wichet and metteren at other points german attacks were repulsed and the attack on the lees had reached its limit it had not only failed to reach the coast but had not even reached so far as to force the evacuation of ypres or to endanger arras on the contrary the germans had paid for their advance by such terrible losses that the ground that they had gained meant almost nothing then they made on april thirtieth a vigorous endeavor to broaden the Amiens salient in the region of handgard and noyon this attack also failed on may twenty seventh ludendorff made his next move this was in the south and was preceded by the most elaborate preparations over a forty-mile front at first it met with great success german troops from a point northwest of rheims to montdidier were moving apparently with the purpose of breaking the french lines and clearing the way for a drive to paris consternation reigned among allied observers as the germans carried apparently with ease first the formidable chemin de dame which was believed invulnerable and then the south bank of the aisne with its great fortifications at soissons criticism began to appear of general foch who was then thought at first to have been taken by surprise the germans were using four hundred thousand of their best troops and the greatest force of tanks machine guns and poison gas projectors which they had ever gathered they captured over forty five thousand prisoners and took four hundred guns they penetrated thirty miles and gained six hundred and fifty square miles of territory but they were held on the river marne it is now apparent that general folk knew exactly what he was about he might easily by sending in reinforcements have put up the same desperate resistance to the german offensive which they were now meeting in other sectors but he preferred to retreat and lead the enemy on to a position which would make them vulnerable to the great counter-attack he was preparing for them on their flank the germans reached the marne but they paid for it in the terrible losses which they incurred the german line now from montdidier the extreme point of the amine salient to chateau thier the point of the new marne salient was in the form of a bow and on june ninth general ludendorff attempted to straighten out the line his new attack was made on a twenty-mile front between montdidier and noyon in the direction of compiegne this was another terrific drive and at first gained about seven miles french counter-attacks however not only held him in a vice but regained a distance of about one mile this battle was probably the most disastrous one fought by the germans during their whole offensive nearly four hundred thousand men were completely used up without gaining the slightest strategic success then followed a period without battles of major importance during which general folk by periodic assaults on the lees the somme on the flanks of montdidier and soissons on the chateau thierry sector and southwest of rheims captured many important positions and kept the enemy in constant anxiety during the great german offensives the germans had lost at least five hundred thousand men while the casualties of the allies were barely one hundred and fifty thousand the germans also were beginning to lose their morale they were finding that however great might be their efforts however terrible might be their losses they were still being constantly held their troops were now apparently made of inferior material 
and included boys, old men, and even convicts. The system of making attacks by means of shock troops was producing the inevitable result. The shock regiments were composed of selected men, picked here and there from the regular troops. Their selection had naturally weakened the regiments from which they were taken. After three months of great offensives, these shock troops were now in great part destroyed, and the German lines were being held mainly by the inferior troops which had been left. Moreover, in other parts of the world, the allies of Germany were being beaten. In Italy and Albania and Macedonia there was danger. The Germans prepared for one more effort. On June 18th, they had made a costly attempt to carry Reims. On July 15th, they made their last drive. Ludendorff took almost a month for preparation. He gathered together 70 divisions and great masses of munitions, and then drove from chateau Thierry on a 60-mile line up on the Marne, and then east to the Argonne Forest. His line made a sort of semicircle around Reims, and then pushed south to the east and west of that fortress. Once again he had temporary success. West of Reims he penetrated a distance of five miles, and on the first day had crossed the Marne at Dormans, but he was held sharply by the Americans east of chateau Thierry. On the second day he made further gains, but with appalling losses. On the 17th he was still struggling on with minor successes, but on the 18th the French and Americans launched the great counter-offensive from chateau Thierry along a 25-mile front between the Marne and the Aisne. The Germans everywhere began their retreat, and the war-tide had turned. The German attack east of Reims had been a failure from the start. The Allied forces retired about two miles and then held firm. The country there is flat and sandy, and gave little shelter to the attacking forces, which lost terribly. In this sector, too, there were many American troops, who behaved with distinguished bravery. By this time nearly 700,000 men of the American army were on the battle line. They had been fighting here and there, among the French and English, but on June 22nd General March made the announcement that five divisions of these troops had been transferred to the direct command of General Pershing as a nucleus for an American army. In glancing back at the great German drives, which have now been described, one is impressed by the terrific character of the fighting. This struggle undoubtedly was the greatest exertion of military power in the history of the world. Never before had such masses of munitions been used. Never before had scientific knowledge been so drawn on in the service of war. Thousands of airplanes were patrolling the air, sometimes scouting, sometimes dropping bombs on hostile troops or on hostile stores, sometimes flying low, firing their machine guns into the faces of marching troops. Thousands upon thousands of great guns were sending enormous projectiles, which made great pits wherever they fell. Swarms of machine guns were pouring their bullets like water from a hose upon the charging soldiers. One of the most notable artillery developments was the long-range gun, which off and on during this period was bombarding Paris. This bombardment began on March 23rd, when the nearest German line was more than 62 miles away. For a time the story was regarded as pure fiction, but it was soon established that the great nine-inch shells which were dropping into the city every twenty minutes came from the forests of St. Gobain, seven miles back of the French trenches near Léon, and about seventy-five miles from Paris. This was another of those futile bits of frightfulness in which the Germans reveled. Military advantage gained by such a gun was almost nothing, and the expense of every shot was out of all proportion to the damage inflicted. It only roused intense indignation and stirred the Allies to greater determination. The first day's casualties in Paris were ten killed and fifteen wounded. By the next day one would not have been able to tell from the Paris streets that such a bombardment was going on at all. The subway and surface cars were running, the streets were thronged, and traffic was going on as usual. About two dozen shells were thrown into Paris every day, mainly in the Montmartre district, in a radius of about a mile. This seemed to show that the gun was immovable. On March 29th, however, a shell struck the church of St. Gervais during the Good Friday service, killing 75 persons and wounding 90. Fifty-four of those killed were women. The church had been struck at the moment of the elevation of the host. This outrage aroused special indignation, and Pope Benedict sent a protest to Berlin. An examination of the exploded shells indicated that the new German gun was less than nine inches in caliber, and that the projectiles, which weighed about 200 pounds, contained two charges in two chambers, connected by a fuse which often exploded more than one minute apart. It took three minutes for each shell to travel to Paris, and it was estimated that such a shell rose to a height of 20 miles from the earth. Three of these guns were used. 
One of these guns exploded on March 29th, killing a German lieutenant and nine men. The Kaiser was present when the gun was first used. It was said by American scientists that seismographs in the United States felt the shock of each discharge. On April 9th, French aviators discovered the location of the new guns, and French artillery began to drop enormous shells weighing half a ton each near the German monsters. A few days later, a French shell fell on the barrel of one of these guns and put it out of commission. Great craters were made around the other, interfering with its use, and toward the end of the period it was only occasionally that the remaining gun was fired, and no great damage resulted. Another feature of the great German drives was the tremendous destruction that accompanied them. Not only were churches, public buildings, and public houses throughout almost the whole district turned into ruins, but the very ground itself was plowed up into craters and shell holes, and the trees smashed into mere splinters. During the whole campaign, poison gas of various kinds was used in immense quantities, and it was constantly necessary for the troops to wear gas masks. Sometimes after a town had been evacuated by the enemy, it was so filled with gas that it was impossible for victorious troops to enter. One of the fiercest bombardments was that directed against the Portuguese during the fighting along the Lys. The enemy made a special attempt to crush the Portuguese contingent, which behaved with the utmost gallantry. It was the season of the year when the orchards were covered with blossoms and the fields with flowers, but the horrors of war destroyed the beauty of the spring. In these battles men fought until they were completely exhausted, and one could see troops staggering as they walked and leaning on each other from pure exhaustion. These were days when wonders were performed by the medical departments of the Allied armies, and the work of the Red Cross was almost as important as the work of the soldiers. Relief for the wounded had to be undertaken and carried on a mammoth scale. Many of the doctors, nurses, orderlies, and ambulance men lost their lives while making efforts to rescue the wounded. These were days when the German leaders were filled with the pride of victory. They were talking now about a hard German peace. On June 17th, the German Kaiser celebrated the 30th anniversary of his accession to the throne. He talked no more of a war of self-defense, but declared the war to be the struggle of two world views wrestling with each other. Either German principles of right, freedom, honor, and morality must be upheld, or Anglo-Saxon principles with their idolatry of mammon must be victorious. He sent congratulations to Field Marshal von Hindenburg, to General Ludendorff, and to the Crown Prince. Von Hindenburg assured the Kaiser of the unswerving loyalty until death of Germany's sons at the front, and concluded, May our old motto, Forward with God, for King and Fatherland, for Kaiser and Empire, result in many years of peace being granted to Your Majesty after our victorious return home. But the terrific attacks which the German commanders directed upon the Americans at Chateau Thierry and at other points upon the southern lines, show well that they knew that there was another danger rising to confront them, that during their great drives a million and a half American soldiers had been learning the art of war, and that every moment of delay meant a new danger. By the end of this period, the Americans had arrived. End of chapter 41《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハ were thrown before the German tide of invasion like a huge khaki-colored breakwater. Germany knew that a test of its empire had come. To break the wall of American might, it threw into the van of the attack the Prussian guard, backed by the most formidable troops of the German and Austrian empires. The object was to put the fear of the Hun into the hearts of the Yankees, to overwhelm them, to drive straight through them as the prow of a battleship shears through a heavy sea, if America could be defeated, Germany's way to a speedy victory was at hand. If America held, well, that way lay disaster. And the Americans held. Not only did they hold, but they counterattacked with such bloody consequences to the German army that Marshal Foch, seizing the psychological moment for his carefully prepared counteroffensive, gave the word for a general attack. With Chateau Thierry and the Marne as a hinge, the clamp of the Allies closed upon the defeated Germans. From Switzerland to the North Sea, the drive went forward, operating like huge pincers, cutting like chilled steel, 
through the Hindenburg and the Kriemhild lines. It was the beginning of autocracy's end, the end of Der Tag, of which Germany had dreamed. The matchless marines and other American troops suffered a loss that staggered America. It was a loss, however, that was well worth while. The heroic young Americans who held the might of Germany helpless, and finally rolled them back, defeated from the field of battle, and who paid for that victory with their lives, made certain the speedy end of the world's bloodiest war. The story of the American Army's effective operations in France, from Cantini to the reduction of the St. Mihail salient, is one long record of victories. To the glory of American arms must be recorded the fact that at no time and at no place in the World War did the American forces retreat before the German hosts. In the latter days of May 1918, the Allied forces in France seemed near defeat. The Germans were steadily driving towards Paris. They had swept over the Chemin de Dames, and the papers from day to day were chronicling wonderful successes. The Chemin de Dames had been regarded as impregnable, but the Germans passed it apparently without the slightest difficulty. They were advancing on a forty-mile front, and on May 28th had reached the Aisne, with the French and British steadily falling back. The anxiety of the Allies throughout the world was indescribable. This was the great German victory drive, and each day registered a new Allied defeat. Newspaper headlines were almost despairing. On May 29th, however, in quiet type, under great headlines announcing a German gain of ten miles, in which the Germans had taken 25,000 prisoners and crossed two rivers, had captured Soissons, and were threatening Reims, there appeared in American papers a quiet little dispatch from General Pershing. It read as follows. This morning in Picardy, our troops attacked on a front of one and one-fourth miles, advanced our lines, and captured the village of Cantini. We took 200 prisoners and inflicted on the enemy severe losses in killed and wounded. Our casualties were relatively small. Hostile counterattacks broke down under our fire. This was the first American offensive. The American troops had now been in Europe almost a year. At first but a small force, they had been greeted in Paris and in London with tremendous enthusiasm. Up to this point they had done little or nothing, but the small force which passed through Paris in the summer of 1917 had been growing steadily. By this time the American army numbered more than 800,000 men. They had been getting ready, in camps far behind the lines they had been trained, not only by their own officers, but by some of the greatest experts in the French and British armies. Thousands of officers and men who, but a few months before, had been busily engaged in civilian pursuits, had now learned something of the art of war. They had been supplied with a splendid equipment, with great guns, and with all the modern requirements of an up-to-date army. For some months, here and there, on the French and British lines, small detachments of American troops, flanked on both sides by the Allied forces, had been learning the art of war. Here and there they had been under fire. At Cantini itself they had resisted attack. On May 27th General Pershing had reported, in Picardy, after violent artillery preparations, hostile infantry detachments succeeded in penetrating our advanced positions in two points. Our troops counterattacked, completely expelling the enemy and entering his lines. They had also been fighting that day in the Uevra section, where a raiding party had been repulsed. There had been other skirmishes, too, in which many Americans had won honors from both Great Britain and France. But the attack at Cantini was the first distinct American advance. The Americans penetrated the German positions to a depth of nearly a mile. Their artillery completely smothered the Germans, and its whir could be heard for many miles in the rear. Twelve French tanks supported the American infantry. The artillery preparation lasted for one hour, and then the lines of Americans went over the top. A strong unit of flamethrowers and engineers aided the Americans. The American barrage moved forward a hundred yards in two minutes, and then a hundred yards in four minutes. The infantry followed with clock-like precision. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting occurred in Cantini, which contained a large tunnel and a number of caves. The Americans hurled hand grenades like baseballs into these shelters. The attack had been carefully planned and was rehearsed by the infantry with the tanks. In every detail it was under the direction of the superior French command, to whom much of the credit for its success was due. The news of the American success created general satisfaction among the French and English troops. The operation, of course, was not one of the greatest importance. It was a sort of an experiment, 
but coming as it did in the middle of the great german drive it was ominous america had arrived on may thirtieth general pershing announced the complete results of further enemy attacks from the new positions of cantini this time he says there was considerable shelling with gas but the results obtained were very small the attempt was a complete failure our casualties were very light we have consolidated our positions the london evening news commenting on this fact says bravo the young americans nothing in today's battle narrative from the front is more exhilarating than the account of their fight at cantini it was clean cut from beginning to end like one of their countrymen's short stories and the short story of cantini is going to expand into a full-length novel which will write the doom of the kaiser and kaiserism cantini will one day be repeated a thousandfold the germans in reporting this fight avoided mention of the fact that the operation had been conducted by american troops this seemed to indicate that they feared the moral effect of such an admission in germany up to this time with the exception of small brigades the american army had been held as a reserve after the cantini fight they were hurried to the front the main point to which they were sent at first was chateau thierry north of the marne the nearest point to paris reached by the enemy there at the very critical point of the great german divide they not only checked the enemy but by a dashing attack threw him back this may be said to be the turning point in the whole war it not only stopped the german drive at this point but it gave new courage to the allies and took the heart out of the germans the troops were rushed to the battle front at Thierry, arriving on saturday june first they entered the battle enthusiastically almost immediately after they had arrived a dispatch from picardy says on our way to the battle lines they were cheered by the crowds in the villages through which they passed their victorious stand with their gallant french allies so soon after entering the line has electrified all france general pershing's terse account of what happened reads as follows in the fighting northwest of chateau thierry our troops broke up an attempt of the enemy to advance to the south through the Bili woods and by a counterattack drove him back to the north of the woods. The American troops had gone into the action only an hour or so after their arrival on the banks of the River Marne. Scarcely had they alighted from their motor trucks when they were ordered into Chateau Thierry with a battalion of French colonial troops. The enemy were launching a savage drive, and at first succeeded in driving the Americans out of the woods of Villers et Portier, but the Americans at once counterattacked driving their opponents from their position and regaining possession of the woods on the same day the germans launched an attack of shock troops attempting to gain a passage across the marne at yogon they obtained a footing on the southern bank but another american counterattack forced them back across the river the american soldiers were fighting with wonderful spirit and the french papers were filled with praise of their work as they came up to go to the line they were singing and they charged cheering on June 6th came a climax of the American fighting. It was the attack of the American Marines in the direction of Torcy. This gained more than two miles over a two-and-a-half-mile front. On the next day the advance continued over a front of nearly six miles, and during the night the Americans captured Boreche and entered Torcy. The fighting at Torcy is characteristically American. The Marines advanced yelling like Indians, using bayonet and rifle. From Torcy, the Marines set forward and took strong ground on either side of Belleau Wood. They had reached all the objectives and pushed beyond them. The Germans were on the run and surrendering right and left to the Americans. The attack by the Marines forestalled an attack by the enemy. German reports now noticed the Americans. Their report on June 9th, referring to this attack, says, Americans who attempted to attack northwest of Chateau Thierry were driven back beyond their positions of departure with heavy losses and prisoners were captured the americans had lost heavily and the hospitals were filled with their wounded but the thorough american organization was giving the wounded every care and the americans were still moving forward on june the tenth another attack was made on the german lines in the belleau wood which penetrated for about two-thirds of a mile leaving the germans in possession of only the northern fringe of the wood on june eleventh the official statement of the French War Office declared, South of the Ork River, the American troops this morning brilliantly captured Bellu Wood and took 300 prisoners. Bellu Wood had been considered an almost impregnable position, 
but the valiant fighting of the American Marines had carried them past it. Fighting here was not merely a series of exciting engagements, but an important action which may have turned, and very probably did turn, the whole tide of battle. The Americans put three German divisions out of business, and caused a change in the German plans, by preventing an extending movement to Mio, which was the German objective. From this time on, the confidence shown in all reports from the Allies in France was strengthened. They had found that the Americans were all that they had hoped for, and they were sure now that they could hold on until the full American strength could be brought to bear. General Pershing himself was full of optimism, and his fine example stimulated his troops. From this time on, all dispatches show that the Americans were more and more getting into the game. Repeated German attacks against their forces on the Bellu Bruches line were repulsed, in spite of the fact that crack German divisions, who had been picked especially to punish them, had been found on their front. It was later found that these divisions had been suddenly ordered to that point in order to prevent at all costs the Americans being able to achieve success. The German high command was apparently anxious to prevent American success from stimulating the morale of the Allied army. During the rest of the summer the Americans took an active part in Folk's great offensive which ultimately crushed the German army. They were heard from at widely divergent points, in Alsace, about Chateau Thierry, at Mont Didier, and in the British lines. Most of the fighting during June indicated a slow advance at Chateau Thierry. On June 19th the Americans crossed the Marne, near that city, but Chateau Thierry itself was not captured until the middle of July. On June 29th they participated in a raid near Mont Didier, and on July 2nd captured Vaux. In the week of July 4th, news came of American success on the Vosga. On July 18th, they advanced close to Soissons. On August 3rd, the Americans captured Fisme, and then for nearly a month made little actual progress, though bitter fighting went on in the country around Fisme and near Soissons. On August 29th, after a furious battle, they captured the plain of Uvigny, north of Soissons. In all these battles, the Americans were doing their part at difficult points, during the great French drive which was clearing out the Marne salient. On the 12th of September, the 1st American Army, assisted by certain French units, and under the direct command of General Pershing, launched an attack against the St. Mihiel salient. It was the most important operation of the American troops in the Great War. It was a complete success. On September 12th was the fourth anniversary of the establishment of the salient, which reached out from the German line in the direction of Verdun. The attack was fighting on a grand scale, and that such an operation should be entrusted to the American army indicated an entirely new phase of America's participation in the war. It was preceded by a barrage lasting four hours. The German troops, though probably suspecting that such an attack was coming, were nevertheless surprised. The American attack was on the southern leg of the salient, along a distance of twelve miles the French attack on the western side from a front of eight miles. Each attack was eminently successful. On the southern front, the Americans reached their first objective, at some points an hour ahead of scheduled time. The Accord was captured early in the drive. Later, the Americans gained possession of Nonsards, Panay, and Bouillonville. At first, the resistance of the Germans, without being tame, was not actually stiff, and the Doughboys were able to sweep toward the second line of any position without difficulty. There, however, the Germans began to defend themselves sharply, which delayed but did not stop the American advance. The attack was made in two waves and carried the American forces a distance of about five miles. The next day the attack continued, and General Pershing's dispatch stated, In the St. Mihiel sector, we have achieved further successes. The junction of our troops advancing from the south of the sector with those advancing from the west, has given us possession of the whole salient to points twelve miles northeast of St. Mihiel, and has resulted in the capture of many prisoners. Forced back by our steady advance, the enemy is retiring and is destroying large quantities of material as he goes. The number of prisoners counted has risen to 13,300. Our line now includes Herbeville, Thelent, Hattonville, St. Benoit, Chamas, Yolny, Thalcourt, and Viville. The salient was wiped out, and the San Mihiel front reduced from 40 to 20 miles. Secretary Newton D. Baker, accompanied by Generals Pershing and Petain, 
visited San Mihal a few hours after its capture. They walked through the streets of the city and heard many stories of the long German occupation. As the attack proceeded, it became more and more evident that the German defense had lost heart. Thousands of them surrendered, declaring that they did not care to fight any more. It was also noted that a surprisingly large number of officers were among those captured. The only serious resistance was to the attack south of Fresnay, which was obviously for the purpose of protecting the German retreat. The first American regiment stationed in the St. Mihal sector was the 370th Infantry, formerly the 8th Illinois, a Negro regiment officered entirely by soldiers of that race. This regiment was one of the three that occupied a sector at Verdun, when a penetration there by the Germans would have been disastrous to the Allied cause. The St. Mihal salient had no great military value to the Germans, and was probably held by them from a sentimental motive. It represented the desperate efforts made by the Crown Prince in his hurly drive against Verdun. Its destruction, however, was of great importance to the French. It was not only a removal of a menace to the French citizens of Verdun, but it released the French armies at that point for active, offensive operation. It also liberated the railway line from Verdun to Nancy, which was of the utmost value to General Pershing and the French armies to his left. It also later developed that the French command regarded the reduction of the St. Mihan salient as the cornerstone of a great encircling movement aimed at the German fortress of Metz. The moral effect of its reduction was also notable, as it was one more sign of the weakening of the Germans. History usually concerns itself with the deeds of humanity in the mass and with the leaders of these masses. It is eminently fitting, however, that this history should record the impressions made upon the minds of an American soldier by a modern battle. The United States government singled out of all the letters received from the front that written by Major Robert L. Denig of Philadelphia to his wife. The letter is now part of the archives of the War Department and occupies the highest place of literary honor in the records of the Marines. It describes the operation against the Germans on the Marne on July 18, 1918. This was the counterattack led by the Marines, which broke the back of the German invasion. Major Denning wrote, The day before we left for this big push, we had a most interesting fight between a fleet of German planes and a French observation balloon right over our heads. We saw five planes circle over our town, then put on, what we thought afterwards, a sham fight. One of them, after many fancy stunts, headed right for the balloon. They were all painted with our colors except one. This one went near the balloon. One kept right on. The other four shot the balloon up with incendiary bullets. The observers jumped into their parachutes just as the outfit went up in a mass of flame. The next day we took our positions at various places to wait for camions that were to take us somewhere in France, when or for what purpose we did not know. Was passed me at the head of his company. We made a date for a party on our next leave. He was looking fine and was as happy as could be. Then Hunt, Kieser, and a heap of others went by. I have the battalion and Helcomb the regiment. Our turn to and bus did not come until near midnight. We at last got under way after a few big sea bags had hit nearby. Wilmer and I led in a touring car. We went at a good clip and nearly got ditched in a couple of new shell holes. Shells were falling fast by now, and as the tenth truck went over the bridge, a big one landed near with a crash and wounded the two drivers, killed two marines and wounded five more. We did not know it at the time, and did not notice anything wrong, till we came to a crossroad when we found we had only eleven cars all told. We found the rest of the convoy after a hunt, but even then were not told of the loss, and did not find it out until the next day. We were finally, after twelve hours' ride, dumped in a big field, and, after a few hours' rest, started our march. It was hot as Hades, and we had had nothing to eat since the day before. We at last entered a forest. Troops seemed to converge on it from all points. We marched some six miles in the forest, a finer one I have never seen. Deer would scamper ahead, and we could have eaten one raw. At ten that night, without food, we lay down in a pouring rain to sleep. Troops of all kinds passed us in the night, a shadowy stream, over half a million men. Some of the French officers told us that they had never seen such concentration since Verdun, if then. The next day, the 18th of July, we marched ahead through a jam of troops, trucks, etc., and came at last to a ration dump, where we fell to and ate our heads off for the first time in nearly two days. 
When we left there, the men had bread stuck on their bayonets. I lugged a ham. All were loaded down. Here I passed one of Wass's lieutenants with his hand wounded. He was pleased as punch and told us the drive was on, the first we knew of it. I then passed a few men of Hunt's company, bringing prisoners to the rear. They had a colonel and his staff. They were well-dressed, clean and polished, but mighty glum-looking. We finally stopped at the far end of the forest near dressing station, where Holcomb again took command. This station had a big fine stone farm, but was now a complete ruin. Wounded and dead lay all about. Joe Murray came by, with his head all done up, his helmet had saved him. The lines had gone on ahead, so we were quite safe. Had a fine aerial battle right over us. The stunts that those planes did cannot be described by me. Late in the afternoon we advanced again. Our route lay over an open field covered with dead. We lay down on a hillside for the night near some captured German guns, and until dark I watched the cavalry, some four thousand, come up and take positions. At three-thirty the next morning Stitz woke me up and said we were to attack. The regiment was soon under way, and we picked our way under cover of a gas-infested valley to a town where we got our final instructions and left our packs. I wished Sumner good luck and parted. We formed up in a sunken road on two sides of a valley that was perpendicular to the enemy's front. Hughes right, Holcomb left, Sibley support. We now began to get a few wounded. One man with ashen face came charging to the rear with shell-shock. He shook all over, foamed at the mouth, could not speak. I put him under a tent, and he acted as if he had had a fit. I heard Overton call to one of his friends to send a certain pin to his mother if he should get hit. At 8.30 we jumped off with a line of tanks in the lead. For two kilos, the four lines of marines were as straight as a die, and their advance over the open plain in the bright sunlight was a picture I shall never forget. The fire got hotter and hotter. Men fell, bullets sang, shells whizzed banged, and the dust of battle got thick. Overton was hit by a big piece of shell and fell. Afterwards I heard he was hit in the heart, so his death was without pain. He was buried that night, and the pin found. A man near me was cut in two. Others when hit would stand, it seemed, an hour, then fall in a heap. I yelled to Wilmer that each gun in the barrage worked from right to left. Then a rabbit ran ahead, and I watched him wondering if he would get hit. Good rabbit. It took my mind off the carnage looked for Hughes way over to the right. I told Wilmer that I had a hundred dollars and be sure to get it. You think of all kinds of things. About sixty Germans jumped out of a trench and tried to surrender, but their machine guns opened up. We fired back. They ran and our left company after them. They made a gap that had to be filled, so Sibley advanced one of his to do the job. Then a shell lit in a machine gun crew of ours and cleaned it out completely. At ten-thirty we dug in. The attack just died out. I found a hole, or old trench, and when I was flat on my back I got some protection. Holcomb was next to me, Wilmer some way off. We then tried to get reports. Two companies we never could get in touch with. Lloyd came in and reported he was holding some trenches near a mill with six men. Cates, with his trousers blown off, said he had sixteen men of various companies. Another officer on the right reported he had, and could see, forty men all told. That, with the headquarters, was all we could find out about the battalion of nearly eight hundred. Of the twenty company officers who went in, three came out, and one, Cates, was slightly wounded. From then on to about eight p.m., life was a chance and mighty uncomfortable. It was hot as a furnace, no water, and they had our range to a tee. Three men lying in a shallow trench near me were blown to bits. I went to the left of the line and found eight wounded men in a shell hole. I went back to Kate's hole, and three shells landed near them. We thought they were killed, but they were not hit. You could hear men calling for help in the wheat fields. Their cries would get weaker and weaker and die out. The German planes were thick in the air. They were in groups of from three to twenty. They would look us over, and then we would get a pounding. One of our planes got shot down. He fell about a thousand feet, like an arrow, and hit the field back of us. The tank exploded, and nothing was left. We had a machine-gun officer with us, and at six a runner came up and reported that Sumner was killed. He commanded the machine-gun company with us. He was hit early in the fight by a bullet, I hear. I can get no details. At the start, he remarked, This looks easy. They do not seem to have much art. Hughes's headquarters were all shot up. 
Turner lost a leg. Well, we just lay there all through the hot afternoon. It was great. A shell would land nearby you, and you would bounce in your hole. As twilight came, we sent out water parties for the relief of the wounded. Then we wondered if we would get relieved. At nine o'clock we got a message congratulating us and saying the Algerians would take over at midnight. We then began to collect our wounded. Some had been evacuated during the day, but at that we soon had about twenty on the field near us. A man who had been blinded wanted me to hold his hand. Another, wounded in the back, wanted his head patted, and so it went. One man got up on his hands and knees. I asked him what he wanted. He said, Look at the full moon, then fell dead. I had him buried, and all the rest I could find. All the time bullets sung, and we prayed that shelling would not start until we had our wounded on top. The Algerians came up at midnight, and we pushed out. They went over at daybreak and got all shot up. We made the relief under German flares and the light from a burning town. We went out as we came, through the gully and town, the latter by now all in ruins. The place was full of gas, so we had to wear our masks. We pushed on to the forest and fell down in our tracks and slept all day. That afternoon a German plane got a balloon and the observer jumped and landed in a high tree. It was some job getting him down. The wind came up and we had to dodge falling trees and branches. As it was, we lost, two killed and one wounded, from that cause. That night the Germans shelled us and got three killed and seventeen wounded. We moved a bit further back to the crossroads, and after burying a few Germans, some of whom showed signs of having been wounded before, we settled down to a short stay. It looked like rain, and so Wilmer and I went to an old dressing station to salvage some cover. We collected a lot of bloody shelter halves and ponchos that had been tied to poles to make stretchers, and were about to go when we stopped to look at a new grave. A rude cross, made of two slats from a box, had written on it, Lester S. Wass, Captain, U.S. Marines, July 18, 1918. The old crowd at St. Nazaire and Bordeaux, Wass and Sumner killed, Baston and Hunt wounded, the latter on the 18th, a clean wound, I hear, through the left shoulder. We then moved further to the rear and camped for the night. Dunlap came to look us over. His car was driven by a sailor who got out to talk to a few of the Marines. When one of the latter yelled, Hey, fellows, anyone want to see a real live gob? Right this way. The gob held a regular reception. A carrier pigeon perched on a tree with a message. We decided to shoot him. It was then quite dark, so the shot missed. I then heard the following as I tried to sleep. Hell, he only turned around. Send up a flare. Call for barrage, etc., the next day, further to the rear still, a Ford was towed by with its front wheels on a truck. We are now back in a town for some rest and to lick our wounds. As I rode down the battalion, where once companies 250 strong used to march, you now see 50 men, with a kid, second lieutenant in command. One company commander is not yet 21. After the last attack, I cashed in the gold you gave me and sent it home along with my back pay. I have no idea of being bumped off with money on my person, as if you fall into the enemy's hands, you are first robbed, then buried, perhaps, but the first is sure. Baston, the lieutenant that went to Quantico with father and myself, and of whom father took some pictures, was wounded in both legs, in the Bois de Ballou. He nearly lost his legs, I am told, but is coming out okay. Hunt was wounded in the last attack, got his wounds fixed up, and went back again till he had to be sent out. Koffenberg was hit in the hand. All near him were killed. Talbot was hit twice, but is about again. That accounts for all the officers in the company that I brought over. In the first fight, 103 of the men in that outfit were killed or wounded. The second fight must have about cleaned out the old crowd. The tanks, as they crushed their way through the wet gray forest, looked to me like beasts of the pre-Stone Age. In the afternoon, as I lay on my back in a hole that I dug deeper, the dark gray German planes with their sinister black crosses looked like death hovering above. They were for many, Sumner for one. He was always saying, Denink, let's go ashore. Then here was Wass, whom I usually took dinner with, dead too. Sumner, Wass, Baston, and Hunt, the old crowd that stuck together, two dead, one may never be any good any more. Hunt, I hope, will be as good as ever. The officers mentioned in Major Denig's letter, with their addresses and next of kin, are Lieutenant Colonel Burton 
W. Sibley, Harriet E. Sibley, mother, Essex Junction, Vermont. First Lieutenant Clifton B. Cates, Mrs. Willis J. Cates, mother, Tiptonville, Tennessee. First Lieutenant Horace Talbot, no next of kin, Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Captain Arthur H. Turner, Charles S. Turner, father, 1888 West River Street, Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. Captain Bailey Metcalf Coffinberg, Mrs. Elizabeth Coffinberg, 30 Jackson Street, Staten Island, New York. Captain Albert Preston Baston, Mrs. Ora Z. Baston, mother, Pleasant Avenue, St. Louis Park, Minnesota. Captain Lester Sherwood Wass, L. A. Wass, father, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Captain Allen M. Sumner, Mrs. Mary M. Sumner, wife, 1824 South Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C. Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Holcomb, Mrs. Thomas Holcomb, wife, 1535 New Hampshire Avenue, Washington, D.C. Second Lieutenant John Lori Hunt, Etta Newman, sister, Gillett, Texas. Captain Walter H. Stitz, Emil H. Stitz, father, Davenport, Iowa. First Lieutenant John W. Overton, son of J. M. Overton, 901 Stallman Building, Nashville, Tennessee. Major Egbert T. Lloyd, Mrs. E. T. Lloyd, wife, 4900 Cedar Avenue, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Major Ralph S. Kaiser, Charles E. Kaiser, father, Thoroughfare, Virginia. Captain Pierre Wilmer, Mrs. Alice Emery Wilmer, mother, Centerville, Maryland. Lieutenant Colonel John A. Hughes, Mrs. A. J. Hughes, wife, care of Rear Admiral William Parks, Post Office Building, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Lieutenant Overton was the famous Yale athlete, the intercollegiate one-mile champion. End of chapter 42「Chapter 43 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 43 England and France Strike in the North Up to July 18, 1918, the Allied armies in France had been steadily on the defensive, but on that date the tide turned. General Foch, who had been yielding territory for several months in the great German drives, now assumed the offensive himself and began the series of great drives which was to crush the german power and drive the enemy in defeat headlong from france the first of these great blows was the one which began with the appearance of the americans at chateau thierry the germans had formed a huge salient whose eastern extremity lay near reims and its western extremity west of soissons it was like a great pocket reaching down in the direction of paris from these two points Against this salient, the French and Americans had directed a tremendous thrust. The Germans resisted with desperation. It was the turning point of the war, but they were compelled to yield. Town after town was regained by the French and American troops, until, by August 5th, the Crown Prince had been driven from the Marne to the Vesle, and the salient obliterated. On August 7th, General Foch delivered his second blow, during the fighting on the Marne, it had often been wondered by those who were observing the great French general strategy why the British seemed to make no move. Occasionally there had been reports of minor assaults, either on the Lys salient, far north, or on the Somme or Montdidier sections lying between. It had not been noticed that in these minor assaults the English had been obtaining positions of strategic importance, and that they were steadily getting ready for an English offensive. But their time had now come, and on August 7th the armies of Sir Douglas Haig began an attack against the armies of Prince Ruprecht on the Lys salient. This was followed, on August 8th, by another still greater Allied advance in Picardy between Albert and Montdidier. Both of these attacks met with notable success. On the Lys salient the English penetrated a distance of 1,000 yards over a four-mile front and followed up this advance by persistent attacks which led to the reoccupation, on August 19th, of Merville, and on August 31st, of Mount Kemmel. On this front the Germans had weakened their strength by withdrawing troops to aid other parts of their front, and the British were constantly taking advantage of this weakening. The Germans had found this salient a failure, 
it had failed to obtain its objective, the flanking of the Lens line south. They therefore were steadily retreating without any intention other than to extricate themselves from positions of no value in the most economical manner. The quick operations of the British, however, led to the capture of many prisoners and guns. The English offensive in Picardy was a more serious matter, and from some points of view was the greatest offensive in the war. The Allied front had been prepared for offensive operations by minor attacks which had secured for the Allied troops dominating positions. The attack was a surprise attack. The Germans were expecting local attacks, but not a movement of this magnitude. The surprise was increased because it was made through a heavy mist which prevented observation. It was preceded by tremendous artillery fire which lasted for four minutes and which was followed by the charge of infantry and tanks. The German artillery hardly replied at all, and only the resistance of a few rifles and machine guns fired vaguely through the fog met the charging troops. The attack was on a 25-mile front, and on the first day gained seven miles, captured 7,000 men and a 100 guns. On the following day there was an advance of about five miles and 17,000 more prisoners were captured. The Germans were now retiring in great haste, blowing up ammunition dumps and abandoning an enormous quantity of stores of all kinds. The English were using cavalry and airplanes, which were flying low over the field and throwing the German troops into confusion. Over 300 guns, including many of heavy caliber, were captured. The ground had been plowed up by shells and thousands of bodies of men and horses were found lying where they fell. A feature of the attack was the swift whippet tanks which advanced far ahead of the infantry lines. In the French official report occurred the following statement. The brilliant operation which we, in concert with British troops, executed yesterday has been a surprise for the enemy. As occurred in the offensive of July 18th, the soldiers of General Debenet have captured enemy soldiers engaged in the peaceful pursuit of harvesting the fields behind the German lines. By August 10th, the Germans had fallen back to a line running through Chalnay and Royer. Montdidier had been captured and 11 German divisions had been smashed. By August 12th, the number of prisoners was 40,000, and by the 18th, the Allied front was almost in the same line as it had been in the summer of 1916, before the Battle of the Somme. The next step was to recapture Bapaume and Perona. The French, on August 19th, captured the Lassini Massif and continued to press on their attack. Noyon fell on the 29th, Roy on the 27th, Chalnay on the 29th. Further north the British had captured Albert and on the 29th occupied Bapaume. On September 1st they took Perone with 2,000 prisoners. The advance still continued, and the German weakness was becoming more and more apparent. On September 6th, the whole Allied line swept forward, with an average penetration of eight miles. Chonet was captured, and the fortress of Ham. On September 17th, the British were close to St. Quentin, and the French in their old entrenchments before La Fere. On September 18th, a surprise advance over a 22-mile front crossed the Hindenburg Line at two points north of St. Quentin, Villarette, and from Pontru to Holome. The first and third British armies, a little further to the north, were moving toward Cambrai and Dois, threatening not only them, but to get in the rear of Lens. This force proceeded up the albert bapaume Highway, and on August 27th captured a considerable portion of the Hindenburg Line. On the 30th they reached Bellecourt, and on September 2nd crossed the ducourt quiat Line on a six-mile front. This was the famous Switch Line, meant to supplement the Hindenburg line, and its capture meant the complete overthrow of the German entrenched positions at this point. The Germans retreated hastily to the Canal du Nord, and on October 3rd, Huyant was captured by an advance on a 20-mile front, along with 10,000 prisoners. The Allied forces were moving steadily forward. On September 18th, the British reached the defenses of Cambrai and were encircling the city of San Quentin. On October 3rd, the advance upon Cambrai forced the Germans to evacuate the Lens coal fields, and on October 9th, another advance over a 30-mile front enabled the Allies to occupy Cambrai and St. Quentin. On the 11th, they had reached the suburbs of Dois. By this time, the whole of the Bacardi salient had been wiped out. The preceding summary of this great movement gives little idea of the tremendous struggle which had gone on during these two critical months and hardly does more than suggest the tremendous importance of the British operations. 
The Hindenburg Line was like a great fortification, and for more than a year had been regarded as impregnable. At Bullecourt, there were two main lines. One hundred and twenty-five yards in front of the first line was a belt of wire twenty-five feet broad, so thick that it could not be seen through. The line itself contained double machine-gun emplacements of ferro-concrete, one hundred and twenty-five yards apart, with lesser emplacements between them. More belts of wire protected the support line. Here a continuous tunnel had been constructed at a depth of over forty feet. Every thirty-five yards there were exits with flights of forty-five steps. The tunnels were roofed and lined and bottomed with heavy timber, and numerous rooms branched off. They were lighted by electricity. Large nine-inch trench mortars stood at the traverses, and strong machine-gun positions covered the line from behind. The Hindenburg Line was really only one of a series of twenty lines, each connected with the others by communicating trenches. The main lines were solid concrete, separated by an unending vista of wire entanglements. At points this barrier barbed wire extended in solemn formation for ten miles. This tremendous system of defenses was originally called by the Germans the Siegfried Line, and in the spring of 1917 they found it wise, at points where a strong offensive was expected, to fall back to it for protection. It had been their hope that it would prove an impassable barrier to the Allied troops, but now it had been broken, and the moral effect of the British success was even greater than the material. One of the most notable results of the British advance had been the capture of Lens. It had been captured without a fight, because of the British threat upon its rear, but its capture was of tremendous importance. Lens had been the scene of bitter fighting in the latter part of August 1917, when the Canadians had specially distinguished themselves. The city had been heavily fortified by the Germans, who had recognized its importance as being the center of the great Lens coal fields, and they had never given it up. It had sometimes been described as the strongest single position that had ever confronted the Allies on the Western Front. It had been made a sort of citadel of reinforced concrete. Even the courage and power of the Canadians had only given them possession of some of its suburbs. Between these suburbs and the concrete citadel were the coal pits, with their fathomless depths of ages, and the mysteries of cultural strategy. The struggle became a succession of avalanches of gas, burning oil, rifle, and machine gun fire. Both sides lost terrifically, but the Germans had held the town. Now it was given up without a blow, and its great coal fields were once more in possession of the French. Before retreating, the Germans showed their usual destructive energy, and the mines were found flooded as a result of consistent and scientific use of dynamite. The recapture of Lens was cheering news in Paris. Not the least of the many sufferings of the French during the last two years of the war was that which came from the scarcity of coal. Indeed, more than once during these two winters coal could not be obtained at any price. These periods, unfortunately, came in the latter part of the winter, and it happened that they were unusual periods of intense cold. Thousands of people stayed in bed all day in order to keep warm. The capture of Lens, therefore, had been anxiously desired. Nearly the whole of the French coal supply had come from Lens, and the adjacent Bethune coal fields. The Bethune field, although steadily working, had never produced enough coal for even the pressing necessities of the French munitions works. The news that Bapama had fallen on August 29th brought back, especially to the British, memories not only of the previous year and of the great forward movement which, on March 17th, had swept them over Bapama and Peron, but also bitter memories of the retreat in the previous march which had carried them back under the overwhelming German pressure. The capture, therefore, was balm to their spirits, and an English correspondent, Mr. Philip Gibbs, who had accompanied the British on their previous advance, found officers and men full of laughter and full of memories. On all sides were the battlefields of 1916 and 1917. Mamence Wood, Belleville Wood, Usna Hill, Ginchy, Morval, Goulemont. The fields were covered with battle debris, and yet to the English it was sacred ground from the graves of the men who fell there those graves still remained. The British shell-fire had not touched them, but as the English advanced there were many bodies of grey-clad men on the roads and fields, and dead horses, and a litter of barbed wire, and deep shelters dug under banks, and shell-craters, and helmets, gas-masks, and rifles thrown here and there by the enemy as they fled. Now it was the Germans that were fleeing, and fleeing hopelessly, sullen, bitter at their officers, impatient of discipline. One of the great differences between the attacks of the Allies in their last year of the war and those of preceding years 
was the increased use and the improved character of the tanks. The tanks were a development of the war. Before the war, however, the development of the Caterpillar tractor had suggested to a few far-sighted people the possibility of evolving from this invention a machine capable of offensive use over rough country in close warfare. Experiments were made in behalf of the English War Office for some time without practical results. At last, after these experiments had resulted in various failures, a type of tractor was finally designed which produced satisfactory results. It was a caterpillar tractor, with an endless self-laid track, over which internal driving wheels could be propelled by the engines. It was not until July 1916 that the first consignment of these new engines of warfare arrived at the secret maneuver ground. There were two kinds. One, called the male, was armored with two Hotchkiss quick-fire guns, as well as with an armament of machine guns. The other type, called the female, was armed only with machine guns. The male tank was designed for dealing with the concrete emplacements for the German machine guns. The other was more suitable for dealing with machine gun personnel and riflemen. Some time was taken in training men to use these tanks, for the crew of a tank must suffer a great deal of hardship. On account of the noise of the engine, every command had to be made by signs, and the motion of the tank being like that of a ship on a heavy sea was likely to produce seasickness. The tanks were painted with weird colors for the purpose of concealment, and when they first appeared caused a great deal of wonder and amusement. They were first used in battle on September 15, 1916, in a continuation of the Battle of the Somme, and proved a great surprise to the Germans. The Germans directed all available rifle and machine gun fire upon them without success. A correspondent narrates that, as the creme de menthe moved on its way, the bullets fell from its sides harmlessly. It advanced upon a broken wall, leaned up against it heavily, until it fell with a crash of bricks, and then rose on to the bricks and passed over them, and walked straight into the midst of the factory ruins. They were an immense success, and had come to stay. End of chapter 43Chapter 44 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 44 Belgium's Gallant Effort. For more than four years, Belgium suffered under the iron heel of the German invaders. One little corner in the far west was occupied by her gallant army, fighting with the utmost courage and a patriotism which has won the admiration of the world under its great King Albert whose heroic leadership had turned the little commercial nation into a nation of heroes. Conditions of life in the Belgian cities were almost intolerable. The great Belgian Relief Commission, under the direction of Mr. Hoover, had kept the people from starvation, but it could not secure them their rights. They lived in the midst of brutality and injustice. On Belgium Independence Day at London, Arthur J. Balfour, the British Foreign Minister, made an address in which he commented upon the German treatment of Belgium, in the course of his address, he said, Bitter must be the thought in every Belgian heart of what Belgians in Belgium are now suffering. Let them, however, take courage. Let their spirits rise in a mood of profound cheerfulness, for these dark days are not going to last for ever, and when they come to a conclusion, when again peace dawns upon this much tormented and cruelly tried world, when Belgium is again free and prosperous, then Belgians, whether they have spent these unhappy years in exile or and even harder fate, have spent them in their own country, they will be able to look back upon this time of cruel and unexampled trial, and they will say to themselves, to their children and to their descendants, that Belgium, though her existence as a political entity is less than a century, has within that period shown an example of courage, constancy, and virtue to mankind, for which all the world should be grateful. The English foreign minister was perhaps not prophesying. He knew some of what was coming, the great offensive, which was to free Belgium, of her German oppressor, was already under way. The first move, however, was not upon land, but upon the sea. In the autumn of 1914, the little Belgian port of Zeebrugge, with the neighboring port of Ostend, was captured by the Germans. Germans, who had already seized the shipbuilding plants at Antwerp, then began to build submarines, and sent them down the canals through Bruges to Zeebrugge and Ostend. From these ports they proceeded to attack the English commerce. 
In the spring of 1918, submarine attacks on English shipping were so serious that England was using every possible effort to destroy these piratical craft, and it was determined to make an attempt to block the entrances to the canals at Zeebrugge and at Ostend by sinking old ships in the channels. The expedition took place during the night of April 22nd, under the command of Vice Admiral Sir Roger Keyes. Six obsolete British cruisers took part in the expedition. These were the Brilliant, Infingia, Sirius, Intrepid, Thetis, and Vindictive. The Vindictive carried storming parties to destroy the stone mole at Zeebrugge. The remaining five cruisers were filled with concrete, and it was intended that they should be sunk at the entrances of the two ports. A large force of monitors and fast, small craft accompanied the expedition. An observer thus describes the heroic exploit. The night was overcast, and there was a drifting haze. Down the coast a great searchlight swung its beam to and fro in the small wind and short sea. From the Vindictive's bridge, as she headed in toward the mole, there was scarcely a glimmer of light to be seen shoreward. Ahead, as she drove through the water, rolled the smoke screen, her cloak of invisibility, wrapped about her by small craft. This was the device of Wing Commander Brock, without which, acknowledged the Admiral in command, the operation could not have been conducted. A northeast wind moved the volume of it shoreward ahead of the ships. Beyond it was the distant town, its defenders unsuspicious. It was not until the Vindictive, with blue jackets and marines standing ready for landing, was close upon the mole that the wind lulled and came away again from the southeast, sweeping back the smoke screen and laying her bare to the eyes that looked seaward. There was a moment immediately afterward when it seemed to those on the ships as if the dim harbor exploded into light. A star shell soared aloft, and then a score of star shells. Wavering beams of the searchlights swung around and settled into a glare. A wild fire of gun flashes leaped against the sky. Strings of luminous green beads shot aloft, hung and sank. The darkness of the night was supplemented by a nightmare daylight of battle-fired guns and machine guns along the mole. The batteries ashore woke to life. It was in a gale of shelling that the Vindictive laid her nose against the thirty-foot-high concrete side of the mole, let go her anchor, and signaled to the daffodil to shove her stern in. The iris went ahead and endeavored to get alongside likewise. The fire was intense while the ships plunged and rolled beside the mole in the seas. The Vindictive, with her greater draft, jarring against the foundations of the mole with every lunge. They were swept diagonally by machine-gun fire from both ends of the mole, and by the heavy batteries on shore. Captain Carpenter conned the Vindictive from the open bridge until her stern was laid in, when he took up his position in the flamethrower hut on the port side. It is marvelous that any occupant should have survived a minute in this hut, so riddled and shattered was it. The officer of the Iris, which was in trouble ahead of the Vindictive, described Captain Carpenter as handling her like a picket boat. The Vindictive was fitted along her port side with a high, false deck, from which ran eighteen brows, or gangways, by which the storming and demolition parties were to land. The men gathered in readiness on the main lower decks, while Colonel Elliot, who was to lead the Marines, waited on the false deck just abaft of the bridge. Captain Hallahan, who commanded the Blue Jackets, was amidships. The word for assault had not yet been given when both leaders were killed. The mere landing on the mole was a perilous business. It involved a passage across the crashing and splintering gangways, a drop over the parapet into the field of fire of the German machine guns which swept its length, and a further drop of some sixteen feet to the surface of the mole itself. Many were killed and more wounded as they crowded up the gangways, but nothing hindered the orderly and speedy landing by every gangway. The lower deck was a shambles as the commander made the round of the ship, yet the wounded and dying raised themselves to cheer as he made his tour. The Iris had trouble of her own. Her first attempts to make fast to the mole ahead of the Vindictive failed, as her grapnels were not large enough to span the parapet. Two officers, Lieutenant Commander Bradford and Lieutenant Hawkins, climbed ashore and sat astride the parapet trying to make the grapnels fast, till each was killed and fell down between the ship and the wall. Commander Valentine Gibbs had both legs shot away and died next morning. Lieutenant Spencer, though wounded, took command and refused to be relieved. The Iris was obliged at last to change her position and fall in astern of the Vindictive, which suffered very heavily from fire. 
Her total casualties were eight officers and 69 men killed, and three officers and 103 men wounded. The storming parties upon the Mole met with no resistance from the Germans, other than an intense and unremitting fire. One after another buildings burst into flames, or split and crumbled as dynamite went off. A bombing party working up toward the Mole in search of the enemy destroyed several machine-gunning placements, but not a single prisoner awarded them. It appears that upon the approach of the ships, and with the opening of fire the enemy simply retired and contented themselves with bringing machine-guns to the short end of the Mole. The object of the fighting on the Mole was in large part to divert the enemy's attention while the work of blocking the canals was being accomplished. Of this operation the official narrative says, The Thetis came first steaming into a tornado of shells from great batteries ashore. All her crew, save a remnant who remained to steam her in and sink her, already had been taken off by a ubiquitous motor launch. The remnant spared hands enough to keep her four guns going. It was hers to show the road to the intrepid and Iphigenia, which followed. She cleared a string of armed barges, which defends the channel from the tip of the mole, but had the ill fortune to foul one of her propellers, upon a net defense which flanks it on the shore side. The propeller gathered in the net, and it rendered her practically unmanageable. Shore batteries found her and pounded her unremittingly. She bumped into the bank, edged off, and found herself in the channel again, still some hundreds of yards from the mouth of the canal, in practically a sinking condition. As she lay she signaled invaluable directions to others, and her commander blew charges and sank it. Motor launches took off her crew. The intrepid, smoking like a volcano, and with all her guns blazing, followed. Her motor launch had failed to get alongside, outside the harbor, and she had men enough for anything. Straight into the canal she steered, her smoke blowing back from her into the Infagina's eyes, so that the latter was blinded, and going a little wild, ran into the dredger, with her barge moored beside it, which lay at the western arm of the canal. She was not clear, though, and entered the canal, pushing the barge before her. It was then that a shell hit the steam connections of her whistle, and the escape of steam which followed drove off some of the smoke and let her see what she was doing. Lieutenant Carter, commanding the Intrepid, placed the nose of his ship neatly in the mud of the western bank, ordered his crew away, and blew up his ship by switches in the chart room. Lieutenant Leake, commanding the Iphigenia, beached her according to arrangements on the eastern side, blew her up, saw her drop nicely across the canal, and left her with her engine still going to hold in her position till she should have bedded well down to the bottom. According to the latest reports from air observation, the two old ships, with their holds full of concrete, are lying across the canal in a V position, and it is probable that the work they set out to do has been accomplished, and that the canal is effectively blocked. At Ostend an attempt was also made to block the canal on the same night, but it was unsuccessful, owing to a shift of wind which blew away the smoke screen behind which the British craft were acting, and enabled the German gunfire to destroy the flares which had been lit to mark the entrance to the harbor. The cruisers tried to act by guesswork, and one of the block ships was sunk, but it was not in position to obstruct the canal. On May 9th another attempt was made, and the vindictive, filled with concrete, was sunk in the Ostend Canal. This daring exploit of the English fleet, though it had destroyed the value of Zeebrugge and Ostend as submarine bases, had left the Germans in possession. In September, however, General Folk determined that the time had come to throw his armies against the German forces in the distracted little country. He planned two widely separated thrusts. On the south he sent Pershing against the Germans between the Argonne and the Meuse. They made rapid progress, capturing Montfaucon, Varennes, and driving on till they had destroyed the German control of the paris chalons verdun Railroad. This was a serious blow to the Germans, for a further push northward would cut the vital lateral railway connecting the German army in Belgium and France with those in Alsace-Lorraine. Ludendorff hastened reserves to this front, and the American operation was slowed down. Meanwhile, at the other end of the line, the Belgians, with General Plummer's 2nd British Army, suddenly attacked on a front which extended all the way from the canal at Dixmunda to the Lys, swept the Germans out of all the famous fighting ground of the Ypres salient, pushed across the Pasacandela Ridge, and down to the Flanders Plain below. The situation of the Germans in the Lille regions of the south, and also along the Belgian coast, became at once dangerous. Once more, 
Ludendorff was compelled to send reserves, and this thrust began to slow up, but it was not checked permanently, and the Belgian armies were to move on. While this advance was being conducted, the British fleet were bombarding the coastal defenses. The Belgian army, fighting with the utmost spirit under command of King Albert, made a penetration of five miles and captured 4,000 prisoners and an immense amount of supplies. On September 30th, they captured the city of Rulers. For ten days, there was a consolidation of position by the Allies, but on October 14th, they made a furious attack in the general direction of the Ghent and Courtrai. Thousands of prisoners and several complete batteries of guns were captured. In this attack, British, Belgian, and French troops took part, and the troops of the three nations went over the top without preliminary bombardment, taking the enemy by surprise. On October 15th, the news from Flanders showed that the victory was growing in extent. The Allied armies were advancing on a front of about 25 miles, and in some places had penetrated the enemy's positions six or seven miles. The Belgians had captured 7,000 prisoners, and the British and French about 4,000. In French Flanders, the British advanced to a point about three miles west of Lille. The battle was carried on in a heavy rain, which turned the battlefields into seas of mud. While this hampered the Allied troops, it hindered even more the Germans in trying to move away their material through the mired ground of the Flanders lowland. On the next day, dispatches indicated that a retreat on a tremendous scale in northern Belgium was under way. The Germans were retreating so fast that the Allies lost touch with the enemy. The gallant little Belgian army, assisted by crack British and French troops, had driven the despoilers of its country from a large section which the Germans had occupied since the early days of the war, and had gained positions of such importance as to make it probable that the Germans would have to abandon the entire coast of Belgium. Moreover, on the south, in the city of Lille, with the great mining and manufacturing districts around it, was being left a salient which was growing deeper every hour, and which the enemy could not hope to hold. At certain points the resistance of the Germans was extraordinarily fierce. This was especially true in the region of Thuret. The battle here was from street to street and from house to house. The Germans had placed machine guns in the windows of houses and cellars, and fired murderous streams of bullets into the advancing Belgians, but were unable to stop them. The Belgians fought with a dogged determination such as only troops fighting to regain their outraged country could display. Nothing could stop them. At other points, especially in the northern part of the battle area, the Germans surrendered freely. Many civilians were rescued from the towns and districts captured, and little processions of these were straggling rearward out of range of the guns and out of the way of the fighting troops. At times, liberated Belgian women could see their sons, brothers, or husbands going forward into battle. On October 17th, the German retreat in Flanders became a rout. The enemy were fleeing rapidly on their entire front. The British entered Lille. The Germans fled from Ostend, and British naval forces were landed there. The Belgian infantry were sweeping up the coast, and Belgian patrols entered Bruges. In the afternoon of that day, King Albert of Belgium and Queen Elizabeth entered Ostend. The splendid fighting of the Belgian troops and their magnificent victory was now attracting universal attention. It was one of the revelations of the war. They were bearing the giant's share of the work of the Allied armies in their own country, and had already liberated territory which more than doubled the area of that part of Belgium which had been in their possession. With the Belgian coast cleared of invaders, it became open to British transports, which would afford relief to the whole Allied armies from the resultant decrease in the congestion of the Channel ports. On October 19th, the progress continued. Zeebrugge was occupied by the Allies, the last Belgian port remaining in German hands. The Belgian advance continued along the whole line. King Albert entered Bruges. Day after day, the advance continued. The reception of the King and Queen of Belgium in the recovered towns was something to remember. In Bruges, they rode in amid the tumultuous cheering of the frenzied population. On the central square, they were received by the burgomaster with an escort of a solitary gendarme, who had refused to give up his uniform and old-fashioned rifle to the enemy, though fined and imprisoned he had kept their hiding-place secret. As he stood there alone with fixed bayonet, the king and queen shook him by the hand and congratulated him. Greatly moved, he stammered, "'It is too great an honor, too great an honor.' 
and with all this happiness came the happiness arising from the return of the soldiers to the homes from which they had been absent so long, the reunions of husband and wife, of parents and children. Belgium was now to reap the reward for her heroism. End of chapter 44《Chapter 45 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. — Chapter 45 — Italy's Terrific Drive For many months after the great Italian stand on the Piave, there was inactivity on both fronts in Italy. The Italians had been reinforced by troops from France and Great Britain, and their own army was now larger than it had been at any other time. On June 15th, about the time when the Germans were being driven back on the Marne and the Oise, the Austrians, urged to action by the Germans, suddenly undertook a great offensive on a front from the Asiago Plateau to the sea, a distance of 97 miles. From the very start it was plain that the Italians were resisting magnificently. The offensive was not unexpected, either in time or locality, and had been openly discussed in the Italian press. The Italians, therefore, were not taken by surprise, and moreover, since the disaster of Caporetto, the Italians had learned by a patient campaign of education what they were fighting for. On the second day of the battle, the Austrian troops made a desperate effort to break through the Italian lines, particularly in the eastern sector of the Asiago Plateau, and crossed the Piave River at two places. They also attacked the French positions, between Osteria di Monfenera and Maranzina, but were driven back with heavy loss. At every point where the Austrians were able to advance, the Italians initiated vigorous counterattacks. The order to Italy's army was, hold at any cost. On the third day of the battle, the Austrian offensive was being strongly checked. They had established three bridgeheads on the Piave, but had not been able to advance. The most notable of these crossings was that in the Montello sector. Montello is of particular importance because it is the hinge between the mountains and the Piave sectors of the Italian front. If it could be held, the Austrians would be in a position to dominate from the flank and rear all the Italian positions defending the line of the Piave in the dead flat plain to the south. On the lower Piave, the Austrians had made gains and had captured Capo Sile. The Austrians were using a million men and were using liquid fire and gas bombs, but their every move was resisted strongly. Vienna was claiming the capture of 30,000 men but the Italian reports claimed that the Austrian losses were stupendous. Thousands of dead were heaped before the Italian line in the mountain sectors, blocking the mule paths and choking the defiles. No fewer than nine desperate onslaughts on the Monte Grappa, always with fresh reserves, were broken upon Grappa Heights, with terrific losses. On July 19th, the dispatches from Rome were emphasizing the Italian counterattacks, not only were the Italians preventing the enemy from making further gains, but they were beginning to crowd him back at the points where he had crossed the river, and were raining bombs and machine-gun bullets upon the Austrian troops at the bridgehead. They were also taking the initiative in the fighting in the mountain sectors. By June 20th the Austrian defeat was clear. Their forces were backed against the flooded Piave, which had carried away their bridges and left them to the mercy of the Italians. Thousands were being killed and other thousands captured. Czechoslovak troops, it was reported, had joined in the fighting, and had given their first tribute of blood to the generous principles of freedom and independence for which they were in arms. In the Piave Delta the Italians had regained Capo Sila, which had been captured early in the drive, and it was reported that all along the Piave line they had won complete control of the air, not a single Austrian machine being still aloft. The spirits of the Austrian troops had been definitely weakened. They were war-wearied, and evidence began to accumulate that Austria's drive was a hunger offensive. As the battle continued, reports began to arrive of the gallant deeds of American airmen, who were helping in the fighting along the front. The airmen were assisting in destroying the bridges that the Austrians were trying to throw across the river. The Piave was now a vast cataract, and the bridges which it had not washed down were constantly destroyed by the aviators. The Austrians on the western bank were finding it difficult to obtain supplies and were resorting to hydroplanes for that purpose. On June 24th, the Austrian attack had definitely failed, and they were fleeing in disorder across the Piave. 180,000 men had already been lost, and 40,000 were hemmed in on the western side of the river. The Austrian communications were emphasizing the difficulties they were meeting with through the heavy rains. The victory of the Italians, which was now apparent, was received all over Italy with great public rejoicing. 
Italy had been repenting in sackcloth and ashes her defeat of the previous fall. Now they had made amends, and were showing what the Italian soldier could really do. In America, and among the Allied powers, there was great enthusiasm, and Secretary of War Baker sent this congratulatory message to the Italian Minister of War. Your Excellency, the people of the United States are watching with enthusiasm and admiration the splendid exploits of the great army of Italy in resisting and driving back the enemy forces which recently undertook a major offensive on the Italian front. I take great pleasure in tendering my own hearty congratulations, and would be most happy to have a message of greeting and congratulation transmitted to General Diaz and his brave soldiers. Newton D. Baker, Secretary of War of the United States. In announcing to his victorious army the repulse of the Austrians, General Diaz, the Italian commander-in-chief, said, The enemy who, with furious impetuosity, used all means to penetrate our territory, has been repulsed at all points. His losses are very heavy. His pride is broken. Glory to all commands, all soldiers, all sailors. On the 26th of June, the Italian troops, having forced the last rear guard of the retreating Austrians to surrender, and completely occupied the west bank of the Piave, began an offensive on the mountain front in the Montegrappa sector. They gained more than 3,000 prisoners and considerable territory. On the southern part of the Piave, they were carrying on a vigorous offensive against the Austrian positions within the Piave Delta. The Austrian troops at that point were being prevented from retreat by the high water and suffered terrible losses. On July 6th, the Italians drove the last of the enemy from the Delta. The campaign in Italy now languished until, on October 27th, Italy began her last terrible drive. The great Italian offensive was made not only by their own forces and the French and British troops, which had assisted them the previous June, but during the intervening period a large force of Americans had arrived in Italy. On June 27th, Secretary Baker had made the announcement that General Pershing had been instructed to send into Italy a regiment that was then training in France. The regiment thus sent was augmented considerably later. The purpose of sending troops to Italy, Mr. Baker explained, was rather political than military. It was desired to demonstrate again that the Allied nations and the United States were one in their purposes on all fronts, and to extend the intercourse between the troops of all the powers at war with Germany. On the second day of the Italian offensive, their success increased. More than 9,000 Austrians were taken prisoner, and 51 guns were captured. The Piave River had been crossed, and the Italians had advanced four miles to its east. The attacks in the mountain region were being more bitterly contested, and counter-attacks had enabled the enemy to regain some of their lost positions. On October 30th, the Italian advance was continuing. The Austrian front appeared to be breaking under the heavy blows of the Allied troops. Dispatches indicated striking successes, not only on the Italian front, but at the points where the British and the French were holding the line. The Americans were being held in reserve, but American airplanes were actively participating in the work at the front. By this time, the last lines of the Austro-Hungarian resistance on the central positions along the Piave River had been broken, and more than 15,000 prisoners had been taken. The Austrians, however, had been desperately resisting, and their artillery fire at many points was very effective, especially that which had been directed at the pontoon bridges thrown across the Piave. King Victor Emmanuel had been present in person during the crossing, and was often under the fire of the Austrian guns. On October 30th, 33,000 Austrians had been captured, and the Italians had reached Vittorio. Americans had now joined in the fighting. The Austrian retreat reached the proportion of a rout. They were still fighting, especially in the mountain region, but in the plains east of the Piave they were in full flight. Taking into consideration the numbers of troops in the Austrian lines and their apparently plentiful supplies, it began to seem probable that their break was due more to political maneuvers than to military force. The Austrians at this time were making a great peace drive, and the dissatisfaction at home had affected the morale of the troops at the front. The conditions in Italy were in close resemblance to those in Bulgaria, just before Bulgaria applied for armistice. On the 1st of November the Austrians were completely routed, and were streaming in confusion down the valleys of the Alpine foothills, fleeing northward from the Piave. Reports from Austria indicated riots at Vienna and Budapest. In Vienna, people were parading in the streets, shouting, Down with the Habsburgs! On October 29th, the Austrians asked for an armistice. Their announcement read as follows. The high command of the armies, early Tuesday, by means of a parliamentaire, 
established communication with the Italian Army Command. Every effort is to be made for the avoidance of further useless sacrifice of blood, for the cessation of hostilities, and for the conclusion of an armistice. Toward this step, which is animated by the best intentions of the Italian High Command, at first assumed an attitude of unmistakable refusal. And it was only on the evening of Wednesday that, in accord with the Italian High Command, General Weber, accompanied by a deputation, was permitted to cross the fighting line for preliminary pourparler. General Diaz, the Italian commander, had referred the Austrian request to the Versailles Conference and had acted in accordance with their direction. In proposing the armistice, the Austrians had also expressed their resolve to bring about peace and to evacuate the occupied territory of Italy. This was the beginning of the end. The northern part of Italy is bounded by the Alps, and between those lofty ranges and the deep valleys there had been constant fighting. In this fighting, both on mountain and in valley, there were the most extraordinary deeds of individual heroism constantly exhibited. The Alpine regiments, known in Italy as the Alpini, were men of extraordinary physical powers, accustomed to mountain climbing, and filled with courage and patriotism. Owing to the nature of the territory in such contests, only a limited number of men could be used at one time, and the fighting went on over masses of snow, or solid rock. Guns were hauled up precipices, and dugouts excavated in the rock itself. The Italian troops, clothed in white overalls to prevent their being seen, moved with great rapidity from point to point, and forced their enemy to keep constantly on the alert. In the great Italian drive just described, the most bitter fighting was that which occurred in these mountainous regions. The work of the Italian aviators is also worthy of special attention. They not only secured entire command of the air, but by flying low, they often threw into confusion with their machine guns the Austrian infantry. Their wonderful work in bringing in military information and in bombing expeditions was not excelled, if it was equaled, by the airmen of any other country. The Italian airplanes themselves were engineering triumphs. The inventive genius so notable in these days in Italy found expression in their development. Some of their machines were the biggest made during the whole war, and the long journeys made by such machines deserve special mention. The most interesting feat of this kind was performed on August 9th by the famous poet, Captain Gabriella di Annunzio. Accompanied by eight Italian machines, he flew to the city of Vienna, a total distance of 620 miles, and dropped copies of an Allied manifesto over the city. They crossed the Alps in a great windstorm at a height of 10,000 feet, and all but one returned safely. The manifesto, which was written by D'Annunzio, read as follows. People of Vienna, you are fated to know the Italians. We are flying over Vienna and could drop tons of bombs. On the contrary, we leave a salutation and the flag with its colors of liberty. We Italians do not make war on children, the aged, and women. We make war on your government, which is the enemy of the liberty of nations, on your blind, wanton, cruel government, which gives you neither peace nor bread, and nurtures you on hatred and delusions. People of Vienna, you have the reputation of being intelligent. Why do you wear the Prussian uniform? Now you see the entire world is against you. Do you wish to continue the war? Keep on, then, but it will be your suicide. What can you hope from the victory promised to you by the Prussian generals? Their decisive victory is like the bread of Ukraine. One dies while awaiting it. People of Vienna, think of your dear ones. Awake. Long live Italy, liberty, and the Entente. It was said that copies of this proclamation in Vienna had a value of fifty dollars a copy. D'Annunzio's great fame had seized upon the popular imagination. His career in the war would have been interesting in itself, but when one recognizes that he was already a world figure, the greatest modern Italian dramatist and novelist, his life seems almost like a fairy story. Before the war began, he made addresses all over his country, urging Italy's participation in the war, and when war was declared, to him, as much as to any other man, was due the credit. He entered the Navy, and has written some fascinating descriptions of his life on board ship. Later he joined the Airplane Corps, and now was showering down upon the gaping populace of Vienna appeals to rise against its Habsburg masters. D'Annunzio was extraordinary in his literary career. He had been the poet of passion, a writer of novels and plays, which, although artistic in the highest degree, showed him to be an egoist and a decadent. But long before the war he had tired of his erotic productions, and had begun to write the praises of nature and of heroes. He had been singing the praises of his country. 
La nave symbolizes the glory of Venice. He had become more wholesome. War was making him not only a man, but a hero. Of course, D'Annunzio was not the only great literary man who had left the study for the battlefield. Aeschylus fought at Marathon and Salamis. Ariosto put down a rebellion for his prince between compositions of cantos of Orlando Furioso. Sir Philip Sidney was a scholar, poet, and soldier, and many a soldier, when his wars were over, has turned to the labors of the pen. Yet it is not without surprise that one sees D'Annunzio join this distinguished company, and one's admiration grows as it becomes plain that he was not a mere posier. He was a poet, but he was a soldier, too. Not every great poet could drive an airplane to Vienna. End of chapter 45「History of the World War」by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 46. Bulgaria Deserts Germany. During the year 1916 there was little movement in the Balkans. The Allies had settled down at Saloniki and entrenched themselves so strongly that their positions were practically impregnable. These entrenchments were on slopes facing north, heavily wired, and with seven miles of swamp before them, over which an attacking army would have to pass. It was obviously inadvisable to withdraw entirely the armies at Saloniki. So long as they were there it was possible at any time to make an attack on Bulgaria, in case Russia or Romania should need such assistance. And, moreover, it was evident that it was only the presence of the Saloniki army that kept Greece neutral. During the year there were a few fights which were little more than skirmishes, Almost all of the German soldiers had been withdrawn, and it was chiefly the Bulgarian army that was facing the Allies. On May 26th, Bulgarian forces advanced into Greece and occupied Fort Rupel with the acquiescence of the Greek government. The Greeks were in a difficult position. It was not unnatural that King Constantine and the Greek general staff believed that the Allies had small chance of victory. Moreover, they had no special ambitions which could be satisfied by a war against the Central Powers. On the other hand, Turkey was a hereditary enemy, and the big sea coast would put them at the mercy of the British Navy in case they should join their fortunes to those of Austro-Germany. To an impartial observer, their policy of neutrality, if not heroic, was at least wise. The Greek government, therefore, did its best to preserve neutrality. The surrender of Fort Rupel was not, however, a neutral act, and roused in Greece a strong popular protest. Venizelos who at all times was strongly friendly to the Allies, and was one of the great Greek statesmen who not only believed in their ultimate victory, but who saw that the true interests of Greece were in Anatolia and the islands of the Aegean, was strongly opposed to King Constantine's action. The Allies showed their resentment by a Pacific blockade to prevent the export of coal to Greece, with the object of preventing supplies from reaching the enemy. This led to a certain amount of excitement, and the Allied embassies in Athens were insulted by mobs. The governments, therefore, presented an ultimatum commanding the demobilization of the Greek army, the appointment of a neutral ministry, and the calling of a new election for the Greek Chamber of Deputies, as well as the proper punishment of those who were guilty of the disorder. In substance, the Greeks yielded to the Allied demand, but before a new election could be held, an attack by the Bulgarians on the 17th of August changed the situation. The Bulgarian armies entered deep into Greek territory in the eastern provinces and captured the city of Kavala without resistance from the armies of Greece. A portion of the Greek army at Kavala surrendered and was taken to Germany as guests of the German government. This action of the Greek army led to a Greek revolution which broke out at Salonika on the 30th of August. The king pursued a tortuous policy, professing neutrality and yet constantly bringing himself under suspicion. The revolutionists organized an army, and finally Monsieur Venizelos, after strong efforts to induce the king to act, became the head of the provisional government of the revolutionists. The armies pursued a policy almost as tortuous as that of King Constantine. They could not agree among themselves as to the proper policy and took no decided course. King Constantine apparently had the support of Russia and of Italy. Meantime, the fighting against Bulgaria was still proceeding. The main force of the Allies was directed against the city of Monastir, which, after considerable fighting, was captured on November 19th. 
This gave the Serbians possession of an important point in their own country, and naturally proved a great stimulus to the Serbian armies. From that time on, and during the year 1917, little was done. Minor offenses were undertaken, some of which, like the Allied attack upon Doaren, deserve mention, but on the whole the fighting was a stalemate. Meanwhile, the action of the Greek government had become so unsatisfactory that it was finally determined to demand the abdication of King Constantine, and on June 11th he found himself compelled to yield. In his proclamation he said, Obeying necessity of fulfilling my duty toward Greece, I am departing from my beloved country accompanied by the heir to the crown, and I leave my son Alexander on the throne. I beg you to accept my decision with calm. Early the next morning the king and his family set sail for Italy on his way to Switzerland, where he became another king in exile. His son Alexander accepted the throne and issued the following proclamation. At the moment when my august father, making supreme sacrifice to our dear country, entrusted to me the heavy duties of the Hellenic throne, I expressed but one single wish, that God, hearing his prayer, will protect Greece, that he will permit us to see her again united and powerful. In my grief at being separated in circumstances so critical from my well-beloved father, I have a single consolation, to carry out his sacred mandate which I will endeavor to realize with all my power, following the lines of his brilliant reign, with the help of the people upon whose love the Greek dynasty is supported. I am convinced that in obeying the wishes of my father, the people by their submission will do their part in enabling us together to rescue our dear country from the terrible situation in which it finds itself. The whole country, to all appearances, received the abdication with satisfaction. On June 21st, Monsieur Venizelos came to Athens, and the Greek chamber, which was illegally dissolved in 1915, was convoked, and Venizelos once again became prime minister. At last he had succeeded, and he proceeded at once to join the whole of the Grecian forces to the cause of the Allies. Of all the statesmen prominent in the Great War, there was none more wise, more consistent, or more loyal than the great Greek statesman. For more than a year, the Allied armies facing Bulgaria remained upon the defensive, when, suddenly, on the 16th of September, 1918, in the midst of the wonderful movements that were forcing back the German armies in France, a dispatch was received from the Allied forces in Macedonia. The Serbian army, in cooperation with French and English forces, had attacked the Bulgarian positions on a ten-mile front, had stormed those positions, and progressed more than five miles. On the next day, news was received that the advance was continuing, that the Allies had occupied an important series of ridges and had pierced the Bulgarian front, that more than 3,000 prisoners had been captured and 24 guns. The movement took place about 12 miles east of Monastir, and the ridge of Sokol and the town of Gradeshnitsa were captured by the Allied troops. It soon became evident that one of the most important movements in the whole war was being carried on. The Bulgarian armies were crumbling, and the German troops sent to aid them had been put to flight. The Allied troops had advanced on an average of ten miles and were continuing to advance. The Serbs, fighting at last near their own homes, were showing their real military strength. Four thousand prisoners had been taken with an enormous quantity of war supplies. The Bulgarian positions which had yielded so easily were positions which they had been fortifying for three years and had been previously thought to be impregnable. On September 23rd it became evident that the retreat of the Bulgarians had turned into a rout. Notwithstanding reinforcements of Germans and Bulgars rushed down in a frantic effort to check them, the Allied armies were advancing on an 85-mile front, crushing all resistance. The Italian army on the west was meeting with equal success, and the news dispatches reported that the 1st Bulgarian army in the region of Prilep had been cut off. A dispatch received by the British War Office reported, As the result of attacks and continual heavy pressure by British and German troops, in conjunction with the French and Serbian advance for the west, the enemy has evacuated his whole line from Doiran to the west of the Vardar. As it retreated, the Bulgarian army was burning supplies and destroying ammunition dumps, burning railway stations and ravaging the country. By this time it was felt throughout the Allied world that the Bulgarian defeat would have important political consequences. It was remembered that a short time before King Ferdinand had paid a visit to Germany and after long conferences with the German warlord, had hastily returned to Bulgaria. It was recalled that there had been many signs of a serious disorder in Bulgaria, where the Socialist Party had been in close touch with the advance parties of the Ukrainian Republic. It seemed possible that the Bulgarian defeats had been brought about by Bulgarian dissension, 
and it was also evident that Germany was in no position to offer effective support to its Bulgarian accomplice. As the days passed by, the news from this front became more and more favorable. At all points the Bulgarian armies were retreating in the most disorderly manner, closely pursued by the Serbians, French, English, Italians, and Greeks. Bulgarian troops were deserting in thousands, and thousands of others were surrendering without resistance. On September 26th it was announced that the Bulgar front had disappeared, that the armies had been cut into a number of groups and were fleeing before the Allied troops. Town after town was being captured with enormous quantities of stores. On Friday, September 27th, it was announced that Bulgaria had asked the Allies for an armistice of 48 hours, with a view to making peace. The situation was now causing intense excitement. The Germans tried to minimize the Bulgarian surrender. A dispatch from Berlin declared that Premier Manilov's offer of an armistice was made without the support of other members of the cabinet or of King Ferdinand, and that Germany would make a solemn protest against it. German newspapers were demanding Manilov be dismissed immediately and court-martialed for high treason. The Berlin message asserted that the Premier's offer had created great dissatisfaction in Bulgaria and that strong military measures had been taken to support the Bulgarian front. According to statements from Sofia, it was added a counter-movement against the action of the Premier had already been set on foot. It was declared in Germany that the Premier's act was the result of Germany's refusal to send sufficient reinforcements to Bulgaria. Secretary Lansing made the announcement that the United States government had received a proposal for an armistice. It appeared that Bulgaria had been maneuvering toward peace for some time. The Bulgarians had foreseen their inability to meet the expected Allied attack and had made every effort to obtain German reinforcements. Moreover, they were highly dissatisfied with the treatment they had received from Germany in connection with Bulgaria's dispute with Turkey as to territorial dispositions to be made after the war. Probably the most important reason, however, for the Bulgarian overthrow was that by this time they were sick of the war. They had not, in the first place, gone into it with any enthusiasm. And though they could fight bravely enough against their Serbian foe, no true Bulgarian could ever feel himself in a natural position facing his old-time Russian friend. Bulgaria had come to the end. Manilov, the premier, had from the beginning been opposed to the war. Mobs in Sofia were demanding surrender. Ferdinand was compelled to give way to the wishes of his cabinet and his people, and in spite of the fact that he had promised the Kaiser to remain faithful to the alliance, he gave his consent to the movement for an unconditional surrender. An official Bulgarian statement read as follows. In view of the conjunction of circumstances which have recently arisen, and after the position had been jointly discussed with all competent authorities, the Bulgarian government, desiring to put an end to the bloodshed, has authorized the commander-in-chief of the army to propose to the Generalissimo of the armies of the Entente at Saloniki a cessation of hostilities and the entering into of negotiations for obtaining an armistice and peace. The members of the Bulgarian delegation left yesterday evening in order to get in touch with the plenipotentiaries of the Entente belligerents. This statement was dated September 24th. When the Bulgarian officers entrusted with the proposal for an armistice presented themselves at Saloniki, General de Espray gave the following reply. My response cannot be, by reason of the military situation, other than the following. I can accord neither an armistice nor suspension of hostilities tending to interrupt the operation in course. On the other hand, I will receive with all due courtesy the delegates duly qualified of the Royal Bulgarian Government. The Bulgarian delegates were General Lenkov, commander of the Bulgarian Second Army, Monsieur Lepchev, finance minister, Monsieur Radev, a former member of the Bulgarian cabinet. On the evening of the 29th, an armistice was signed. The terms of the surrender were approved by the Entente governments, and hostilities ceased at noon, September 30th. The terms of the armistice were as follows. Bulgaria agrees to evacuate all the territory she now occupies in Greece and Serbia, to demobilize her army immediately, and surrender all means of transport to the Allies. Bulgaria also will surrender her boats and control of navigation on the Danube, and concede to the Allies free passage through Bulgaria for the development of military operations. All Bulgarian arms and ammunition are to be stored under the control of the Allies, to whom it is conceded the right to occupy all important strategic points. The military occupation of Bulgaria will be entrusted to British, French, and Italian forces, and the evacuated portions of Greece and Serbia respectively to Greek and Serbian troops. This armistice meant a complete military surrender, and Bulgaria ceased to be a belligerent. All questions of territorial rearrangement in the Balkans were purposefully omitted from the convention. 
the allies made no stipulation concerning king ferdinand his position being considered an internal matter one for the bulgarians themselves to deal with the armistice was to remain in operation until the final general peace was concluded the request of bulgaria for an armistice and peace stunned germany which at that time was living in an atmosphere of political crisis and military misfortune. The German papers laid much of the blame on the desperate economic conditions in Bulgaria, which had been made worse by political strife. After the Bulgarian collapse, the Serbians, with the other Allied troops who had just recaptured Uskub, swept northward to drive the remaining Germans and Austrians out of Serbia and beyond the Danube. On October 13th, they captured Nish, thus cutting the famous Orient Railroad from Berlin to Constantinople. German authorities announced that henceforth trains on this line would run only to the Serbian border. On October 4th, King Ferdinand abdicated his throne in favor of his son, Crown Prince Boris, and left Sofia the same night for Vienna. Before leaving, he issued the following manifesto, renouncing the Bulgarian crown. By reason of the succession of events which have occurred in my kingdom, and which demand a sacrifice from each citizen, even to the surrendering of oneself for the well-being of all, I desire to give as the first example the sacrifice of myself. Despite the sacred ties, which for thirty-two years have bound me so firmly to this country, for whose prosperity and greatness I have given all my powers, I have decided to renounce the royal Bulgarian crown in favor of my eldest son, His Highness the Prince Royal Boris of Tornovo. I call upon all faithful subjects and true patriots to unite as one man about the throne of King Boris, to lift the country from its difficult situation, and to elevate new Bulgaria to the height to which it is predestined. Before signing his declaration of abdication, he had consulted with the party leaders and received their approval. King Ferdinand had lost his popularity ever since it became apparent that he had made a mistake in siding with the Teutonic powers. He was undoubtedly in fear that a revolution might upset the whole dynasty. Premier, Malinov announced the abdication to the Bulgarian parliament, and the accession of Prince Boris to the throne was received with much enthusiasm. The church bells were rung, and great crowds gathered in the streets. Speaking from the steps of the palace, the new king said, I thank you for your manifestation of patriotic sentiments. I have faith in the good star of Bulgaria, and I believe that the Bulgar people, by their good qualities and cooperation, are directed to a brilliant future. King Ferdinand, it was given out, had renounced politics and was intending in the future to devote himself to his favorite pursuits, chiefly to botany. The surrender of Bulgaria was at once recognized as the overthrow of Germany's Mittel Europa threat, which had apparently been carried into effect when Turkey and Bulgaria joined the Central Powers. It had for a long time been one of Germany's most coveted aims. After the Franco-Prussian War, the German people had grown enormously in wealth and in numbers, it had become one of the greatest manufacturing powers in the world. Its ships were transporting its commerce on every sea, but it was not satisfied. The German leaders, most of whom were young men at the time of the war with France, and had been deeply impressed by a sense of the German power, were full of the idea that Germany was the greatest of nations, and that she should impress her will upon all the world. They might have done this peacefully, for the seas were free, but German self-esteem was not satisfied with peaceful progress. They felt it was necessary to reach out in the world for colonies. They seized a province in China. They meddled with affairs in Morocco. They annexed the colonies in Africa. But none of these projects were wholly satisfactory. They provided no great outlet for the products of their workshops, nor for their overflow population, which largely went to North and South America and became citizens of these foreign nations. Their eyes finally turned to the Great East. There in China and India, and the neighboring countries, were three hundred millions of men whose trade would be a worthy prize for even Germany's ambition. Then began the development of what is sometimes called Germany's Mittel Europa dream. Her scholars encouraged it, her travelers brought reports which stimulated the interest, and soon she began practically to carry it into effect. It meant the building of a great railroad down to the Persian Gulf, a railroad to be controlled by nations where her influence was to be all-powerful. She needed Austria, she needed Serbia, she needed Bulgaria and Turkey. At first the project was carried out peacefully. Friendly relations were stimulated with Turkey and the other necessary powers. Permits were obtained to build the railroad. But Germany was not the only power that had dreamed this dream. Alexander the Great had done it, Napoleon had done it, and England had carried it out. From the days of Queen Elizabeth the English control of India was one of its greatest assets. Through most of the 19th century the English power in the East was threatened, not by Germany, but by Russia. 
It was because of this threat that England had always protected Turkey. Turkey and Constantinople were her barrier against Russia. The literature of England in the last days of the 19th century shows clearly her fear of Russian intrigues in India. Kipling's Indian stories are full of it. But now that fear had passed. It was no longer the imaginary danger which might come from the great Slavic empire, but a trade weapon in the grasp of the most efficient military power ever developed that was threatening. Against this threat England had been doing her best. Here and there, near the Persian Gulf, she had been extending her influence. Here and there, as German consuls obtained concessions, they would find them later withdrawn, because England had stepped in. Yet just before the war, England, anxious for peace, had come to an agreement with Germany practically admitting the German plans to be carried out as far as Baghdad. It looked as though it were only a question of time, but when the Balkan Wars established Serbia as the greatest of the Balkan powers, and gave Russia a preponderating influence among the Balkan nations, and when it began to look as if some great Balkan state might be established which should be friendly to Russia and consequently a hindrance to the German scheme, then it was that it was necessary that war should come. The Germans had been wonderfully successful. For a time they controlled Austria, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Turkey, but with Bulgaria's fall the end had come. They were compelled to awake from their Mittel Europa dream. End of chapter 46《Chapter Forty Seven of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Forty Seven: The Central Empires Wine for Peace. The Allied victories in France during the months of August and September of 1918 led to a new peace offensive among the Central Powers. It was very plain to the German High Command as well as to the Allied leaders that Germany's great ambitions had now been definitely thwarted. It seemed clear that, in spite of the hopeful and encouraging words which they addressed to their own armies, the expert soldiers, who were controlling the destinies of Germany, understood well the conditions they were now facing. Putting aside all sentiment, therefore, they deliberately set out to obtain a peace which would leave them an opportunity to gain by diplomacy what they were sure that they were about to lose on the field of battle. They had made pleas for peace before, but their pleas had been rejected. The Allied leaders were fighting for a principle. They could not be satisfied with a draw. They could not be satisfied if Germany were left in a position which would enable her, after a rest of a few years, to renew her effort to impose her will upon the world. It was unanimously recognized that the war must be carried on to the very end. The Allies took this position when the fortunes of war seemed to have gone against them, when Russia was defeated, Romania and Serbia crushed, and the German lines in France were approaching the capital. It was unlikely that now, when Germany was suffering defeat and every day was yielding the Allied armies encouraging gains, there should be any change in the strong determination of the Allied leaders. Nevertheless, it was necessary to make the attempt. On September 15th, the Austro-Hungarian government addressed a communication to the Allied powers and to the Holy See, suggesting a meeting for a confidential and non-binding discussion of war aims, with a view to the possible calling of a peace conference. The official communication from the Austro-Hungarian government was handed to the Secretary of State Lansing in Washington at 6.20 o'clock on September 16th. At 6.45, the following abbreviated reply of the United States government was made public by the Secretary of State. I am authorized by the President to state that the following will be the reply of this government to the Austro-Hungarian note proposing an unofficial conference of belligerents. The government of the United States feels that there is only one reply which it can make to the suggestion of the Austro-Hungarian government. It has repeatedly and with entire candor stated the terms upon which the United States would consider peace, and can and will entertain no proposal for a conference upon the matter concerning which it has made its position and purpose so plain. Arthur J. Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, in a statement made on September 16th, said, It is incredible that anything can come of this proposal. This cynical proposal of the Austrian government is not a genuine attempt to obtain peace. It is an attempt to divide the Allies. Premier Clemenceau in France took similar grounds and stated in the French Senate, We will fight until the hour when the enemy comes to understand that bargaining between crime and right is no longer possible. We want a just and strong peace protecting the future against the abominations of the past. Italy joined with her allies and declared that a negotiated peace was impossible. 
The refusal on the part of the Allies to respond to the Austrian peace proposal evidently greatly disturbed the German leaders. The continued German reverses and the surrender of Bulgaria had taken away all hope. They were anxious to conclude some kind of peace before meeting irretrievable disaster. They therefore determined to appoint as Chancellor of the Empire some statesman who might be represented as a supporter of an honest peace, and Count von Hertling, whose previous utterances might put under suspicion any peace move coming from him, was removed, and Prince Maximilian of Baden appointed as his successor on September 30th. Prince Maximilian was put forward as a moderate, in accordance with the evident purpose of the government to continue peace proposals. He was the heir apparent to the Grand Ducal throne of Baden, and was the first man in public life in Germany to declare that the empire could not conquer by the sword alone. He did this in an address to the upper chamber in Baden, of which he was president, on December 15, 1917. Power alone can never secure our position, he said, and our sword alone will never be able to tear down the opposition to us. At the same time he made an attack upon the ideals set up by President Wilson. President Wilson, he continued, after three years of war gathers together all the outworn slogans of the Entente of 1914 and denounces Germany as the disturber of the peace, proclaiming a crusade for humanity, liberty, and the rights of small nations. Then, forgetting that the United States had entered the war nearly a month after the abdication of the Tsar of Russia, he added, President Wilson has no right to speak in the name of democracy and liberty, for he was the mighty war ally of Russian Tsardom, but he has deaf ears when the Russian democracy appealed to him to allow it to discuss peace conditions. The Baden Address created a great sensation all over Germany, which was increased when, in an interview in January, he declared that all ideas of conquest must be abandoned, and that Germany must serve as a bulwark to prevent the spread of Bolshevism among the Western nations. There can be no doubt that the appointment of Prince Maximilian was a definite attempt to seek peace. It was thought that he would be recognized by the Allied leaders as an honest friend of peace, and that any effort he would make would be treated with respect. He was, however, a vigorous supporter of the Kaiser and of German autocracy, and while his appointment might mean that Germany was desirous of peace, it did not mean that she had changed her ways. Three days before the appointment of Prince Maximilian, President Wilson, in an address delivered in the Metropolitan Opera House in New York, had restated the issues of the war, declaring, 1. For impartial justice. 2. Settlement to be made in the common interest of all. 3. No leagues within the common family of the League of Nations. 4. No selfish economic combination within that league. And 5. All international agreements and treaties of every kind must be made known in their entirety to the rest of the world. Prince Maximilian, coming into power undoubtedly for the purpose of arranging a peace, proceeded at once to make a new peace offer. He based his action on President Wilson's speech, and on October 4th sent to President Wilson, through the Swiss government, the following note. The German government requests the President of the United States to take in hand the restoration of peace, acquaint all the belligerent states with this request, and invite them to send plenipotentiaries for the purpose of opening negotiations. It accepts the program set forth by the President of the United States in his message to Congress on January 8th, and in his later pronouncements especially his speech of September 27th, as a basis for peace negotiations. With a view to avoiding further bloodshed, the German government requests the immediate conclusion of an armistice on land and on water and in the air. He followed this note on October 5th with an address before the German Reichstag, of which the following are the most important points. In accordance with the imperial decree of September 30th, the German Empire has undergone a basic alteration of its politic leadership. As successor to Count George F. von Hertling, whose services in behalf of the Fatherland deserve the highest acknowledgment, I have been summoned by the Emperor to lead the new government. In accordance with the governmental method now introduced, I submit to the Reichstag, publicly and without delay, the principles by which I propose to conduct the grave responsibilities of the office. These principles were firmly established by the agreement of the Federated Governments and the leaders of the majority parties in this Honorable House before I decided to assume the duties of Chancellor. They contain, therefore, not only my own confession of political faith, but that of an overwhelming portion of the German people's representatives, that is, of the German nation, which has constituted the Reichstag on the basis of a general, equal, and secret franchise, and according to their will. 
only the fact that i know the conviction and will of the majority of the people are back of me has given me strength to take upon myself conduct of the empire's affairs in this hard and earnest time in which we are living one man's shoulders would be too weak to carry alone the tremendous responsibility which falls upon the government at present only if the people take active part in the broader sense of the word in deciding their destinies in other words if responsibility also extends to the majority of their freely elected political leaders can the leading statesman confidently assume his part of the responsibility in the service of folk and fatherland my resolve to this has been especially lightened for me by the fact that the prominent leaders of the laboring class have found a way in the new government to the highest offices of the empire i see therein a sure guarantee that the new government will be supported by the confidence of the broad masses of the people without whose true support the whole undertaking would be compelled to failure in advance hence what i say to-day is not only in my own name and those of my official helpers but in the name of all the german people the program of the majority parties upon which i take my stand contains first an acceptance of the answer of the former imperial government to pope benedict's note of august first nineteen sixteen and an unconditional acceptance of the reichstag resolution of july nineteenth the same year it further declares willingness to join the general league of nations based on the foundation of equal rights for all both strong and weak it considers the solution of the belgian question to lie in the complete rehabilitation of belgium particularly of its independence and territorial integrity an effort shall also be made to reach an understanding on the question of indemnity the program will not permit the peace treaties hitherto concluded to be a hindrance to the conclusion of the general peace its particular aim is that popular representative bodies shall be formed immediately on a broad basis in the baltic provinces in lithuania and poland we will promote the realization of necessary preliminary conditions therefore without delay by the introduction of civilian rule all these lands shall regulate their constitutions and their relations with neighboring peoples without external interference he went on to point out the progressive political developments in prussia and declared that the message of the king of prussia promising the democratic franchise must be fulfilled quickly and completely president wilson did not find prince maximilian's proposal wholly satisfactory and on october eighth he inquired of the imperial chancellor whether the meaning of the proposal was that the german government accepted the terms laid down in his address to the congress of the united states and in subsequent addresses and whether its object in entering into discussions would be only to agree upon the practical details of their application he also suggested that so long as the armies of the central powers were upon the soil of the governments with which the united states was associated he would not feel at liberty to propose a cessation of arms to those governments he also inquired whether the imperial chancellor was speaking merely for the constituted authorities of the empire who had so far conducted the war president wilson's reply aroused much difference of opinion among the allies but on the whole it was regarded as a clever diplomatic move the german government responded to those questions of the president on october twelfth by a message signed by dr w s solf who had just been appointed imperial foreign secretary in this reply the german government declared that it did accept president wilson's terms that it was ready to comply with the suggestion of the president and withdraw its troops from allied territory and that the german government was representing in all its actions the will of the great majority of the german people germany had indeed made enormous concessions and the german people appeared to have taken for granted that such an offer would be accepted an amsterdam dispatch declared people in berlin are kissing one another in the street although they are perfect strangers and shouting peace congratulations to each other the only words heard anywhere in germany are peace at last the president however had been struck by the news coming in from day to day of the new atrocities in france and of new cases of submarine murders and in his reply of october fourteenth he declared that while he was ready to refer the question of an armistice to the judgment and advice of his military advisers of the government of the united states and of the allied governments he felt sure that none of those governments would consent to consider an armistice as long as the armed forces of germany continued the illegal and inhumane practices which they were persisting in he also emphasized the fact that no armistice would be accepted that would not provide absolutely satisfactory safeguards and guarantees of the maintenance of the military supremacy of the armies of the united states and of the allies in the field 
the president also called the attention of the government of germany to that clause of his address on the fourth of july in which he had demanded the destruction of every arbitrary power that can separately secretly and of its single choice disturb the peace of the world or if it cannot be presently destroyed at least its reduction to virtual impotency he declared that the power which had hitherto controlled the german nation was of the sort thus described and that its alteration actually constituted a condition precedent to peace this answer of the president was greeted with approval in the united states and everywhere in the allied countries it meant that the imperial power of germany was not to be allowed to hide itself behind a so-called reorganization done under its own direction as one of the senators of the united states expressed it it is an unequivocal demand that the hohenzollerns shall get out during these negotiations the allied armies under marshal folk had been driving the enemy before them when baron bruyen was making his peace offer on behalf of austria-hungary the americans were engaged in pinching off the st mihiel salient and about that date the british were launching their great attack on the st quentin defences the reports of the great allied drive indicated a constant succession of allied victories on september nineteenth the british advanced into the hindenburg line northwest of st quentin and on september twentieth while the american guns were shelling metz the British were advancing steadily near Cambrai and La Bassa. Day by day the advance proceeded. On September 26, the first American army smashed through the Hindenburg line for an average gain of seven miles, between the Meuse and the Aisne rivers, in a twenty-mile front. On September 27, the French gained five miles in an advance east of Reims, and the British were attacking in the Cambrai sector on a fourteen-mile front, crossing the Canal du Nord, and piercing the Hindenburg line at several points. On September 28th, the Americans reached the Krimhilde line, while the British were close in on Cambrai. On September 30th, the British took Messines Ridge, while the French were still advancing between the Aisne and Velsne rivers. On October 1st, the French troops entered St. Quentin, and the British took the northern and western suburbs of Cambrai. During the next week, an enveloping movement was instituted north and south of Lille. On October 5th, the Germans evacuated Lille. On October 9th, the British took Cambrai. In these drives, the American colored troops played a conspicuous part. The entire 365th Regiment, composed wholly of colored troops, was later awarded the coveted Croix de Guerre, or War Cross, by the French government. It was a well-deserved honor, for the boys of the 365th bore themselves with great gallantry in the September and October offensive in the Champagne sector, and suffered heavy losses. In conferring the Coup de Guerre, the citation dealt in considerable detail with the valor of particular officers, and praised the courage and tenacity of the whole regiment. The Germans were retreating in Belgium, day by day, under the attacks of the Belgian and French armies. On October 11th, the Germans evacuated the Chem de Dame. On October 16th, the Germans began the evacuation of the Belgian coast region, and each day increased the number of Belgian towns once more in Allied control. End of chapter 47「He who conquers the fear of death is master of his fate. Upon this philosophy fifty thousand young men of the warring nations went forth to do battle among the clouds. The story of these battles is the real romance of the World War. In 1914 no one had ever known, and history had never recorded, a struggle to the death in the air. When the war ended a new literature of adventure had been created, a literature emblazoned with superb heroisms, with godlike daring, and with such utter disdain of death that they were raised out of the olden ranks of the mere earth-crawling mankind and became supermen of the air. Some of these heroic names became household words during the war. These were the aces of the French, American, and German air forces. The British adopted a policy in news concerning their airmen similar to that governing their publication of submarine sinkings. They argued that the naming of British, Canadian, and Australian aces would direct the attacks of German aviators against the most useful men in the British forces. They also felt that publicity would tend toward the swagger, which in English slang was swank, and toward a deterioration in discipline. 
Raoul Loughberry, Quentin Roosevelt, son of ex-President Roosevelt, and Edward Rickenbacker were names that figured extensively in news of the American Air Forces. Loughberry and Roosevelt were killed in action. Rickenbacker, after dozens of hair-raising escapes from death, came through the war without injury. The pioneer of American aviators in the war was William Thaw of Yale, who formed the original Lafayette Escadrille. Besides these men, America produced a number of other brilliant aces, an ace being one who brought down five enemy planes, each victory being attested by at least three witnesses. The French had as their outstanding aces George Gunimer and René Fonck. Gunimer went into the flying game as a mechanician. He became the most formidable human fighting machine on the Western Front before he was sent to death in a blazing airplane. Lieutenant René Fonck ended the war with a total of 75 official aerial victories. He had an additional 40 Huns to his credit, but not officially confirmed. His greatest day was when he brought down six planes. His quickest work was the shooting down of three Germans in 20 seconds. He fought three distinct battles in the air when, on May 8, 1918, he brought down six German airplanes in one day. All three engagements were fought within two hours. In all, Funk fired only 56 shots, an average of little more than nine bullets for each enemy brought down, an extraordinary record in view of the fact that aviators often fired hundreds of rounds without crippling their opponent. The first flight, in which Lieutenant Fonck brought down three German machines, lasted only a minute and a half, and the young Frenchman fired only 22 shots. Fonck was leading two other companions on a patrol in the Morial Montdidier sector on May 8th, when the French squadron met three German two-seater airplanes coming toward them in aero formation. Signaling to his companions, Lieutenant Fonck dived at the leading German plane and, within a few seconds, sent it down in flames. Fonck turned to the left, and the second enemy flyer followed in an effort to attack him from behind, but the Frenchman made a quick turn above him and, with five shots, sent the second German to death. Ten seconds had barely elapsed between the two victories. The third enemy pilot headed for home, but when Lieutenant Fonck apparently gave up the chase and turned back toward the French lines, the German went after him, and was flying parallel and a little below, when Fonck made a quick turn, drove straight at him, and sent him down within a half mile of the spot where his two comrades hit the earth. The German heroes were the celebrated Captain Volka, and the no less famous inventor of the flying circus, Count von Richthofen. Captain Volka caused a great many Allied crashes by hiding in clouds and diving straight at planes flying beneath him. As he came within range, he opened up with a stream of machine-gun bullets. If he failed to get his prey, his rush carried him past his opponent into safety. He rarely reattacked. Count von Richthofen was responsible for many airplane squadron tactics that later were used on both sides. The planes under his command were gaily painted for easy identification during the thick of a fight. Their usual method was to cut off single planes or small groups of Allied planes and circle around them in a method employed by Admiral Dewey for the reduction of the Spanish forts and ships in the Battle of Manila Bay. The dangers of aerial warfare were instrumental in producing high chivalry in all the encampments of airmen. Graves of fallen aviators were marked and decorated by their former foes, and captured aviators received exceptionally good treatment, where foemen aviators could procure such treatment for them. Until the advent of America into the war, neither side had a marked advantage in aircraft. At first Germany had a slight advantage, then the balance swung to the Allied side, but at no time was the scale tipped very much. American quantity production of airplanes, however, gave to the Entente Allies an overwhelming advantage. Final standardization of tools and design for the soul of the American airplane was not accomplished until February 1918. Yet within eight months more than 15,000 Liberty engines, each of them fully tested and of the highest quality, were delivered. The United States did not follow European types of engines, but in a wonderfully short time developed an engine standardized in the most recent efficiency of American industries. According to Secretary of War Baker, an inspiring feature of this work was the aid rendered by consulting engineers and motor manufacturers who gave up their trade secrets under the emergency of war needs. Realizing that the new design would be a government design and no firm or individual would reap selfish benefit because of its making, the motor manufacturers, nevertheless, patriotically revealed their trade secrets and made available trade processes of great commercial value. 
These industries also contributed the services of approximately 200 of their best draftsmen. Parts of the first engine were turned out at 12 different factories, located all the way from Connecticut to California. When the parts were assembled, the adjustment was perfect and the performance of the engine was wonderfully gratifying. Thirty days after the assembling of the first engine, preliminary tests justified the government in formally accepting the engine as the best aircraft engine produced in any country. The final tests confirmed the faith in the new motor. British and French machines, as a rule, were not adapted to American manufacturing methods. They were highly specialized machines, requiring much handwork from mechanics who were, in fact, artisans. The standardized United States aviation engine, produced under government supervision, said Secretary of War Baker, was expected to solve the problem of building first-class, powerful, and yet comparatively delicate aviation engines by American machine methods, the same standardized methods which revolutionized the automobile industry in this country. The manufacture of de Havilland airplanes equipped with Liberty motors was a factor in the war. One of these de Havillands, without turning up, made a non-stop trip on November 11, 1918, from Dayton, Ohio, to Washington, D.C., a distance of 430 miles, in three hours and 50 minutes. Great battle squadrons of these de Havilland planes, equipped with Liberty motors, made bombing raids over the German lines in the Verdun sector. Others operated as scouting and reconnaissance planes and as spotters for American artillery. In the period from September 12th to 11 o'clock on the morning of November 11th, the American aviators brought down 473 German machines. Of this number, 353 were confirmed officially. Day bombing groups, from the time they began operations, dropped a total of 116,818 kilograms of bombs within the German lines. Bombing operations were begun in August by the 96th Squadron, which in five flying days dropped 18,080 kilograms of bombs. The first day bombardment group began work in September. The group included the 96th, the 20th, and 11th Squadrons. The 166th Squadron joined the group in November. In 12 flying days in September, the bombers dropped 3,466 kilograms of bombs. In 15 flying days in October, 46,133 kilograms, and in four flying days in November, 17,979 kilograms. On November 11th, the day of the signing of the armistice, there were actually engaged on the front 740 American planes, 744 pilots, 457 observers, and 23 aerial gunners. Of the total number of planes, 329 were of the pursuit type, 296 were for observation, and 115 were bombers. In addition, several hundred planes of various types were being used at the instruction camps when the war ended. America, although the last of the great nations to embark upon a great aircraft production program, was the birthplace of the airplane, the Wright brothers being the undisputed inventors of the modern type. Wilbur and Orville Wright made their first experiments in flying at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Their first attempts were of a gliding nature and were accomplished by starting from the top of a dune or sand hill, the operator lying full length face downward on the underplane of the machine. During these experiments, they succeeded in flying 600 feet. Their first flight with an airplane driven by a motor was on December 17, 1903, when they succeeded in flying about 270 yards in 59 seconds. The machine was driven by a 16-horsepower motor. Santos Dumont was one of the early pioneers in aeronautical experiments. After showing a marked talent with balloons, he turned his attention to heavier-than-air machines, and in 1906 created a world's record in a flight of 230 yards at a speed of 25 miles an hour. In 1907, Henry Farnham made a half-circular flight in a Voisin biplane using a 50-horsepower motor, returning to his starting point. About this time, a flight of 9 minutes and 15 seconds was recorded by Delagrant on a Voisin-constructed biplane. The first previously announced public flight was made on July 4, 1908, by Glenn H. Curtis at Hammondsport, New York, and was witnessed by a number of New Yorkers who had gone to Hammondsport to see the flight. In the winter of 1913-14, Mr. Rodman Wanamaker gave Glenn H. Curtis a commission to build a flying boat which would fly across the Atlantic. Commander Port was brought from England, and he with Mr. Curtis, worked out the designs for a flying boat much larger than any previously built, and fitted with two motors instead of one. 
as entirely separate power plants would be used one motor would naturally run somewhat faster than the other and it was freely predicted that the machine could not be handled the first trial however proved that it would not only fly but that after it was once in the air one motor could be slowed down and even stopped and the machine continued to fly this machine was the forerunner of the seaplane used by the american british and other navies in the war although somewhat changed in detail the beginning of the war stopped the transatlantic experiments and this machine found its way into the british navy it was christened the america and the larger flying boats or seaplanes which are now being built and used by the british and american navies are still known as the america or super american type at first fighting operations were carried out by individual aviators or comparatively small squadrons but the battles of march 1918 witnessed the definite development of larger squadrons maneuvering as effectively as bodies of cavalry and in massed formation attacking infantry columns the possibilities of the new aerial arm were further demonstrated in the creation of a barrage as effective as that of heavy artillery for the purpose of holding back advancing bodies of infantry in the first days of the german offensive there took place an aerial battle which up to that time was unique in the annals of warfare it was a battle not merely for the purpose of gaining the mastery of the air but to aid allied infantry and artillery in stemming the tide of the german advance and when the drive finally slowed down and came to a halt in picardy the allied airmen had undoubtedly contributed largely to the result during march twenty first and twenty second nineteen eighteen the opening days of the great german drive there was comparatively little aerial activity the aviators of both sides were preparing for the impending battle which actually began on the morning of the twenty third and lasted all that day and the day following the story of the air battle of march twenty third twenty fourth reads like one of the most extraordinary adventure tales ever imagined the struggle began with squadrons of airplanes ascending and maneuvering as perfectly as cavalry they rose to dizzy heights and descending swept the air close to the ground the individual pilots of the opposing sides then began executing all manner of movements climbing diving turning in every direction and seeking to get into the best position to pour machine gun fire into enemy airplanes every few minutes a machine belonging to an allied or german squadron crashed to the ground often in flames at the end of the first day's fighting wrecked airplanes and the mangled bodies of the aviators lay strewn all over the battlefield all next day march twenty fourth the struggle in the air went on with unabated fury the allied air squadrons were now on the offensive and penetrated far inside the german lines the german aviators counter-attacked whenever they could and more than once succeeded in crossing the french lines but at the close of the second day victory rested with the allied airmen and during the next five scarcely a german airplane took the air the sudden termination of the war caused speculation throughout the world concerning the future of the airplane when rumor declared that america's newly won preeminence in aviation would disappear captain roy n francis of the division of military aeronautics made this statement america cannot afford to junk the airplane fleet which has cost her so many millions of dollars i do not believe that any other nation will do so even if the peace congress should decide on universal disarmament there are still any number of uses to which airplanes can be put in times of peace take the airmail service for instance this is now only in its infancy but it is destined to become as common as the railway mail service it will employ hundreds of airplanes and aviators all over the country then there is the possibility of our machines being used for seacoast patrol work a valuable addition to our coast guard forces which save many ocean vessels from disaster every year they will be largely used for army dispatch work instead of sending official messages from post to post by the present methods airplanes will be used after the war as they are now being used at the front on the great lakes airplanes can be used for coast guard work as on the sea coast and they can also be used for patrolling the lakes themselves think how many wrecked lake vessels might have been saved in the past had there been an airplane nearby to carry its message of distress and guide rescue ships to the scene forest patrol is still another opening for the use of expert aviators every year almost our great forest fires in the northwest demonstrate that our present methods of prevention of forest fires are faulty chiefly because the fires are not discovered while they are still smoldering constant airplane patrol over our great forests would make forest fires a thing of the past then there are any number of commercial uses to which planes could be put instead of a cargo of bombs a commercial airplane could carry a cargo of small package freight 
for which immediate delivery is necessary. The use of the airplane for passenger carrying is now being developed. The huge Caproni and Hanley Page machines will be used for this purpose in the future. Thousands of persons will want to fly just for the novelty, and the possibility of accidents will be reduced to the minimum. Again, there is the need for scientific research and improvements of the airplane, which will keep scores of men and machines busy for years. It will not be necessary, of course, to maintain the numerous government training fields for aviators after the war, but some of the best of them should be retained. I do not believe it will be necessary to discharge a single pilot or observer from the Army or to junk a single undamaged plane after the war. Henry Woodhouse, Governor of the Aerial Club of America and a worldwide authority on aeronautics, made the following forecast. Aircraft capable of lifting 15 tons with a speed of 100 miles an hour are now in actual production. The first of the American-built Caproni planes, equipped with four Liberty motors and developing 1,750 horsepower, has just been successfully tested. This giant plane has a total lifting capacity of 4,000 pounds, or 20 tons. The Super Hanley Page, or the Caproni, could easily carry 50 bags or more than a ton of mail. This means 100,000 letters. Judging the future development of aircraft by what has taken place in the last two years, we may look to the building of a 5,000 horsepower airplane, possibly within a year. If the people of the various cities along the eight great airways already proposed insist on it, at least a dozen additional aerial mail lines can be established within 12 months. This can be done by utilizing only machines not needed by the Army or Navy. That means it will be possible to send by post plane at least 50 million of the 100 million day and night letters, and at least 25 million of the 50 million special delivery letters that are sent each year in the United States. Post office officials estimate that the average cost of telegraphic day and night letters now going over the wires is close to $1 each. Special delivery letters average about 13 cents apiece. This makes a total of more than $50 million worth of potential aerial mail business that is simply waiting for the establishment of aerial mail routes, which can easily be established within the next 12 months. 400 miles is the distance over which postplane day mail is most effective. Aerial mail letters are effective over any distance since, with proper stations, light signals, and guides for night postplane flying, the air mail can be carried more than 1,000 miles between the hours of 6 p.m. and 8 a.m. The cost of aerial mail night and day letters will be less than that of wire communication. The cost of an aerial mail letter is 16 cents for two ounces. For this price there can be sent a message that would cost five dollars to send by telegraph. The estimate of fifty million dollars of potential postplane business takes no account of the possibilities of transporting parcel post aerial mail. One of the Caproni 2100 horsepower machines now in operation could easily transport 2,500 pounds of mail. At least $25 million worth of parcel post could be sent by airplane. Enthusiasts who look forward to the transatlantic transportation of aerial mail as certain to come within the next 12 months assert that there is another $25 million worth of transatlantic mail waiting for an aerial mail service. They point out that Uncle Sam now pays 80 cents a pound to American steamships to carry transatlantic mail and that a charge of one dollar per letter across the Atlantic would be a paying proposition. Charges of mismanagement and graft were investigated by the United States Senate and by the Department of Justice. Former Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Charles E. Hughes, was named by President Wilson to conduct the latter inquiry. Waste was found, due largely to the emergency nature of the contract. Justice Hughes recommended that Colonel Edward Deeds of the United States Signal Corps be tried by court-martial for his connection with certain contracts, and recommended that several other persons be tried in the United States courts. Justice Hughes and the Senate Investigation Committee gave their unqualified approval to the management of America's aircraft production by John D. Ryan. Mr. Ryan resigned his charge as head of the Aircraft Production Board in November 1918. His last public announcement was the invention of an aerial telephone by which the commander of a squadron standing on the ground could communicate with aviators flying in battle formation. End of chapter 48。Health and Happiness of the American Forces 
Since the fateful day when Cain slew Abel, thereby setting a precedent for human warfare, no fighter has been so well protected from disease and discomfort of mind and body, so speedily cured of his wounds, as the American soldier and sailor during the World War. The basis of this remarkable achievement was sanitary education preached first by competent physicians and sociologists, then by newspapers to the civilian population, and ultimately by the soldiers and sailors themselves, each man acting as an evangel of personal and community health and sanitation. In 1914, before war was declared, the words venereal diseases were relegated to the advertisements of quacks and patent medicines. When the war ended, virtually every young and old man and woman knew the meaning of the words and the miseries that come in their train. So it was with other details of the care of the human body, with sewage problems, with the grave community question of pure water, with the use of intoxicating beverages, and with other problems interwoven with the health and happiness of humanity. Among the leaders in this wide-flung campaign of education was the American Red Cross. Starting with a mere nominal membership before the war, its roster rose to the mighty total of more than 28 million American men, women, and children when the war ended. More than $300,000 was poured into the American Red Cross treasury. In addition to these contributions of money came the free services of millions of Americans, mostly women. Red Cross workshops dotted the land, and from these came bandages, sweaters, comfort kits, trench necessities, clothing for homeless refugees, and a vast quantity of material aid in every conceivable form. American Red Cross workers during the war knitted 14,089,000 garments for the Army and Navy. In addition, workers turned out 253,196,000 surgical dressings, 25,255,000 hospital garments, and 1,464,000 refugee garments. Sewing chapters repaired old clothing and sent it overseas to the orphaned and the widowed and millions of Americans learned the sublime lesson of sacrifice through the Red Cross, a lesson that has left its imprint upon America for generations. The work of the American Red Cross extended through many lands. It followed the flags of the Entente Allies into Palestine, Mesopotamia, India, South Africa, and other battlegrounds. Its work on the Western Front was a miracle of achievement. In Russia, through the Red Terror of the Revolution, the workers of the American Red Cross went serenely about their tasks of mercy, relieving the hungry, aiding the sick, and clothing the ragged peasants. Henry P. Davidson left the firm of J.P. Morgan & Company to devote his administrative genius to the affairs of the American Red Cross. Other men and women of rare executive ability joined in the free tender of their services to the work of the Red Cross. While the organization strove mightily against famines, wounds, and diseases overseas, it was suddenly confronted during the period from September 8th to November 9th, 1918, with the severest epidemic America had experienced in generations. Returning American troops brought the germs of the malady known as Spanish influenza into New York and Boston. Thence it spread throughout the country. During its brief career, the epidemic claimed a total of 82,306 deaths in 46 American cities, having a combined population of 23 million. Philadelphia, a great center of war industry, with the Philadelphia Navy Yard harboring thousands of sailors and marines, showed the highest mortality in proportion to population, 7.4 per 1,000. Baltimore, with 6.7 per 1,000, showed the next greatest mortality. The record of the Red Cross in this epidemic was one of instant service. Hundreds of thousands of masks were made in Red Cross workrooms, and these were worn by nurses and by members of families in afflicted homes. On May 1, 1917, just before the appointment of the War Council, the American Red Cross had 486,194 members working through 562 chapters. On July 31, 1918, the organization numbered 20,648,103 annual members, besides 8 million members of the Junior Red Cross, a total enrollment of over one-fourth the population of the United States. These members carried on their Red Cross work through 3,854 chapters, which again divided themselves into some 30,000 branches and auxiliaries. The total actual collections from the first war fund amounted to more than $115 million. The subscriptions to the second war fund amounted to upwards of $176 million. From membership dues, the collections approximated $24,500,000. 
the home service of the red cross with its more than forty thousand workers extended its ministrations of sympathy and counsel each month to upward of one hundred thousand families left behind by soldiers at the front supplementing but not duplicating the work of the american cross were the services of the y m c a y w c a knights of columbus jewish welfare association salvation army american library association and other bodies these operated under the general supervision of the war and navy departments commissions on training camp activities raymond b fostick was the chairman of both of these bodies concerning these commissions president wilson declared i do not believe it an exaggeration to say that no army ever before assembled has had more conscientious and painstaking thought given to the protection and stimulation of its mental moral and physical manhood every endeavor has been made to surround the men both here and abroad with the kind of environment which a democracy owes to those who fight in its behalf. In this work, the commissions on training camp activities have represented the government and the government's solicitude that the moral and spiritual resources of the nation should be mobilized behind the troops. The country is therefore to be congratulated upon the fine spirit with which organizations and groups of many kinds, some of them of national standing, have harnessed themselves together under the leadership of the government's agency in a common ministry to the men of the army and the navy afloat and ashore the organizations operating under the supervision of the two commissions gave to the men of the american forces home care suitable recreation and constant protection the club life of the army and navy both in the training camps and after the men went into the service was most capably directed by the y m c a knights of columbus and the jewish welfare association Non-sectarianism was the rule of all the huts and clubs conducted by these organizations. Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish chaplains mingled with workers of the Salvation Army, with professional prize-fighters who became athletic instructors, with actors and actresses who contributed their talents freely to the entertainment of soldiers and sailors. Moving picture shows, boxing contests, continuation schools, canteens where women workers served American-made dishes, these were some of the activities following the men. The YMCA and Knights of Columbus bore the largest share of this work. More than $300,000 was contributed by the people of America to the maintenance of these activities. The other organizations rounded out the work of the first two organizations and filled in with special attention to needs on which others did not specialize. The larger organization, the YMCA, was chosen by the government to carry out a portion of the government program, the conducting of the canteens. The Knights of Columbus specialized in comforts less considered by other war relief organizations. Nothing gave greater relaxation to the fighting men, coming from trenches or the battle line caked with mud and blood and weary with long hours, than a shower bath, and generous facilities were provided close to the fighting front. Back of the lines, in the rest billets and concentration camps, provisions were less generous than at the front until the Knights of Columbus took up the task of seeing that the men who were temporarily away from the active fighting had these facilities for bathing. It was but one of the many activities of the Knights of Columbus, but one of the most appreciated. One of the first requisitions made by Rev. John B. DeValls, one of the first chaplains ever sent over by the Knights of Columbus, was for a shower bath, and he set it up in connection with his headquarters in a little French town, and it was overworked from the first. From this spread the movement for establishing shower baths in clubhouses being opened behind the lines and in villages. There was no preaching in a Knights of Columbus hall or clubroom, but there was clean moral environment and healthy recreation and amusement. For this was proven the thing to keep up the morale of fighting men. The YMCA built 1,500 huts in Europe costing from 2000 to $20,000 each, equipped with canteen reading and writing and recreational facilities to soldiers. It operated 28 different leave areas with hotels that had a total of 35,000 beds. In addition, in Paris, port towns, and several big centers in the war zone, there were Y hotels for transient soldiers where one could get a clean bed and a good meal for about half the price charged by French hotels. Over 3,000 movie and theatrical shows a week were provided free. 300 Y athletic directors had charge of the sports in the American Army, operating 836 athletic fields. Enormous quantities of cookies and chocolate and cigarettes were supplied. A hundred of the best-known educators from America directed educational work. The staff consisted of Professor Erskine of Columbia University, Professor Daly of Harvard, Professor Coleman of Chicago University, Professor Appleton of the University of Kansas, 
and Frank Spaulding, superintendent of the Cleveland Public Schools. Seconding the work of the YMCA, its sister organization, YWCA, extended its activities from the training camps of America to the battlefields of Europe. At the close of its first year of America's participation in the war, the YWCA had six established lines of work in France. Hostess houses, clubs for French working women and business girls, clubs for nurses with the American Army, clubs for women of the Signal Corps, clubs for British women, WAX, working with the American Army, and recreation work for all women employed in any way by the American Expeditionary Force. In one year its activities spread to 25 cities, and it had 43 units. The hostess houses were at Paris and Tours. The Hotel Petrograd, on the Rue Comartin, was leased in Paris and turned out to be one of the most interesting centers of American life in France. It was run on the most liberal lines, and in a thoroughly democratic way. The meals were good, and in the big dining room, men were admitted on the same footing as women. There were two of these hostess houses at Tours. For the girls of the Signa Corps, twenty-two homes were opened, and there were huts for the wax at Bourges and Tours. YWCA secretaries were attached to twenty base hospital units and opened fourteen clubs for nurses. The most interesting and unique work of the YWCA was that of its foyers for French working women and business girls. There were thirteen of these in Lyon, Rouen, Bourges, Tours, Saint-Étienne, Paris, and mont -Luzon. The Salvation Army erected hotels at the various large training camps in America, and its workers made American donuts for the soldiers close to the battle lines in France. The work done by the men and women of the Salvation Army aided materially in bringing the heart of America into France. The Jewish Welfare Association not only performed notable service in following the men from training camps into actual service, but it also planned and executed a great reconstruction program under the direction of Felix M. Warburg, chairman of the Joint Distribution Committee. The American Library Association solved the grave problem of providing the soldiers and sailors with suitable reading matter. Each of the cantonments had its special library building in charge of a trained librarian, and interesting literature followed the men into the field through the services of this organization. Some idea of the work of these various organizations is gained by reading the following order received by Raymond B. Fostick at his headquarters in Washington after the steamship Kansas, carrying supplies for the various huts at American field quarters, was sunk. Send twenty tons plain soap, twenty tons condensed milk, ten tons chocolate, five tons cocoa, two tons tea, five tons coffee, five tons vanilla wafers, fifty tons sugar, twenty tons flour, two tons fruit essences, two tons lemonade powder, one hundred and twenty thousand testaments, one hundred and twenty thousand hymn books, tons of magazines and other literature, thirty tons writing paper and envelopes, fifty thousand folding chairs, five hundred camp cots, two thousand blankets, twenty typewriters, sixty tents, seventy-five moving picture machines, two hundred phonographs, five thousand records, one ton ink blotters, seventy-five thousand dollars worth athletic goods, thirty automobiles and trucks. The order was filled at once. Besides the associations above enumerated, other volunteer organizations contributed to the health and happiness of American soldiers and sailors. The Emergency Aid of Pennsylvania established two clubs, one in Paris, the other in Tours, both of which performed notable services in feeding and restoring the spirits of American soldiers and sailors. The club in Paris was under the direction of the Rev. Frederick W. Beekman, and that in Tours was directed by Amos Tuck French. Mrs. Barclay Warburton of Philadelphia was designated by Governor Brumbaugh as Commissioner General of Overseas Work for the Emergency Aid. Other states had similar organizations looking after the comfort of the men. But it was upon the professional doctors, nurses, and sanitarians that the bulk of this work devolved. This task included the prevention as well as the cure of maladies menacing the American forces. It reached out into years after the war into the problems of re-education and rehabilitation of the shell-shocked and wounded. Major General William C. Gorgas, former Surgeon General of the Army, stated this concept when he said, The whole conception of governmental and national responsibility for caring for the wounded has undergone radical change during the months of study given the subject by experts serving with the Medical Officers Reserve Corps and others consulting with them. Instead of the old idea that responsibility ended with the return of the soldier to private life, with his wounds healed, and such pension as he might be given, it is now considered that it is the duty of the government 
to equip and re-educate the wounded man after healing his wounds, and to return him to civil life ready to be as useful to himself and his country as possible. To carry out this idea, reconstruction hospitals were established in large centers of population, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, Buffalo, Cincinnati, Chicago, St. Paul, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Denver, Kansas City, St. Louis, Memphis, Richmond, Atlanta, and New Orleans were sites of these institutions. Each was planned as a 500-bed hospital, but with provision for enlargement to 1,000 beds if needed. These hospitals were not the last step in the return of the wounded soldiers to civil life. When the soldiers were able to take up industrial training, further provision was ready. Arrangements were made by the Department of Military Orthopedics to care for soldiers, so far as orthopedics, the prevention of deformity, was concerned, continuously until they were returned to civil life. Orthopedic surgeons were attached to the medical force near the firing line and to the different hospitals back to the base orthopedic hospital, which was established within 100 miles of the firing line. In this hospital, in addition to orthopedic surgical care, there was equipment for surgical reconstruction work and curative workshops in which men acquired ability to use injured members while doing work interesting and useful in itself. This method supplanted the old and tiresome one of prescribing a set of motions for a man to go through with no other purpose than to reacquire use of his injured part. Instructors and examiners for all the troops were furnished by the Department of Military Orthopedic Surgery. A number of older and more experienced surgeons acted as instructors and supervisors for each of the groups into which the army was divided. A peculiar condition arising from the use of heavy artillery in the war was that called shell shock. The most pathetic wrecks of war were soldiers suffering from shattered nerves. Paris had many of them. They appeared to be normal, but they were human wrecks. Shell shock, or the aftermath of illness from wounds, left them in weakened health, subject to violent heart attacks. Most of them lacked energy and perseverance. They became awkward, like big children. If employment was found for them, for many had large families to support, they quickly lost their jobs through apathy or collapse. A society in Paris did everything possible to relieve the sufferings of these victims of the war. It operated with the authorization of the French government, under the name L'Assistance aux Blessés Neuves de la Guerre. American hospitals after the war contained many of these cases. Some of the victims became incurably insane. Besides the noble work done by the great army of American physicians, surgeons, and nurses in caring for soldiers and sailors, a service of scarcely less magnitude was rendered to the civilian populations of France, Belgium, and Italy. Tuberculosis in France was a real plague, taking a toll of 80,000 lives every year. American physicians and nurses preached the doctrine of fresh air, care of teeth, and proper food for children. Almost immediately this campaign of sanitation had its effect in a decreasing death rate from tuberculosis. European nations generally were benefited by the stay of the American army overseas. The straightforward manner in which the social evil was attacked had direct benefits. The important detail of dental care also received an interest through the advent of the American soldier. The London Daily Mail made this comment on that question. One thing about the American soldiers and sailors must strike English people when they see these gallant fighters, and that is the soundness and general whiteness of their teeth. From childhood the Yank is taught to take care of his teeth. He has tooth drill thrice daily and visits his dentist at fixed periods, say, every three or four months. If by chance a tooth does decay, the rot is at once arrested by gold or platinum filling. American dentists never extract a tooth. No matter how badly decayed it may be, they save the molar by crowning it with gold. The United States soldiers have set us a splendid example in this matter. They fairly shame the ordinary Tommy by the brilliance of their molars, but they will do so no longer if young English mothers will only wake up to the fact that bad teeth cause bad health, and that doctors' and dentists' bills will be saved by the regular use of the toothbrush. End of chapter 49Chapter 50 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 50 Pirates of the Under Seas. Germany relied upon the submarine to win the war. This, in a nutshell, explains the main reason why the United States was drawn into the war. 
Von Tirpitz, the German admiral, obsessed with the theory that no effective answer could be made to the submarine, convinced the German high command and the Kaiser that only through unrestricted submarine warfare could England be starved and the war brought to an end with victory for Germany. Since August 1914, the theory held by von Tirpitz and his party of extremists had been combated by Prince Maximilian of Baden and Chancellor von bethmann holweg and others high in the Council of the Kaiser. These men pointed out that, leaving out such questions as piracy on the high seas, the drowning of women and children, the destruction of the property of neutrals, there still remained the question of expediency. America, they asserted, was certain to enter the war if unrestricted submarine warfare was decreed. These men were denounced as cowards, and von Tirpitz finally triumphed. The submarine employed by the Germans was of the type designed by Simon Lake, an American. The Germans bought two submarines built by Mr. Lake at Kronstadt for the Russians during the Russian-Japanese War. Various improvements upon the diesel engine and special training for submarine crews enabled the German Navy to strike terrible blows during the early part of the war. Little by little, however, the Allies discovered the answer to the submarine menace. One of these was the convoy. Fleets of merchant vessels surrounded by fast destroyers made life a misery for the submarine crews. In the early days, vessels of all character fled from the approach of a submarine. The destroyers of the convoys, however, adopted a different method. They rushed at the periscopes in efforts to ram the submarine, and as they raced over the spot where the submarine had been at the rate of twenty-two knots or more an hour, they dropped huge containers, dubbed ash cans, containing depth charges of trinatural toluol. Seaplanes carrying bombs, small dirigible balloons known as blimps, observation balloons moored on the decks of warships, steel nets, and especially devised anti-submarine mines, were also factors in the general work of submarine destruction. In addition to all these, every ship, both cargo carrier and war vessel, had its well-trained gun crew, and hundreds of thousands of keen-eyed mariners daily and nightly swept the seas with binoculars watching for anything that resembled a periscope. As a consequence of this combination of destructive agencies, the British Admiralty was enabled to announce at the close of the war that more than 150 German submarines had been destroyed. The names of the commanding officers of the German submarines, which had been disposed of, were given out by the government in order to substantiate to the world the statement made by the Prime Minister in the House of Commons on August 7th, and denied in the German papers, that at least 150 of these ocean pests had been destroyed. The statement included no officers commanding the Austrian submarines, of which a number had been destroyed, and it did not exhaust the list of German submarines put out of action. The fate of the officers was given, and of these the majority, 116, were dead. Twenty-seven were prisoners of war, six were interned in neutral countries where they took refuge, and one succeeded in returning to Germany. Further light on the subject of German submarines was given on September 18, 1918, by Senator William H. Thompson, of Kansas, in a speech in which he told the Senate, the submarine is no longer a serious menace to transportation across the seas. It is, of course, an annoyance and a great hindrance, and as long as there is a single submarine in the waters of the sea, every effort must be made by the Allied powers to destroy it, for it is an outlaw and must not exist. The truth is that Germany never had more than 320 submarines all told, including all construction before and since the war. We have positive knowledge of the destruction of more than one half of these submarines, and we also know that it is practically impossible for Germany to keep in operation more than 10% of those remaining. It is therefore reduced to a negligible quantity, so far as its ultimate effect upon the result of the war is concerned. I saw a reliable statement in France to the effect that there is one ship of some character leaving the eastern shores of America for the war zone every six minutes and it is only a few vessels which were ever torpedoed, estimated at about 1%. This is less than the loss by storm and accident in the early days of transportation, and is not much greater than such loss now. We must bear in mind that we read only of the ships which have been torpedoed, and we see but little account of the hundreds of ships which pass over the ocean safely and undisturbed. 300,000 soldiers are conveyed across the Atlantic every 30 days, and an average of about 500,000 tons of freight, carried to the French coast. There are warehouses in only one of the many ports of France with a capacity of over two million tons. It is to the Navy that the credit for the destruction of this outlaw seagoing craft is due. The Navy is and has been the backbone of this war, the same as it has been of almost every great war in history. Without the Allied Navy, the submarine would have perhaps accomplished its nefarious purpose in starving the European allies, 
and in preventing them from securing the necessary munitions of war to defend themselves. It has utterly failed in this respect. The Allies are amply supplied with food, and there are provisions enough on hand now, if every ship should be sunk, to last the Allies and armies for months. The destroyer is the ship which has brought Germany to her knees in submarine warfare, and will keep her there. We have not enough destroyers, and it is for this reason we are obliged in this great transportation problem to run risks which would not be undertaken under ordinary conditions. If every ship was escorted by a sufficient number of destroyers, I doubt if there would be a single ship of any consequence sunk, except by the merest accident. Upon the same subject, Sir Eric Geddes, First Lord of the British Admiralty, on October 14th, reviewing the British effort in the war, said that during 1918 the casualties of the British on the Western Front equaled those of all the Allies combined. The British Navy, he said, since the beginning of the war had lost in fighting ships of all classes a total of 230, more than twice the losses in war vessels of all the Allies. In addition to these, Great Britain had lost 450 auxiliary craft, such as minesweepers and trawlers, making a total of 680. He revealed the fact that the effective warship Barrage, which had been drawn between the Orkneys and Norway against German submarines and surface craft, was, during the latter months of the war, maintained largely by ships of the United States. The British merchant ships, lost since 1914, exceeded 2,400, representing a gross tonnage of 7,750,000, nearly three times the aggregate loss of all other Allied and neutral countries. In his statement on the submarine situation, he said, In February 1917, the ruthless submarine warfare confronted us, whilst the armies in France at that time were feeling a sense of superiority over the enemy, which was illustrated by the successes of the Battle of Arras, the taking of Vimy Ridge, the advance between the Ancre and the Somme, the offensive in Champagne, Chemin des Dames, Messine and Pascandale ridges. Thus we felt, and rightly felt, that the weakest front at that time was the sea, not on the surface, but under water. The whole of the available energies of the Allies were consequently thrown into overcoming the submarine and the menace which threatened to destroy the lines of communication of the Alliance. The reduced sinkings which have been published since that period show how we gradually overcame that menace, and today most men say that the submarine menace is a thing of the past. That it is a thing of the past, in so far as it can never win the war for the enemy or enable the enemy to prevent us from winning the war, provided we do not underrate the danger but take adequate steps against it, I affirm now as the opinion of the British Admiralty, but it is a menace that comes and goes. The end of the great submarine menace came on November 20th, when 20 German submarines were officially surrendered to Rear Admiral Tyrwhitt of the British Navy, 30 miles off Harwich, England. Within the following week, more than 80 other German submarines and a number of Austrian craft were also surrendered to the British. The spectacle of the surrender was most impressive. After steaming some 20 miles across the North Sea, the Harwich forces, which consisted of five light cruisers and 20 destroyers, were sighted. The flagship of Admiral Tyrwhitt, the commander, was the Curaco. High above the squadron hung a big observation balloon. The squadron, headed by the flagship, then steamed toward the Dutch coast, followed by the Coventry, Dragoon, Danal, and Centaur. Other ships followed in line, with their navigation lights showing. The picture was a noble one, as the great vessels, with the moon still shining, plowed their way to take part in the surrender of the German U-boats. Soon after the British squadron started, the paravanes were dropped overboard. These devices are shaped like tops, and divert any mines which may be encountered, for the vessels were now entering a minefield. Almost everyone on board donned a life belt, and just as the red sun appeared above the horizon, the first German submarine appeared in sight. Soon after seven o'clock, twenty submarines were seen in line, accompanied by two German destroyers, the Tibania and the Sierra Ventana, which were to take the submarine crews back to Germany after the transfer. All the submarines were on the surface with their hatches open and their crews standing on deck. The vessels were flying no flags whatever, and their guns were trained fore and aft, in accordance with the terms of surrender. A bugle sounded on the Caraco, and all the gunships took up their stations, ready for any possible treachery. The leading destroyer, in response to a signal from the Admiral, turned and led the way towards England, and the submarines were ordered to follow. They immediately did so. The surrender had been accomplished. Each cruiser turned, and, keeping a careful lookout, steamed toward Harwich. 
on the deck of one of the largest of the submarines, which carried two 5.9 guns, 23 officers and men were counted. The craft was estimated to be nearly 300 feet in length. Its number had been painted out. Near the shipwash lightship, three large British seaplanes, followed by an airship, were observed. One of the submarines was seen to send up a couple of carrier pigeons, and at once a signal was flashed from the Admiral that it had no right to do this. When the ships had cleared the minefield and entered the war channel, the paravanes were hauled aboard. On reaching a point some twenty miles off Harwich, the ships dropped anchor and Captain Addison went out on the warship Maidstone. British crews were then put on board the submarines to take them into harbor. With the exception of the engine staffs, all the German soldiers remained on deck. The submarines were then taken through the gates of the harbor and the German crews were transferred to the transports and taken back to Germany. As the boats went through the gates, a white signal was run up on each of them with the German flag underneath. Each German submarine commander at the transfer was required to sign a declaration to the effect that his vessel was in running order, that its periscope was intact, that its torpedoes were unloaded, and that its torpedo heads were safe. Orders had been issued forbidding any demonstration, and these instructions were obeyed to the letter. There was complete silence as the submarine surrendered and as the crews were transferred. On November 21st, the German high seas fleet that had been protected by the submarines surrendered to the combined fleet consisting of British, American, and French battleships. The British Admiralty's terse statement concerning the historic spectacle follows. The commander-in-chief of the great fleet has reported that at 9.30 o'clock this morning he met the first and main installment of the German high seas fleet, which is surrendering for internment. Admiral Sir David Betty is commander-in-chief of the Grand Fleet. On the same day, another flotilla of German U-boats was also surrendered to a British squadron. There were 19 submarines in all. The 20th broke down on the way. The Grand Fleet, accompanied by five American battleships and three French cruisers, steamed out at 3 o'clock on the morning of November 21st from its Scottish base to accept the surrender. The vessels moved in two long columns. The German fleet which surrendered consisted of nine battleships, five cruisers, seven light cruisers, and 50 destroyers, 71 vessels in all. There remained to be surrendered two battleships which were under repair and 50 modern torpedo boat destroyers. One German destroyer, while on its way across the North Sea with the other ships of the German High Seas fleet, to surrender, struck a mine. It was so badly damaged that it sank. Describing the surrender of the German warships to Sir David Betty, the commander-in-chief of the Grand Fleet, correspondent said that after all the German ships had been taken over, the British Admiral went through the line on the Queen Elizabeth, every Allied vessel being manned and greeting the Admiral and the flagship with loud and ringing cheers. The British Grand Fleet put to sea in two single lines six miles apart, and so formed as to enable the surrendering fleet to come up the center. The leading ship of the German line was sighted between nine and ten o'clock in the morning. It was the Sedlitz, flying the German naval ensign. A telegram received in Amsterdam from Berlin gave this list of surrendered warships, which included one more battleship than later reports showed. Battleships Kaiser, 24,113 tons Kaiserin, 24,113 tons König Albert, 24,113 tons Kron Prince Wilhelm, 25,000 tons Prince Regent Luitpold, 24,113 tons Markgraf, 25,293 tons Grosser Kurfürst, 25,293 tons Bayern, 28,000 tons, König, 25,293 tons, and Frederick de Grossa, 24,113. Battle cruisers, Hindenburg, 27,000 tons, Der Flinger, 28,000 tons, Sedlitz, 25,000 tons, Moltke, 23,000 tons, and Van der Tann, 18,800 tons. Light cruisers, Bremen, 4,000 tons, Brumer, 4,000 tons. Frankfurt, 5,400 tons. Köln, tonnage uncertain. Dresden, tonnage uncertain. And Emden, 5,400 tons. End of chapter 50. Chapter 51 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 51. Approaching the Final Stage 
the might and pride of germany were smashed and humbled by folk in frontal attacks divided roughly into three great sectors the first of these attacks was delivered by the french and americans in the southern sector which included verdun and the argonne the second smash was delivered by british french and americans in the cambrai sector the third was delivered by british belgians french and americans in the belgian sector on the north of the great battle line the cambrai operation had as its first objective the possession of the strategic railways both of which ran from valencias one to the huge distribution center at douai the other to cambrai itself to reach these objectives the allies were obliged to cross the sensi and escot canals under infantry and artillery fire besides these natural obstacles there was the famous hunding line of fortifications erected by the germans between the scarpe and the oise river the attack was opened in force on september eighteenth nineteen eighteen by the fourth british army under general rawlinson and the first french army under general de Bigny. the assault was successful northwest of st quentin and determined german counter-attacks were broken down by french and british artillery fire the third british army under general bing and the thirtieth american division cooperating with the first british army under sir henry horne attacked furiously over a fourteen mile front toward cambrai the net result of this operation was the possession of the canal du nord the taking of several villages and six thousand prisoners this was on september twenty seventh the following day the same forces captured fontaine notre dame marcoin noyala and cantiang more than two hundred guns were captured and ten thousand prisoners on september twenty ninth the americans took bellecourt and noroy and invested the suburbs of cambrai the british crossed the escout canal and the canadians penetrated some of the environs of cambrai the resolution and ferocity of the attack thoroughly dismayed the germans and the salient produced by the smash forced the teutons to evacuate the greatly prized lens coal fields on october third horn and bing continued their advance the former occupying beyond st vast southwest of douai and the latter reaching a position five miles northwest of cambrai caught between the jaws of the pincers the german forces occupying cambrai made haste to escape outright capture the city that had been the objective of british hopes and thrusts for two years fell into the hands of the allies the german retreat extended over a thirty-mile front and included both st quentin and cambrai simultaneously the german forces between arras and st quentin fell steadily backward le chateau and zazuel fell into the hands of the british october seventeenth three thousand prisoners and a quantity of war material being included in the bag in the meantime general mangan attacking in the leon sector drove the germans from the strategic kemen de dam and with general bertelot captured beria bock the st gobain mastiff and completed contact with generals pershing and Gouraud, on the right and with generals rawlinson and de Benet on the left the allied advance now became a huge steel broom sweeping the germans irresistibly before it the operation extended from the ouise southwest to the aisne broadening thence until it included the entire front the hindenburg line the somme battlefield the hunding line were all quickly overrun the fortress of maubourg fifty miles northwest of st quentin which was connected with that city by a triple railway connection was evacuated as a direct result of this operation when st quentin itself fell into the hands of de Bonnet, it was found that the germans had deported the entire civil population of fifty thousand this was the crux of the operations by folk germans were given no rest night and day the pressure continued every clash showed the increasing superiority of the allies both in men and material and the corresponding deterioration of the german forces this demoralization of the germans extended from the high command to the private soldier prisoners poured into the hands of the allies evacuation of lille was commenced on october second and robier and turcoing also fell it was the beginning of germany's military debacle the time was ripe for the coup de grace soon to be delivered by americans cooperating with the allies on a seventy-one mile front the kaiser ludendorff and von hindenburg abandoned hope the command went forth from the german general headquarters to retreat 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 while prince maximilian of baden appealed to america for an armistice the sword in germany's hand was broken autocracy 
defeated in the eyes of its deluded subjects and discredited in the eyes of the world, was in headlong flight. Its only concern was to save as much as possible from the ruins of the ostentatious temple it had reared. End of chapter 51「Chapter fifty two of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter fifty two. Last Days of the War. From November first until November eleventh, the day when the armistice granting terms to Germany was signed, the collapse of the German defensive was complete. The army that under von Hindenburg and Ludendorff had smashed its way over Poland, Romania, Serbia, Belgium, and into the heart of France, was now a military machine in full retreat. It is only justice to that machine to say that the great retreat at no place degenerated into a rout. Von Hindenburg and the German general staff had planned a series of rear-guard actions that were effective in protecting the main bodies of infantry and artillery. Machine-gun nests and airplane attacks were the main reliance of the Germans in these maneuvers of delay, but the German field artillery also did its share. Immense quantities of material and many thousands of prisoners were captured by the British, Canadians, and Australians in the north, and by the French and Americans in the south. Simultaneously with this wide and savage drive upon the Germans along the Belgian and French fronts came the heaviest Italian attack of the war. Before it the Austrians were swept in a torrent that was irresistible. French, English, and American troops cooperated in this thrust that extended from the plains of the Piave into Torrentino. The immediate effect of the Italian offensive was to force Austria to her knees in abject surrender. An armistice, humiliating in its terms, was signed by the Austrian representatives, and the back door to Germany was opened to the Allies. Germany's frantic plea for an armistice followed. There were those in the Allied countries who maintained that nothing short of unconditional surrender should be permitted. Cooler counsel prevailed, and an armistice was offered to the German high command through General Folk, the terms of which far exceeded in severity those granted to Turkey and Austria. These were read for the first time by Germany's representatives on Friday, November 8th. General Folk, when he gave the document to the German delegation, declared that Germany's decision must be made within 72 hours. Eleven o'clock on Monday, November 11th, was the time limit permitted to Germany. The armistice was signed by General Folk and the German representatives on the morning of November 11th, but the fighting did not actually cease until eleven o'clock, several hours after the terms had been agreed to. This was in accordance with the arrangements made between the signers. Sedan, where Marshals McMahon and Bazaini, commanding the armies of Napoleon III, surrendered to the King of Prussia in 1870, marked the last notable victory of the American forces in France. The Sedan of 1870 marked the birth of German militarism. The Sedan of 1918 marked its death. Preceding the advance of the Americans upon Sedan came a cloud of aviators in pursuit and bombing planes, headed by the famous aces of the American forces. The first and second divisions of the first army led the way. In the van of the second division were the Marines, whose heroism in Blau Wood marked the beginning of Germany's end. The famous Rainbow Division, made the most savage thrust of the action, pursuing the foe for ten miles and sweeping the Freya hills clear of machine nests and German artillery. The last action of the war for the Americans followed immediately on the heels of the Battle of Sedan. It was the taking of the town of Stine. The engagement was deliberately planned by the Americans as a sort of battle celebration of the end of the war. The order fixing eleven o'clock as the time for the conclusion of hostilities had been sent from end to end of the American lines. Its text follows. 1. You are informed that hostilities will cease along the whole front at 11 o'clock a.m., November 11, 1918, Paris time. 2. No Allied troops will pass the line reached by them at that hour in date until further orders. 3. Division commanders will immediately sketch the location of their line. This sketch will be returned to headquarters by the courier bearing these orders. 4. All communication with the enemy, both before and after the termination of hostilities, is absolutely forbidden. In case of violation of this order, severest disciplinary measures will be immediately taken. Any officer offending will be sent to headquarters under guard. 5. Every emphasis will be laid on the fact that the arrangement is an armistice only and not a peace. 6. There must not be the slightest relaxation of vigilance. 
Troops must be prepared at any moment for further operations. 7. Special steps will be taken by all commanders to ensure strictest discipline and that all troops be held in readiness fully prepared for any eventuality. 8. Division and brigade commanders will personally communicate these orders to all organizations. Signal Corps wires, telephones, and runners were used in carrying the orders, and so well did the big machine work that even patrol commanders had received the orders well in advance of the hour. Apparently the Germans also had been equally diligent in getting the orders to the front line. Notwithstanding the hard fighting they did Sunday to hold back the Americans, the Germans were able to bring the firing to an abrupt end at the scheduled hour. The staff and field officers of the American Army were disposed early in the day to approach the hour of eleven with lessened activity. The day began with less firing, and doubtless the fighting would have ended according to plan, had there not been a sharp resumption on the part of the German batteries. The Americans looked upon this as wantonly useless. It was then that orders were sent to the battery commanders for increased fire. Although there was no reason for it, German ruthlessness was still rampant Sunday, stirring the American artillery in the region of dun sur meuse and Mouze to greater activity. Six hundred aged men and women and children were in Mouze when the Germans attacked it with gas. There was only a small detachment of American troops there, and the town no longer was of strategical value. However, it was made the direct target of shells filled with phosgene. Every street reeked with gas. Poorly clad and showing plainly evidences of malnutrition, the inhabitants crowded about the Americans, kissing their hands and hailing them as deliverers. They declared they had had no meat for six weeks. They virtually had been prisoners of war for four years, and were overwhelmed with joy when they learned that an armistice was probable. The last French town to fall into American hands before the armistice went into effect was Denay. Patrols reported they had found it empty not more than a quarter of an hour before eleven o'clock. American troops rushed through the town, and in a few minutes Allied flags were beginning to appear from the windows. As the church bell solemnly told the hour of eleven, troops from the 90th Division were pouring into the town. The inhabitants told the usual stories of German treatment. They were forced to work at all sorts of tasks from seven in the morning until six at night. In return they received paper bills with which they were unable to purchase milk and similar necessities. The majority, however, were so overjoyed at their deliverance that they were almost incoherent in discussing the enemy occupation. The inhabitants of Stenay remained hiding in their cellars even after the Americans had entered the town. They came out hesitatingly and in small groups. Hostilities along the American front ended with a crash of cannon. The early forenoon had been marked by a falling off in fire all along the line, but an increasing bombardment from the retreating Germans at certain points stimulated the Americans to a quick retort. From their positions north of Stenay to southeast of the town, the Americans began to bombard fixed targets. The firing reached a volume at times almost equivalent to a barrage. Two minutes before eleven o'clock the firing dwindled, the last shell striking over no man's land precisely on time. There was little celebration on the front line, where American routine was scarcely disturbed over the cessation of fighting. In the areas behind the battle zone there were celebrations on all sides. Here and there there were little outbursts of cheering, but even those instances were not on the immediate front. Many of the French soldiers went about singing. Well, I don't know, drawled a lieutenant from Texas, while the artillery was sending its last challenge to the Germans. But somehow I can't help wondering if we have licked them enough. The Germans were manifestly so glad over the cessation of hostilities that they could not conceal their pleasure. Prisoners taken at Stenay grinned with satisfaction. Their demeanor was in sharp contrast to that of the American doughboys, who took the matter philosophically and went about their appointed tasks. In the front line it was the same. The Americans were happy, but quiet. They made no demonstrations. The Germans, on the other hand, were in a regular hysteria of joy. They waited only until nightfall to set off every rocket in their possession. In the evening the sky was ablaze with red, green, blue, and yellow flares all along the line. Flags appeared like magic over the shell-torn buildings of Verdun, French and American colors flying side by side. In every village, even those from which the Germans had been driven, there were flags and decorations which were brought up to the front by the soldiers. In the villages back of the line there were impromptu celebrations, and the civilians in holiday spirit saluted the Americans, shouting, The war is finished. Northeast of Verdun, just before eleven o'clock, American artillerymen, in loading a six-inch howitzer, wrote good luck on a ninety-pound shell and let her go. 
The shot was aimed at the crossroads at Orna, just ahead of the American lines. While the bells of the ancient Verdun Cathedral were ringing the news of peace, the fortress city was illuminated, and a military procession headed by the drum corps of the 26th American Division swung along the crowded streets, accompanied by a French detachment of buglers representing the famed defenders of Verdun. Only a half hour before the Germans had thrown large shells within the city walls, apparently as a reminder that Verdun was still within the range of their guns to the hills to the northeast. Monday afternoon and night virtually was the first time that Verdun had not been shelled in many hours, almost since the war began. End of chapter 52「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」「ピーマッシュ」Witnessing the rout of her army in Palestine by the great strategist, General Allenby, and a British army, asked for an armistice. The port signed without hesitation an agreement comprising twenty-five severe requirements. The surrender of Bulgaria and Turkey forced Austria's hand. The terms under which it was permitted to capitulate were even harder than those granted to Turkey. They comprised eighteen requirements divided into military and naval clauses. Germany, proud, imperial Germany, met the greatest humiliation of all the Teutonic allies when the Kaiser and the German high command were brought to their knees. Thirty-five clauses, the most severe and drastic ever demanded from a great power, were included in the armistice agreement. Only the imminent menace of an invasion of Germany would have sufficed to compel the German representatives to sign such document. Following are the drafts of the Turkish, Austrian, and German armistice agreements. Turkish Agreement 1. The opening of the Dardanelles and the Bosporus and access to the Black Sea, Allied occupation of the Dardanelles and Bosporus forts. 2. The positions of all minefields, torpedo tubes, and other obstructions in Turkish waters are to be indicated, and assistance given to sweep or remove them as may be required. 3. All available information concerning mines in the Black Sea is to be communicated. 4. All Allied prisoners of war and Armenian interned persons and prisoners are to be collected in Constantinople and handed over unconditionally to the Allies. 5. Immediate demobilization of the Turkish army, except such troops as are required for surveillance on the frontiers and for the maintenance of internal order, the number of effectives and their disposition to be determined later by the Allies. 6. The surrender of all war vessels in Turkish waters or waters occupied by Turkey. These ships will be interned in such Turkish port or ports as may be directed, except such small vessels as are required for police and similar purposes in Turkish territorial waters. 7. The Allies have the right to occupy any strategic points in the event of any situation arising which threatens the security of the Allies. 8. Use by Allied ships of all ports and anchorages now in Turkish occupation and denial of their use by the enemy. Similar conditions are to apply to Turkish mercantile shipping in Turkish waters for the purposes of trade and the demobilization of the army. 9. Allied occupation of the Taurus tunnel system. 10. Immediate withdrawal of Turkish troops from northern Persia to behind the pre-war frontier already has been ordered and will be carried out. 11. A part of Transcaucasia already has been ordered to be evacuated by Turkish troops the remainder to be evacuated, if required by the Allies, after they have studied the situation. 12. Wireless, telegraph, and cable stations to be controlled by the Allies. Turkish government messages to be accepted. 13. Prohibition against the destruction of any naval, military, or commercial material. 14. Facilities are to be given for the purchase of coal, oil, fuel, and naval material from Turkish sources after the requirements of the country have been met. None of the above materials are to be exported. 15. The surrender of all Turkish offices in Tripolitania and Cyrenaica to the nearest Italian garrison. Turkey agrees to stop supplies and communication with these officers if they do not obey the order to surrender. 16. The surrender of all garrisons in Hediaz, Asir, Yemen, Syria, and Mesopotamia 
to the nearest Allied commander, and withdrawal of Turkish troops from Silesia, except those necessary to maintain order, as will be determined under Clause 6. 17. The use of all ships and repair facilities at all Turkish ports and arsenals. 18. The surrender of all ports occupied in Tripolitania and Cyrenaica, including Miserata, to the nearest Allied garrison. 19. All Germans and Austrians, naval, military, or civilian, to be evacuated within one month from Turkish dominions, and those in remote districts as soon after that time as may be possible. 20. Compliance with such orders as may be conveyed for the disposal of equipment, arms, and ammunition, including the transport of that portion of the Turkish army which is demobilized under Clause 5. 21. An Allied representative to be attached to the Turkish Ministry of Supplies in order to safeguard Allied interests, this representative to be furnished with all aid necessary for this purpose. 22. Turkish prisoners are to be kept at the disposal of the Allied powers. The release of Turkish civilian prisoners and prisoners over military age is to be considered. 23. An obligation on the part of Turkey to cease all relations with the Central Powers. 24. In case of disorder in the six Armenian valiettes, the Allies reserve to themselves the right to occupy any part of them. 25. Hostilities between the Allies and Turkey shall cease from noon local time Thursday the 31st of October 1918. The Austrian Agreement. Military Clauses. 1. The immediate cessation of hostilities by land, sea, and air. 2. Total demobilization of the Austro-Hungarian Army and immediate withdrawal of all Austro-Hungarian forces operating on the front from the North Sea to Switzerland. Within Austro-Hungarian territory, limited as in Clause 3 below, there shall only be maintained as an organized military force reduced to pre-war effectiveness. Half the divisional, corps, and army artillery and equipment shall be collected at points to be indicated by the Allies and the United States of America for delivery to them, beginning with all such material as exists in the territories to be evacuated by the Austro-Hungarian forces. 3. Evacuation of all territories invaded by Austro-Hungary since the beginning of the war. Withdrawal within such periods as shall be determined by the commander-in-chief of the Allied forces on each front of the Austro-Hungarian armies behind a line fixed as follows. From Pic Umbrail to the north of the Stilivo, it will follow the crest of the Rhaetian Alps up to the sources of the Adige and the Isaia, passing thence by Mounts Reschen and Brenner and the heights of Utz and Zoller. The line thence turns south, crossing Mount Toblach and meeting the present frontier Karnak Alps. It follows this frontier up to Mount Tarvis, and after Mount Tarvis, the watershed of the Julian Alps, by the Col of Predil, Mount Mangrat, the Terglu, and the watershed of the Cols di Podberdo, Podlaniscam, and Idira. From this point the line turns southeast toward Schneeberg, excludes the whole basin of the Save and its tributaries. From Schneeberg it goes down towards the coast in such a way as to include Kostua, Matuglia, and Voloska in the evacuated territories. It will also follow the administrative limits of the present province of Dalmatia, including the north Lyserica and Trevania, and, to the south, territory limited by a line from the Semigrand of Cape Palanca to the summits of the watersheds eastwards, so as to include in the evacuated area all the valleys and watercourse flowing towards Serbaneco, such as the Kikola, Kerka, Bustanica, and their tributaries. It will also include all the islands in the north and west of Dalmatio, from Permuda, Selvi, Ulbo, Sterda, Meon, Paga, and Punta Dura, in the north up to Melida in the south, embracing Sant'Andrea, Busi, Lisa, Lesina, Tercola, Curzola, Casa, Lagosta, as well as the neighboring rocks and islets and passages, only excepting the islands of Great and Small Zerona, Bua, Solta, and Braza. All territory thus evacuated shall be occupied by the forces of the Allies and of the United States of America. All military and railway equipment of all kinds, including coal belonging or within those territories, to be left in situ, surrendered to the Allies, according to special orders given by the Commander-in-Chief of the Forces of the Associated Powers on the different fronts. 
no new destruction pillage or requisition to be done by enemy troops in the territories to be evacuated by them occupied by the forces of the associated powers four the allies shall have the right of free movement over all road and rail and waterways in austro-hungarian territory and the use of the necessary austrian and hungarian means of transportation the armies of the associated powers shall occupy such strategic points in austria-hungary at times as they may deem necessary to enable them to conduct military operations or to maintain order they shall have the right of requisition on payment for the troops of the associated powers whatever they may be five complete evacuation of all german troops within fifteen days not only from the italian and balkan fronts but from all austro-hungarian territory internment of all german troops which have not left austro-hungary within that date six the administration of the evacuated territories of austria-hungary will be entrusted to the local authorities under the control of the allied and associated armies of occupation seven the immediate repatriation without reciprocity of all allied prisoners of war and internal subjects and of civil populations evacuated from their homes on conditions to be laid down by the commander-in-chief of the forces of the associated powers on the various fronts sick and wounded who cannot be removed from evacuated territory will be cared for by austria-hungary personnel who will be left on the spot with the medical material required naval clauses one immediate cessation of all hostilities at sea and definite information to be given as to the location and movements of all austro-hungarian ships notification to be made to neutrals that freedom of navigation in all territorial waters is given to the naval and mercantile marine of the allied and associated powers all questions of neutrality being waived two surrender to allies and the united states of fifteen austro-hungarian submarines completed between the years nineteen ten and nineteen eighteen and of all german submarines which are in or may hereafter enter austro-hungarian territorial waters all other austro-hungarian submarines to be paid off and completely disarmed and to remain under the supervision of the allies and united states three surrender to allies and united states with their complete armament and equipment of three battleships three light cruisers nine destroyers twelve torpedo boats one mine layer six danube monitors to be designated by the allies and the united states of america all other surface warships including river craft are to be concentrated in austro-hungarian naval bases to be designated by the allies and united states of america and are to be paid off and completely disarmed and placed under the supervision of allies and united states of america four freedom of navigation to all warships and merchant ships of allied and associated powers to be given in the adriatic and up the river danube and its tributaries in the territorial waters and territory of austria-hungary the allies and associated powers shall have the right to sweep up all mine fields and obstructions and the positions of these are to be indicated in order to ensure the freedom of navigation on the danube the allies and the united states of america shall be empowered to occupy or dismantle all fortifications or defense work five the existing blockade conditions set up by the allied and associated powers are to remain unchanged and all austro-hungarian merchant ships found at sea are to remain liable to capture save exceptions as may be made by a commission nominated by the allies and the united states of america six all naval aircraft are to be concentrated and impactionized in austro-hungarian bases to be designated by the allies and the united states of america seven evacuation of all the italian coasts and of all ports occupied by austria-hungary outside their national territory and the abandonment of all floating craft naval materials equipment and materials for inland navigation of all kinds eight occupation by the allies and the united states of america of the land and sea fortifications and the islands which form the defenses and the dockyards and arsenal at pola nine all merchant vessels held by austria-hungary belonging to the allies and associated powers to be returned ten no destruction of ships or materials to be permitted before evacuation surrender or restoration eleven all naval and mercantile marine prisoners of the allied and associated powers in austro-hungarian hands to be returned without reciprocity the german agreement one cessation of operations by land and air six hours after the signature of the armistice two immediate evacuation of invaded countries belgium france alsace lorraine luxembourg 
so ordered as to be completed within fourteen days from the signature of the armistice german troops which have not left the above-mentioned territories within the period fixed will become prisoners of war occupation by the allied and united states forces jointly will keep pace with evacuation in these areas all movements of evacuation and occupation will be regulated in accordance with the note annexed to the stated terms three repatriation beginning at once and to be completed within fifteen days of all inhabitants of the countries above mentioned including hostages and persons under trial or convicted four surrender in good condition by the german armies of the following equipment five thousand guns two thousand five hundred heavy two thousand five hundred field twenty five thousand machine guns three thousand minenwerfers seventeen hundred airplanes the above to be delivered in situ to the allies and the united states troops in accordance with the detailed conditions laid down in the annexed note five evacuation by the german armies of the countries on the left bank of the rhine these countries on the left bank of the rhine shall be administered by the local troops of occupation under the control of the allies and united states armies of occupation the occupation of these territories will be carried out by allied and united states garrisons holding the principal crossings of the rhine mayence colbens cologne together with bridgeheads at these points in thirty kilometer radius on the right bank and by garrisons similarly holding the strategic points of the regions a neutral zone shall be reserved on the right of the rhine between the stream and a line drawn parallel to it forty kilometers twenty six miles to the east from the frontier of holland to the parallel of gernsheim and as far as practicable a distance of thirty kilometers twenty miles from the east of stream from this parallel upon the swiss frontier evacuation by the enemy of the rhine lands shall be so ordered as to be completed within a further period of sixteen days in all thirty-one days after the signature of the armistice all movements of evacuation and occupation will be regulated according to the note annexed six in all territory evacuated by the enemy there shall be no evacuation of inhabitants no damage or harm shall be done to the persons or property of the inhabitants no destruction of any kind to be committed military establishments of all kinds shall be delivered as well as military stores of food munitions equipment not removed during the periods fixed for evacuation stores of food of all kinds for the civil population cattle etc shall be left in situ industrial establishments shall not be impaired in any way and their personnel shall not be moved roads and means of communication of every kind railroad waterways main roads bridges telegraphs telephones shall be in no manner impaired no person shall be prosecuted for offenses of participation in war measures prior to the signing of the armistice seven all civil and military personnel at present employed on them shall remain five thousand locomotives one hundred fifty thousand wagons and five thousand motor lorries in good working order with all necessary spare parts and fittings shall be delivered to the associated powers within the period fixed for the evacuation of belgium and luxembourg the railways of alsace lorraine shall be handed over within thirty-six days together with all pre-war personnel and material further material necessary for the working of railways in the country on the left bank of the rhine shall be left in situ all stores of coal and material for the upkeep of permanent ways signals and repair shops left entire in situ and kept in an efficient state by germany during the whole period of armistice all barges taken from the allies shall be restored to them all civil and military personnel at present employed on such means of communication and transporting including waterways shall remain eight the german command shall be responsible for revealing within forty-eight hours all mines or delay acting fuses disposed on territory evacuated by the german troops and shall assist in their discovery and destruction the german command shall also reveal all destructive measures that may have been taken such as poisoning or polluting of springs wells etc under penalty of reprisals nine the right of requisition shall be exercised by the allies and the united states armies in all occupied territory subject to regulation of accounts with those whom it may concern the upkeep of the troops of occupation in the rhineland excluding alsace lorraine shall be charged to the german government ten an immediate reparation without reciprocity according to detailed conditions which shall be fixed of all allied and united states prisoners of war the allied powers and the united states shall be able to dispose of these prisoners as they wish this condition annuls the previous conventions on the subject of the exchange of prisoners of war including the one of july nineteen eighteen in course of ratification 
However, the repatriation of German prisoners of war interned in Holland and in Switzerland shall continue as before. The repatriation of German prisoners of war shall be regulated at the conclusion of the preliminaries of peace. 11. Sick and wounded, who cannot be removed from evacuated territory, will be cared for by German personnel who will be left on the spot with the medical material required. 12. All German troops at present in any territory which before the war belonged to Romania, Turkey, or Austria-Hungary shall immediately withdraw within the frontiers of Germany as they existed on August 1, 1914. German troops now in Russian territory shall withdraw within the frontiers of Germany as soon as the Allies, taking into account the internal situation of those territories, shall decide that the time for this has come. 13. Evacuation by German troops to begin at once, and all German instructors, prisoners, and civilian, as well as military agents, now on the territory of Russia, as defined before 1914, to be recalled. 14. German troops to cease at once all requisitions and seizures and any other undertakings with a view to obtaining supplies intended for Germany in Romania and Russia, as defined on August 1, 1914. 15. Renunciation of the Treaties of Bucharest and Brest-Litovsk and of the Supplementary Treaties. 16. The Allies shall have free access to the territories evacuated by the Germans on their eastern frontier either through Danzig or by the Vistula in order to convey supplies to the populations of those territories and for the purpose of maintaining order. 17. Evacuation by all German forces operating in East Africa within a period to be fixed by the Allies. 18. Repatriation, without reciprocity, within maximum period of one month, in accordance with detailed conditions, hereafter to be fixed, of all civilians interned or deported, who may be citizens of other allied or associated states, than those mentioned in Clause 3, paragraph 19. 19. The following financial conditions are required. Reparation for damage done. While such armistice lasts, no public security shall be removed by the enemy which can serve as a pledge to the Allies for the recovery or repatriation of the cash deposit in the National Bank of Belgium, and in general immediate return of all documents, specie, stocks, shares, paper money, together with plant for the issue thereof, touching public or private interests in the invaded countries, restitution of the Russian and Romanian gold yielded to Germany or taken by that power this goal to be delivered in trust to the Allies until the signature of peace. 20. Immediate cessation of all hostilities at sea and definite information to be given as to the location and movements of all German ships. Notification to be given to neutrals that freedom of navigation in all territorial waters is given to the naval and merchant marines of the Allies and associated powers, all questions of neutrality being waived. 21. All naval and mercantile marine prisoners of war of the Allied and Associated Powers in German hands to be returned without reciprocity. 21. Surrender to the Allies and the United States of America of all German submarines now existing, including all submarine cruisers and mine-laying submarines, with their complete armament and equipment, in ports which will be specified by the Allies and the United States of America. Those which cannot take the sea shall be disarmed of the material and personnel and shall remain under the supervision of the Allies and the United States. All the conditions of the article shall be carried into effect within 14 days. Submarines ready for sea shall be prepared to leave German ports immediately upon orders by wireless, and the remainder at the earliest possible moment. The following German surface warships, which shall be designated by the Allies and the United States of America, shall forthwith be disarmed and thereafter interred in neutral ports, to be designated by the Allies and the United States of America, and placed under the surveillance of the Allies and the United States of America, only caretakers being left on board, namely, six battle cruisers, ten battleships, eight light cruisers, including two mine layers, fifty destroyers of the most modern type. All other surface warships, including river craft, are to be concentrated in naval bases to be designated by the Allies and the United States of America and are to be paid off and completely disarmed and placed under the supervision of the Allies and the United States of America. All vessels of the auxiliary fleet, trawlers, motor vessels, etc., are to be disarmed. Vessels designated for internment shall be ready to leave German ports within seven days upon directions by wireless, and the military armament of all vessels of the auxiliary fleet shall be put on shore. 24. 
the allies and the united states of america shall have the right to sweep all minefields and obstructions laid by germany outside german territorial waters and the positions of these are to be indicated twenty five freedom of access to and from the baltic to be given to the naval and mercantile marine of the allied and associated powers to secure this allies and the united states of america shall be empowered to occupy all german forts fortifications batteries and defense works of all kinds in all the entrances from the Kattegat into the Baltic, and to sweep up all mines and obstructions within and without German territorial waters, without any question of neutrality being raised, and the positions of all such mines and obstructions are to be indicated. 26. The existing blockade conditions set up by the Allies and Associated Powers are to remain unchanged, and all German merchant ships found at sea are to remain liable to capture the allies and the united states shall give consideration to the provisioning of germany during the armistice to the extent recognized as necessary twenty seven all naval aircraft are to be concentrated and immobilized in german bases to be specified by the allies and the united states twenty eight in evacuating the belgian coasts and ports germany shall abandon all merchant ships tugs lighters cranes and all other harbor materials all materials for inland navigation all aircraft and all materials and stores, all arms and armaments, and all stores and apparatus of all kinds. 29. All Black Sea ports are to be evacuated by Germany. All Russian war vessels of all descriptions, seized by Germany in the Black Sea, are to be handed over to the Allies and the United States of America. All neutral merchant vessels seized are to be released. All warlike and other materials of all kinds seized in those parts are to be returned, and German materials, as specified in Clause 28, are to be abandoned. 30. All merchant vessels in German hands belonging to the Allied and Associated Powers are to be restored in ports to be specified by the Allies and the United States of America without reciprocity. 31. No destruction of ships or materials to be permitted before evacuation, surrender, or restoration. 32. The German government will notify neutral governments of the world, and particularly the governments of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Holland, that all restrictions placed upon the trading of their vessels with the Allied and associated countries, whether by the German government or by private German interests, and whether in return for specific concessions, such as the export of shipbuilding materials or not, are immediately cancelled. 33. No transfers of German merchant shipping of any description to any neutral flag are to take place after signature of the armistice. 34. The duration of the armistice is to be 30 days, with option to extend. During this period, on failure of execution of any of the above clauses, the armistice may be denounced by one of the contracting parties on 48 hours previous notice. It is understood that the execution of Articles 3 and 18 shall not warrant the denunciation of the armistice on the ground of insufficient execution within a period fixed, except in the case of bad faith in carrying them into execution. In order to assume the execution of this convention under the best conditions, the principle of a permanent international armistice commission is admitted. The commission shall act under the authority of the Allied military and naval commanders-in-chief. 35. This armistice to be accepted or refused by Germany within 72 hours of notification. End of chapter 53Chapter 54 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 54 Peace at Last. War came upon the world in August 1914 with a suddenness and an impact that dazed the world. When it seemed, in 1918, that mankind had habituated itself to war, and that the bloody struggle would continue until the actual exhaustion and extinction of the nations involved, peace suddenly appeared. The debacle of the Teutonic Alliance was both dramatic and unexpected, except to those who knew how desperate were the conditions in the nations that were battling for autocracy. Bulgaria was the first to crumble, then Turkey fell, and Austria-Hungary deserted Germany. The Kaiser and his military advisers, left alone, appealed to the Allies through President Wilson for an armistice during which peace terms might be negotiated. Prince Maximilian of Baden, a statesman whose liberal ideas were rumored rather than demonstrated, was chosen to open negotiations. President Wilson, acting in concert with the Allies, referred Prince Maximilian to Marshal Foch. 
While negotiations were pending, a cabled message was received on November 7th to the effect that the armistice had been signed and that all soldiers would cease fighting on two o'clock of that afternoon. It was a false report, but it spread with incredible speed throughout the country. Celebrations, which included virtually every American, made the country a gala place for twenty-four hours. The American people, with characteristic good nature, laughed at the hoax next day and settled down in patience to await the inevitable declaration of an armistice. The true report arrived about three o'clock Eastern time in the morning of November 11th. Shrieks of whistles, the booming of cannon, and the clangor of bells awoke millions of sleeping persons, many of whom trooped into the streets to mingle their rejoicings with those of their neighbors. For a day there was high carnival in town and country throughout the land. Then the nation settled down to face the imminent problems of Reconstruction. One of these had to do with the immediate reduction of governmental expenditures during the approaching year. President Wilson had appealed to the voters to elect a Democratic Congress as an evidence of approval for his administration. The reply was a Republican House of Representatives and a Republican Senate. The Congress that had been in continuous session since America entered the war ended its labors in mid-November. For length, bulk of appropriations for the war, and the number and importance of legislative measures passed, the session was unprecedented. Appropriations passed aggregated $36,298,000,000, making the total for this Congress more than $45 billion, of which $19,412,000,000 was appropriated at the first, an extra, session at which war was declared on Germany. Legislation passed included bills authorizing billions of liberty bonds, creation of the War Finance Corporation, government control of telegraphs, telephones, and cables, executive reorganization of government agencies, and extensions of the Espionage Act and the Army Draft Law by which men between 18 and 45 years of age were required to register. Prohibition and woman suffrage furnished sharp controversies during the session. The wartime dry measure was completed, but after the woman suffrage constitutional amendment resolution had been adopted, January 10th, by the House, it was defeated in the Senate by two votes. Every man, woman, and child in the belligerent nations owed almost seven times as much money when peace came as he did at the beginning of the war. Figures of the war's cost to the world compiled by the Federal Reserve Board were summarized in the statement that the approximate public debt per capita had increased from $60 before the war to almost $400 at the end of July 1918. To this was added the cost since July, which is at the highest rate of the entire period. The direct cost of the war was calculated by the board at somewhere between $170 billion and $180 billion, not taking into account the authorization of the debt or the cost of indemnities. Four-fifths of the huge burden fell upon the shoulders of the future, only Great Britain and America absorbing a considerable amount by taxation. The total debt of the seven principal belligerents before the war did not exceed $25 billion. The board contrasted these figures with the total value of the gold and silver extracted from the earth since the beginning of the world, which, it said, hardly exceeded $30 billion. The belligerent nations, therefore, owed about six times the amount of all the gold and silver produced in all time. Prices rose to three times the average of what they were at the beginning of the war. Great Britain's debt increased almost ten times over in the period of the war, or from three billion five hundred and eighty million to thirty two billion four hundred and fifty million dollars, down to june nineteen eighteen. These figures do not include the debts of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa. British colonies. France's debt was quadrupled by the beginning of 1918, increasing from six billion eight hundred and thirty three million dollars to twenty five billion four hundred and ten million dollars. Italy's debt rose from two billion nine hundred and twenty nine million dollars to six billion nine hundred and eighteen million dollars. Figures for Russia were brought up only to September 1917, but they showed that at that time she owed $26,287,000,000, compared with $5,234,000,000 at the beginning of the war. The public debt of the United States was calculated to January 1, 1918, in order to be in line with those of other countries, increasing by that date to over $8 billion from a pre-war figure of a billion and a quarter. Since that time, $11,500,000,000 have been subscribed to the Liberty Loans, 
thus increasing the national debt amount sixteenfold. The most extraordinary increase of all was that of Germany, rising from one billion two hundred and eight million dollars to twenty six billion three hundred and thirty two million dollars. Austria owed two billion seven hundred and thirty six million dollars at the beginning of the war, which was increased by June nineteen seventeen to eleven billion five hundred and seventy three million dollars. Hungary increased her debt from one billion three hundred and ninety two million dollars to five billion nine hundred and ten million dollars by December nineteen seventeen. The neutrals, Denmark, Spain, Holland, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland, together owed two billion eight hundred and seventy one million dollars when war began and increased their debts only to three billion seven hundred and ten million dollars. Existing war obligations of the United States at the close of nineteen eighteen matured as follows. First Liberty Loan, $2 billion, redeemable at the option of the Treasury after 1932, and payable not later than 1947. Second Liberty Loan, $3,808,000,000, billion, million, redeemable after 1927, payable in 1942. Third Liberty Loan, $4,176,000,000, billion, million, redeemable and payable without option in 1928. Fourth Liberty Loan, $6,989,047,000,000, billion, million, redeemable after 1933, payable in 1938. War savings, $879,300,000, up to November 1918, payable in 1923. With this program of maturity, the Treasury, by exercising its option, could call in the nation's war debt for redemption in installments every five years until 1947. Secretary of the Treasury, William Gibbs McAdoo, who was also Director General of Transportation, created a sensation when he resigned both offices in November 1918, the resignation to take effect January 1, 1919. Coming upon the eve of the peace conference in Paris and the announcement that President Wilson intended to head the American delegates to the conference, the resignation caused widespread surprise. The reasons given by Mr. McAdoo were ill health and a serious depreciation of his private fortune during his incumbency of governmental positions. Following the armistice, steps were immediately taken for the repatriation of a considerable portion of the American forces in France and the return to their homes of the men in American training camps. The Third Army of the United States, commanded by General Dickman, was ordered to the western shore of the Rhine, there to cooperate with the troops of the Allies until the conclusion of peace negotiations. The country was amazed on November 23rd when General March announced that the casualties of the American forces which had been anticipated as being less than 100,000, had in reality exceeded 236,000. Explanation for this lay in the fierce onrush of the American forces during the last month of the war. A forecast that many thousands of American boys would remain in France was given by André Tardieu, General Commissioner for the Franco-American Affairs, when addressing the Association of Foreign Correspondents in New York City after the armistice had been signed. M. Tardieu appealed for permission to retain American soldiers in France. He said, We want first an immediate assistance in the matter of labor. We hope that, during the preparation and carrying out of the transportation of your troops back to America, your technical units as well as other units with their equipment will be able to cooperate in that effort. We soon will have to carry out a colossal work of transportation in view of the supplying of the regions evacuated by the enemy, of the recovering of the railroads in northern and eastern France, and in Alsace-Lorraine. We will have to clean the reconquered ground of the ruins accumulated by the German hordes. Your army will help us in this work while our population will restore her cities and villages. Again, in reference, not to all purchases, as a large part of our needs will be supplied outside of the United States, but in reference to those purchases which will be made in America, we are in need of credit in dollars covering about 50% of our total purchases for reconstruction. The assistance of that financial help will bring to everyone in France, government and private enterprise, the courage and faith necessary to apply to peace reconstruction the energy and the spirit of enterprise she has so prominently shown during the war. We will exact from Germany the restitution of each part of the material taken away from us as can be recovered, but, besides that restitution, we must bear in mind that speed is a primary condition in the reconstruction of France, and that America, on account of her immense capacities for production, ought to give us the first help. We need ships, chartered ships as well as ships transferred to our flag. The speedy reconstruction of the country is strictly depending on the revival of our mercantile fleet. The colossal effort put up by the United States in the building of her fleet for war purposes will not be diverted from this sacred end, 
if it, in part, helps France to recover on the seas, for the revival of her forces in peace, the means of transportation which were lost to her on account of the war. In reference to these four items, labor, credit, raw materials, ships, I have explained in detail our needs to your administration, by whose welcome I have been deeply moved. What I told them, what I asked for, I am telling it to you again, because a policy of secrecy does not befit our day. We have lost two million and a half men. Some are dead, some maimed, some have returned sick and incapacitated from German prisons. Whether they be lost altogether, or whether their working capacity be permanently reduced, they will not participate in this reconstruction. The fifteenth part of our people is missing at the very time we need all our material and moral forces in order to build up our life again. The younger part, yea, the stronger part of our nation, the flower of France, has died away on the battlefields. Our country has been bereft of its most precious resources. Our war expenses, on the other side, 120 billion francs, are weighed heavily on our shoulders. To pay off this debt there are at hand only such limited resources as invasion has left us. The territories which have been under German occupation for four years were the wealthiest part of France. Their areas did not exceed six percent of the whole country. They paid, however, twenty-five percent of the sum total of our taxes. These territories, which have been, for the last three months, occupied again by us at the cost of our own blood and the blood of our allies, are now in a state of ruin even worse than we had anticipated. Of the cities and villages nothing remain but ruins. 350,000 homes have been destroyed. To build them up again, I am referring to the building proper, without the furnishings, 600 million days of work will be necessary, involving, together with building material, an outlay of 10 billion francs. As regards personal property of every description, either destroyed by battle or stolen by the Germans, there stands an additional loss of at least four billion francs. This valuation of lost personal property does not include, as definite figures are lacking as yet, the countless war contributions and fines by the enemy, amounting also to billions. I need hardly say that, in those wealthy lands, practically no agricultural resources are left. The losses in horses and in cattle, bovine and ovine species, hogs, goats, amount to 1,510,000 head, in agricultural equipment to 454,000 machines or carts, the two items worth together 6 billion francs. Now, as regards to industries, the disaster is even more complete. These districts occupied by the Germans and whose machinery has been methodically destroyed or taken away by the enemy were, industrially speaking, the very heart of France. They were the very backbone of our production, as shown in the following startling figures. In 1913, the wool output of our invaded regions amounted to 94% of the total. French production and corresponding figures were, for flax from the spinning mills, 90%, iron ore, 90%, pig iron, 83%, steel, 70%, sugar, 70%, cotton, 60%, coal, 55%, electric power, 45%. Of all that, plants, machinery, mines, nothing is left. Everything has been carried away or destroyed by the enemy. So complete is the destruction that, in the case of our great coal mines in the north, two years of work will be needed before a single ton of coal can be extracted, and ten years before the output is brought back to the figures of 1913. All that must be rebuilt, and to carry out that kind of reconstruction only, there will be a need of over two million tons of pig iron, nearly four million tons of steel, not to mention the replenishing of stocks and of raw materials, which must of necessity be supplied to the plants during the first year of resumed activity. If we take into account these different items, we reach, as regards industrial needs, a total of 25 billion francs. To resurrect these regions, to reconstruct these factories, raw materials are not now sufficient. We need means of transportation. Now the enemy has destroyed our railroad tracks, our railroad equipment, and our rolling stock, which in the first month of the war, in 1914, was reduced by 50,000 cars, has undergone the wear and tear of 50 months of war. Our merchant fleet, on the other hand, has lost more than a million tons through submarine warfare. Our shipyards during the last four years have not built any ships, for they have produced for us and for our allies cannon, ammunition, and tanks. Here, again, for this item alone of means of transportation, we must figure on an expense of 2,500,000,000 francs. 
This makes, if I sum up these different items, a need of raw materials which represent in cost, at the present rate of prices in France, not less than 50 billion francs. And this formidable figure, gentlemen, does not cover everything. I have not taken into account the loss represented for the future production of France by the transformation of so many factories, which for four years were exclusively devoted to war munitions. I have not taken into account foreign markets lost to us as a result of the destruction of one-fourth of our productive capital and the almost total collapse of our trade. I have not taken into account the economic weakening that we will suffer tomorrow owing to that loss, to which I referred a while ago, of 2,500,000 young and vigorous men. This was one of the great by-products of the war. Thousands of young Americans, vigorous evangels of democratic thought, remained in Europe to bring American ideals and American force into the affairs of the old world. Those who returned were formidable factors in reshaping the affairs of the nation. Grave injustices were done in some instances to young men who had volunteered in the early days of the war through patriotic motives, and who returned to find their places in industry taken by others. In the main, however, the process of absorption went forth steadily and without serious incident. One factor making for satisfactory adjustment was the insurance system put into effect by the United States government, affecting its war forces. Immediately following the armistice, the following announcement was made. Preparations by the government for reinsuring the lives of soldiers and sailors on their return have been hastened by the signing of the armistice. Although regulations have not yet been fully drafted, it is certain that each of the 4,250,000 men in the military or naval service now holding voluntary government insurance will be permitted within five years after peace is declared to convert it without further medical examination into ordinary life, 20 pay life, endowment maturing at the age of 62 or other prescribed forms of insurance. This insurance will be arranged by the government, not by private companies, and the cost is expected to be at least one-fourth less than similar forms offered by private agencies. The low cost will result from the fact that the government will pay all overhead administration expenses, which, for private companies, amount to about 17% of premium receipts, will save the usual solicitation fees and, in addition, bear the risk resulting from the wounding or weakening of men while in the service. Private companies would not write insurance on many wounded men, or their rates would be unusually high. The government will arrange to collect premiums monthly, if men wish to pay that way, or for longer periods in advance. This may be done through post offices. The minimum amount of insurance to be issued probably will be $1,000, and the maximum $10,000, with any amount between these sums in multiples of $500. There will be provision for payments in case of disability as well as death, according to the tentative plan. Thus will be created out of the government's emergency War Insurance Bureau, the greatest life insurance institution in the world for peacetimes. With more policyholders and greater aggregate risks than a half dozen of the world's biggest private companies combined. Out of the experience gained may eventually develop expansion of the government insurance to old age, industrial, and other forms of insurance, in the opinion of officials who have studied the subject. Regulations for reinsuring returning soldiers and sailors are to be framed by an advisory board to the military and naval section of the War Risk Bureau, consisting of Arthur Hunter, actuary of the New York Life Insurance Company, W. A. Frazier, Omaha, of the Woodmen of the World, and F. Robertson Jones of the Workmen's Compensation Publicity Bureau, New York. Plans are also under consideration for allowing beneficiaries of men who have died or been killed in the service to choose between taking monthly payments over a period of 20 years or to commute those payments into a lump sum. End of chapter 54. Chapter 55 of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 55. America's Position in War and Peace. By common consent of the Entente Allies, President Wilson was made the spokesman for the democracy of the world. As Lloyd George, Premier Clemenceau of France, Premier Orlando of Italy, and other Europeans recognized, his utterances most clearly and cogently expressed the principles for which civilization was battling against the Hun. More than that, these statesmen and the peoples they represented recognized that back of President Wilson 
were the high ideals of an America pledged to the redemption of a war-weary world. The war produced a sterility in literature. Out of the great mass that was written, however, two productions stood out in their nobility of thought and in their classic directness of expression. These were the address before Congress by President Wilson on the night of April 2, 1917, when, recognizing fully the dread responsibility of his action, he pronounced the words which led America into the World War, and the speech made by him on Monday, November 11, 1918, when addressing Congress he announced the end of the war. Other declarations of the President that will be treasured as long as democracy survives are those enunciating the fourteen points upon which America would make peace, and two later declarations as to America's purposes. His address of April 2nd was delivered before the most distinguished assemblage ever gathered within the hall of the House of Representatives. The Supreme Court of the United States, headed by the Chief Justice, every member of the embassies then resident in Washington, the entire membership of the House and Senate, and a host of the most distinguished men and women that could crowd themselves into the great hall, listened to what was virtually America's declaration of war. The air was still, and tragic suspense was upon every face as the President began his address. At first he was pale as the marble rostrum against which he leaned. As he read from small sheets, typewritten with his own hand, his voice grew firmer, and the flush of indignation and of resolution overspread his countenance. He said, Gentlemen of the Congress, I have called the Congress into extraordinary session because there are serious, very serious, choices of policy to be made, and made immediately, which it was neither right nor constitutionally permissible that I should assume the responsibility of making. On the 3rd of February last, I officially laid before you the extraordinary announcement of the Imperial German Government that on and after the first day of February, it was its purpose to put aside all restraints of law or humanity and use its submarines to sink every vessel that sought to approach either the ports of Great Britain and Ireland on the west coasts of Europe or any of the ports controlled by the enemies of Germany within the Mediterranean. That had seemed to be the object of the German submarine warfare earlier in the war, but since April of last year the Imperial Government had somewhat restrained the commanders of its undersea craft, in conformity with its promise then given to us that passenger boats should not be sunk, and that due warning would be given to all other vessels which its submarines might seek to destroy, when no resistance was offered or escape attempted, and care taken that their crews were given at least a fair chance to save their lives in their open boats. The precautions taken were meager and haphazard enough, as was proved in distressing instance after instance in the progress of the cruel and unmanly business, but a certain degree of restraint was observed. The new policy has swept every restriction aside. Vessels of every kind, whatever their flag, their character, their cargo, their destination, their errand, have been ruthlessly sent to the bottom without warning and without thought of help or mercy for those on board, the vessels of friendly neutrals along with those of belligerents, even hospital ships, and ships carrying relief to the sorely bereaved and stricken people of Belgium, though the latter were provided with safe conduct through the prescribed areas by the German government itself, and were distinguished by unmistakable marks of identity, have been sunk with the same reckless lack of compassion or of principle." I was for a little while unable to believe that such things would in fact be done by any government that had hitherto subscribed to the humane practices of civilized nations. International law had its origin in the attempt to set up some law which would be respected and observed upon the seas, where no nation had right of dominion, and where lay the free highways of the world. By painful stage after stage has that law been built up, with meager enough results, indeed after all was accomplished that could be accomplished, but always with a clear view, at least, of what the heart and conscience of mankind demanded. This minimum of right the German government has swept aside under the plea of retaliation and necessity, and because it had no weapons which it could use at sea except those which it is impossible to employ as it is employing them, 
without throwing to the winds all scruples of humanity or of respect for the understandings that were supposed to underlie the intercourse of the world. I am not now thinking of the loss of property involved, immense and serious as that is, but only of the wanton and wholesale destruction of the lives of non-combatants, men, women, and children, engaged in pursuits which have always, even in the darkest periods of modern history, been deemed innocent and legitimate. Property can be paid for. The lives of peaceful and innocent people cannot be. The present German submarine warfare against commerce is a warfare against mankind. It is a warfare against all nations. American ships have been sunk, American lives taken, in ways which it has stirred us very deeply to learn of, but the ships and the people of other neutral and friendly nations have been sunk and overwhelmed in the waters in the same way. There has been no discrimination. The challenge is to all mankind. Every nation must decide for itself how it will meet it. The choice we make for ourselves must be made with a moderation of counsel and a temperateness of judgment befitting our character and our motives as a nation. We must put excited feeling away. Our motive will not be revenge or the victorious assertion of the physical might of the nation, but only the vindication of right, of human right, of which we are only a single champion. When I addressed the Congress on the 26th of February last, I thought it would suffice to assert our neutral rights with arms, our rights to use the seas against unlawful interference, our right to keep our people safe against unlawful violence. But armed neutrality, it now appears, is impracticable. Because submarines are in effect outlaws when used as the German submarines have been used against merchant shipping. It is impossible to defend ships against their attacks as the law of nations has assumed that merchantmen would defend themselves against privateers or cruisers, visible craft giving chase upon the open sea. It is common prudence in such circumstances, grim necessity, indeed, to endeavor to destroy them before they have shown their own intention. They must be dealt with upon sight, if dealt with at all. The German government denies the right of neutrals to use arms at all within the areas of the sea which it has prescribed, even in the defense of rights which no modern publicist has ever before questioned their right to defend. The intimation is conveyed that the armed guards, which we have placed on our merchant ships, will be treated as beyond the pale of law, and subject to be dealt with as pirates would be. Armed neutrality is ineffectual enough at best. In such circumstances, and in the face of such pretensions, it is worse than ineffectual. It is likely only to produce what it was meant to prevent. It is practically certain to draw us into the war without either the rights or the effectiveness of belligerents. There is one choice we can not make. We are incapable of making. We will not choose the path of submission and suffer the most sacred rights of our nation and our people to be ignored or violated. The wrongs against which we now array ourselves are no common wrongs. They cut to the very roots of human life. With a profound sense of the solemn and even tragical character of the step I am taking and of the grave responsibilities which it involves, but in unhesitating obedience to what I deem my constitutional duty, I advise that the Congress declare the recent course of the Imperial German government to be, in fact, nothing less than war against the government and people of the United States, that it formally accept the status of belligerent which has thus been thrust upon it, and that it take immediate steps not only to put the country in a more thorough state of defense, but also to exert all its power and employ all its resources to bring the government of the German Empire to terms and end the war. What this will involve is clear. It will involve the utmost practical cooperation in counsel and action with the governments now at war with Germany, and as incident to that, the extension to those governments of the most liberal financial credits, in order that our resources may so far as possible be added to theirs. It will involve the organization and mobilization 
of all the material resources of the country to supply the materials of war and serve the incidental needs of the nation in the most abundant and yet most economical and efficient way possible. It will involve the immediate full equipment of the Navy in all respects, but particularly in supplying it with the best means of dealing with the enemy's submarines. It will involve the immediate addition to the armed forces of the United States already provided for by law in case of war at least 500,000 men, who should, in my opinion, be chosen upon the principle of universal liability to service, and also the authorization of subsequent additional increments of equal force so soon as they may be needed and can be handled in training. It will involve also, of course, the granting of adequate credits to the government sustained, I hope, so far as they can equitably be sustained by the present generation, by well-conceived taxation. I say sustained so far as may be equitable by taxation, because it seems to me that it would be most unwise to base the credits which will now be necessary entirely on money borrowed. It is our duty, I most respectfully urge, to protect our people so far as we may against the very serious hardships and evils which would be likely to arise out of the inflation which would be produced by vast loans. In carrying out the measures by which these things are to be accomplished, we should keep constantly in mind the wisdom of interfering as little as possible in our own preparation and in the equipment of our own military forces with the duty, for it will be a very practical duty, of supplying the nations already at war with Germany with the materials which they can obtain only from us or by our assistance. They are in the field, and we should help them in every way to be effective there. I shall take the liberty of suggesting, through the several executive departments of the government, for the consideration of your committees, measures for the accomplishment of the several objects I have mentioned. I hope that it will be your pleasure to deal with them as having been framed after very careful thought by the branch of the government upon which the responsibility of conducting the war and safeguarding the nation will most directly fall. While we do these things, these deeply momentous things, let us be very clear, and make very clear to all the world what our motives and our objects are. My own thought has not been driven from its habitual and normal course by the unhappy events of the last two months, and I do not believe that the thought of the nation has been altered or clouded by them. I have exactly the same things in mind now that I had in mind when I addressed the Senate on the 22nd of January last, the same that I had in mind when I addressed the Congress on the 3rd of February and on the 26th of February. Our object now, as then, is to vindicate the principles of peace and justice in the life of the world as against selfish and autocratic power and to set up amongst the really free and self-governing peoples of the world such a concert of purpose and of action as will henceforth ensure the observance of those principles. Neutrality is no longer feasible or desirable where the peace of the world is involved and the freedom of its peoples, and the menace to that peace and freedom lies in the existence of autocratic governments backed by organized force which is controlled wholly by their will, not by the will of the people. We have seen the last of neutrality in such circumstances. We are the beginning of an age in which it will be insisted that the same standards of conduct and of responsibility for wrong done shall be observed among nations and their governments that are observed among the individual citizens of civilized states. We have no quarrel with the German people. We have no feeling towards them but one of sympathy and friendship. It was not upon their impulse that their government acted in entering this war. It was not with their previous knowledge or approval. It was a war determined upon, as wars used to be determined upon in the old, unhappy days, when people were nowhere consulted by their rulers, and wars were provoked and waged in the interests of dynasties or of little groups of ambitious men who were accustomed to use their fellow men as pawns and tools. Self-governed nations do not fill their neighbor states with spies or set the course of intrigue to bring about some critical posture of affairs which will give them an opportunity to strike and make conquest. Such designs can be successfully worked out only under cover, 
and where no one has the right to ask questions. Cunningly contrived plans of deception or aggression, carried, as it may be, from generation to generation, can be worked out and kept from the light only within the privacy of courts or behind the carefully guarded confidences of a narrow and privileged class. They are happily impossible where public opinion commands and insists upon full information concerning all the nation's affairs. A steadfast concert for peace can never be maintained except by a partnership of democratic nations. No autocratic government could be trusted to keep faith within it or observe its covenants. It must be a league of honor, a partnership of opinion. Intrigue would eat its vitals away. The plottings of inner circles who could plan what they would and render account to no one would be a corruption seated at its very heart. Only free peoples can hold their purpose and their honor steady to a common end and prefer the interests of mankind to any narrow interest of their own. Does not every American feel that assurance has been added to our hope for the future peace of the world by the wonderful and heartening things that have been happening within the last few weeks in Russia? Russia was known by those who knew it best to have been always, in fact, democratic at heart, in all the vital habits of her thoughts, in all the intimate relationships of her people that spoke their natural instinct, their habitual attitude towards life. The autocracy that crowned the summit of her political structure, long as it had stood and terrible as was the reality of its power, was not in fact Russian in origin, character, or purpose. And now it has been shaken off, and the great, generous Russian people have been added in all their native majesty and might to the forces that are fighting for freedom in the world, for justice, and for peace. Here is a fit partner for a league of honor. One of the things that has served to convince us that the Prussian autocracy was not, and could never be, our friend, is that from the very outset of the present war it has filled our unsuspecting communities, and even our offices of government, with spies, and set criminal intrigues everywhere afoot against our national unity of counsel our peace within and without, our industries and our commerce. Indeed, it is now evident that its spies were here even before the war began, and it is unhappily not a matter of conjecture, but a fact proved in our courts of justice, that the intrigues which have more than once come perilously near to disturbing the peace and dislocating the industries of the country have been carried on at the instigation, with the support, and even under the personal direction of the official agents of the imperial government accredited to the government of the United States. Even in checking these things, and trying to extirpate them, we have sought to put the most generous interpretation possible upon them, because we know that their source lay not in any hostile feeling or purpose of the German people towards us, who were, no doubt, as ignorant of them as we ourselves were, but only in the selfish designs of a government that did what it pleased, and told its people nothing. But they have played their part in setting to convince us at last that that government entails no real friendship for us, and means to act against our peace and security at its convenience. That it means to stir up enemies against us at our very doors, the intercepted note to the German minister at Mexico, is eloquent evidence. We are accepting this challenge of hostile purpose because we know that in such a government, following such methods, we can never have a friend, and that in the presence of its organized power, always lying in wait to accomplish we know not what purpose, there can be no assured security for the democratic governments of the world. We are now about to accept gauge of battle with this natural foe to liberty, and shall, if necessary, spend the whole force of the nation to check and nullify its pretensions and its power. We are glad, now that we see the facts with no veil of false pretense about them, to fight thus for the ultimate peace of the world and for the liberation of its peoples, the German peoples included, for the rights of nations great and small, and the privilege of men everywhere to choose their way of life and of obedience. The world must be made safe for democracy. 
its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty we have no selfish ends to serve we desire no conquest no dominion we seek no indemnities for ourselves no material compensation for the sacrifices we shall freely make we are but one of the champions of the rights of mankind we shall be satisfied when those rights have been made as secure as the faith and the freedom of nations can make them just because we fight without rancor and without selfish object seeking nothing for ourselves but what we shall wish to share with all free peoples we shall i feel confident conduct our operations as belligerents without passion and ourselves observe with proud punctilio the principles of right and of fair play we profess to be fighting for i have said nothing of the governments allied with the imperial government of germany because they have not made war upon us or challenged us to defend our rights and our honor the austro-hungarian government has indeed avowed its unqualified endorsement and acceptance of the reckless and lawless submarine warfare adopted now without disguise by the imperial german government and it has therefore not been possible for this government to receive count tarnowski the ambassador recently accredited to this government by the imperial and royal government of austria-hungary but that government has not actually engaged in warfare against citizens of the united states on the seas and i take the liberty for the present at least of postponing a discussion of our relations with the authorities at vienna we enter this war only where we are clearly forced into it because there are no other means of defending our rights it will be all the easier for us to conduct ourselves as belligerents in a high spirit of right and fairness because we act without animus not in enmity towards a people or with the desire to bring any injury or disadvantage upon them but only in armed opposition to an irresponsible government which has thrown aside all considerations of humanity and of right and is running amok we are let me say again the sincerest friends of the german people and shall desire nothing so much as the early re-establishment of intimate relations of mutual advantage between us however hard it may be for them for the time being to believe that this is spoken from our hearts we have borne with their present government through all these bitter months because of that friendship exercising a patience and forbearance which would otherwise have been impossible we shall happily still have an opportunity to prove that friendship in our daily attitude and actions towards the millions of men and women of german birth and native simplicity who live amongst us and share our life and we shall be proud to prove it towards all who are in fact loyal to their neighbors and to the government in the hour of test they are most of them as true and loyal americans as if they had never known any other fealty or allegiance they will be prompt to stand with us in rebuking and restraining the few who may be of a different mind and purpose if there should be disloyalty it will be dealt with with a firm hand of stern repression but if it lifts its head at all it will lift it only here and there and without countenance except from a lawless and malignant few it is a distressing and oppressive duty gentlemen of the congress which i have performed in thus addressing you there are it may be many months of fiery trial and sacrifice ahead of us it is a fearful thing to lead this great peaceful people into war into the most terrible and disastrous of all wars civilization itself seeming to be in the balance but the right is more precious than peace and we shall fight for the things which we have always carried nearest our hearts for democracy for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own governments for the rights and liberties of small nations for a universal dominion of right by such a concert of free peoples as shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world itself at last free to such a task we can dedicate our lives and our fortunes everything that we are and everything that we have with the pride of those who know that the day has come when america is privileged to spend her blood and her might for the principles that gave her birth and happiness 
and the peace which she has treasured. God helping her, she can do no other. His address to Congress on November 11, 1918, while all the Allied nations were celebrating with exultant hearts the victory that had come to them, was no less dramatic than the speech that had marked the beginning of the war. He prefaced it by reading the drastic terms of the armistice granted to Germany. Continuing, he said, The war thus comes to an end, for, having accepted the terms of armistice, it will be impossible for the German command to renew it. It is not now possible to assess the consequences of this great consummation. We know only that this tragical war, whose consuming flames swept from one nation to another until all the world was on fire, is at an end, and that it was the privilege of our own people to enter it at its most crucial juncture in such fashion and in such force as to contribute, in a way of which we are all deeply proud, to the great result. We know, too, that the object of the war is attained, the object upon which all free men had set their hearts, and attained with a sweeping completeness, which even now we do not realize. Armed imperialism, such as the men conceived, who were but yesterday the masters of Germany, is at an end, its illicit ambitions engulfed in black disaster. Who will now seek to revive it? The arbitrary power of the military caste of Germany, which once could secretly, and of its own single choice, disturb the peace of the world, is discredited and destroyed. And more than that, much more than that, has been accomplished. The great nations which associated themselves to destroy it have now definitely united in the common purpose to set up such a peace as will satisfy the longing of the whole world for disinterested justice embodied in settlements which are based upon something much better and more lasting than the selfish, competitive interests of powerful states. There is no longer conjecture as to the objects the victors have in mind. They have a mind in the matter, not only, but a heart also. Their avowed and concerted purpose is to satisfy and protect the weak, as well as to accord their just rights to the strong. The humane temper and intention of the victorious governments have already been manifested in a very practical way. Their representatives in the Supreme War Council at Versailles have by unanimous resolution assured the peoples of the Central Empire that everything that is possible in the circumstances will be done to supply them with food and relieve the distressing want that is in so many places threatening their very lives. And steps are to be taken immediately to organize these efforts at relief in the same systematic manner that they were organized in the case of Belgium. By use of the idle tonnage of the central empires, it ought presently to be possible to lift the fear of utter misery from their oppressed populations, and set their minds and energies free for the great and hazardous task of political reconstruction which now faced them on every hand. Hunger does not breed reform. It breeds madness and all the ugly distempers that make an ordered life impossible. For with the fall of the ancient governments, which rested like an incubus on the peoples of the central empires, has come political change not merely, but revolution, and revolution which seems as yet to assume no final and ordered form, but to run from one fluid change to another, until thoughtful men are forced to ask themselves, with what governments, and of what sort are we about to deal in the making of the covenants of peace? With what authority will they meet us, and with what assurance that their authority will abide and sustain securely the international arrangements into which we are about to enter? There is here matter for no small anxiety and misgiving. When peace is made, upon whose promises and engagements besides our own is that to rest? Let us be perfectly frank with ourselves and admit that these questions cannot be satisfactorily answered now or at once. But the moral is not that there is little hope of an early answer that will suffice. It is only that we must be patient and helpful and mindful, above all, of the great hope and confidence that lie at the heart of what is taking place. Excesses accomplish nothing. 
unhappy Russia has furnished abundant recent proof of that. Disorder immediately defeats itself. If excesses should occur, if disorder should for a time raise its head, a sober second thought will follow, and a day of constructive action, if we help and do not hinder. The present, and all that it holds, belongs to the nations and the peoples, who preserve their self-control, and the orderly processes of their governments, the future to those who prove themselves the true friends of mankind. To conquer with arms is to make only a temporary conquest. To conquer the world by earning its esteem is to make permanent conquest. I am confident that the nations that have learned the discipline of freedom and that have settled with self-possession to its ordered practice are now about to make conquest of the world by the sheer power of example and of friendly helpfulness. The peoples who have but just come out from under the yoke of arbitrary government, and who are now coming at last into their freedom, will never find the treasures of liberty they are in search of if they look for them by the light of the torch. They will find that every pathway that is stained with the blood of their own brothers leads to the wilderness, not to the seat of their hope. They are now face to face with their initial test. We must hold the light steady until they find themselves, and in the meantime, if it be possible, we must establish a peace that will justly define their place among the nations, remove all fear of their neighbors and of their former masters, and enable them to live in security and contentment when they have set their own affairs in order. I, for one, do not doubt their purpose or capacity. There are some happy signs that they know and will choose the way of self-control and peaceful accommodation. If they do, we shall put our aid at their disposal in every way that we can. If they do not, we must await with patience and sympathy the awakening and recovery that will assuredly come at last. 14 Principles of Peace On Tuesday, January 18, 1918, President Wilson placed the peace terms of the United States government before both houses of Congress in joint session. The 14 principles were 1. Open covenants of peace, openly arrived at, after which there shall be no private international understanding of any kind, but diplomacy shall proceed always frankly and in the public view. 2. Absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas, outside territorial waters, alike in peace and war, except as the seas may be closed in whole or in part by international action for the enforcement of international covenants. 3. The removal, so far as possible, of all economic barriers and the establishment of an equality of trade conditions among all the nations consenting to the peace and associating themselves for its maintenance. 4. Adequate guarantees given and taken that national armaments will be reduced to the lowest point consistent with domestic safety. 5. A free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims based upon a strict observance of the principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty, the interests of the populations concerned must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the governments whose title is to be determined. 6. The evacuation of all Russian territory and such a settlement of all questions affecting Russia as will secure the best and freest cooperation of the other nations of the world in obtaining for her an unhampered and unembarrassed opportunity for the independent determination of her own political development and national policy, and assure her of a sincere welcome into the society of free nations under institutions of her own choosing, and, more than a welcome, assistance also of every kind that she may need and may herself desire. The treatment accorded Russia by her sister nations in the months to come will be the acid test of their good will, of their comprehension of her needs, as distinguished from their own interests, and of their intelligent and unselfish sympathy. 7. Belgium, the whole world will agree, must be evacuated and restored, without any attempt to limit the sovereignty which she enjoys in common with all other free nations. No other single act will serve as this will serve to restore confidence among the nations in the laws which they have themselves set and determined for the government 
of their relations with one another. Without this healing act, the whole structure and validity of international law is forever impaired. 8. All French territory should be freed and the invaded portions restored, and the wrong done to France by Prussia in 1871 in the matter of Alsace-Lorraine, which has unsettled the peace of the world for nearly fifty years, should be righted, in order that peace may once more be made secure in the interests of all. 9. A readjustment of the frontiers of Italy should be effected along clearly recognized lines of nationality. 10. The peoples of Austria-Hungary, whose place among the nations we wish to see safeguarded and restored, should be accorded the freest opportunity of autonomous development. 11. Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro should be evacuated, occupied territories restored, Serbia accorded free and secure access to the sea, and the relations of the several Balkan states to one another determined by friendly counsel along historically established lines of allegiance and nationality, and international guarantees of the political and economic independence and territorial integrity of the several Balkan states should be entered into. 12. The Turkish portion of the present Ottoman Empire should be assured a secure sovereignty, but the other nationalities which are now under Turkish rule should be assured an undoubted security of life and an absolutely unmolested opportunity of autonomous development, and the Dardanelles should be permanently opened as a free passage to the ships and commerce of all nations under international guarantees. 13. An independent Polish state should be erected which should include the territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations, which should be assured a free and secure access to the sea, and whose political and economic independence and territorial integrity should be guaranteed by international covenants. 14. General association of nations must be formed under specific covenants for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. President Wilson, in his address to Congress on February 11, 1918, presented these four principles which are to be applied in arranging world peace. 1. That each part of the final settlement must be based upon the essential justice of that particular case and upon such adjustments as are most likely to bring a peace that will be permanent. 2. That peoples and provinces are not to be bartered about from sovereignty to sovereignty, as if they were mere chattels and pawns in a game, even the great game now forever discredited, of the balance of power, but that, three, every territorial settlement must be made in the interest and for the benefit of the populations concerned, and not as part of any mere adjustment or compromise of claims amongst rival states, and, four, that all well-defined national aspirations shall be accorded the utmost satisfaction that can be accorded them without introducing new or perpetrating old elements of discord and antagonism that would be likely in time to break the peace of Europe and consequently of the world. President Wilson, in his Liberty Loan Address in New York on September 27th, thus stated the government's interpretation of its duty with regard to peace. 1. The impartial justice meted out must involve no discrimination between those to whom we wish to be just and those to whom we do not wish to be just. It must be a justice that plays no favorites and knows no standard but the equal rights of the several peoples concerned. 2. No special or separate interest of any single nation or any group of nations can be made the basis of any part of the settlement which is not consistent with the common interests of all. 3. There can be no leagues or alliances or special conventions and understandings within the general and common family of the League of Nations. 4. And more specifically, there can be no special, selfish economic combinations within the League and no employment of any form of economic boycott or exclusion except as the power of economic penalty by exclusion from the markets of the world may be vested in the League of Nations itself as a means of discipline and control. 5. All international agreements and treaties of every kind must be made known in their entirety to the rest of the world. End of chapter 55
Chapter fifty six of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter fifty six The War by Years. Germany's military strength developed during forty years of preparation, and the offensive plans of the German high command developed in connection with an extraordinary spy service in France, Belgium, Russia, England, and the United States culminated in a simultaneous campaign on land and by sea affecting these five nations. August 1, 1914 to August 1, 1915 Belgium and northern France were overrun by a German invading force under General von Kluck. The heroic effort of the French army under General Joffre and a supreme strategic thrust at the German center by General Foch turned back the German tide at the Battle of the Marne. The scientific diabolism of the German high command was revealed when poison gas was projected against the Canadians at Ypres, torturing, blinding, and killing thousands. German terrorism on the high seas culminated in the sinking of the Cunard liner Lusitania by a German submarine off the Irish coast. Men, women, and children to the number of 1,152 lost their lives. Of these, 102 were Americans. German colonies in South Africa were invaded by British South African troops under General Luis Botta, who during the Boer War commanded a division against the British. The German holdings at Tsing Tao and in the Marshall Islands were seized by Japan. German cruisers that had raided seagoing commerce were destroyed. The most noted of these was the Emden, which was defeated and destroyed by the Australian cruiser Sydney off the Cocos Islands. German sea power was further humiliated in a running fight off Helgoland, in which the battle cruiser Blücher was sunk, and in a battle off the Falkland Islands, in which three German cruisers were destroyed. Italy entered the war on May 23, 1915, and invaded Austria on a 60-mile front. Russian forces, after early successes, were defeated at Tannenberg by von Hindenburg, the outstanding military genius on the German side. The development of aircraft as an aid to artillery and as a destructive force on its own account was rapid, and the use of machine guns and hand grenades in trench operations became general. August 1, 1915 to August 1, 1916 The tragic sea and land operations at the Dardanelles and Gallipoli marked this year with red in British history. Sir Douglas Haig succeeded Sir John French as commander-in-chief of British forces in France. The outstanding operation of the British forces on the Western Front was the Bloody Battle of the Somme, beginning July 1st and continuing until the fall of 1915. The losses on both sides in that titanic struggle staggered two continents. Especially heroic were the attacks of the Canadians in that great battle, and especially heavy were the losses in killed and wounded of the Canadian regiments. They ranked in magnitude with the depletion that came to the Australian and New Zealand armies in the fatal Gallipoli campaign. This year will be glorious forever in the annals of France because of the heroic defense at Verdun. That battle tested to the limit the offensive strength of the German machine, and it was found lacking in power to pierce the superhuman defense of the heroic French forces under Pétain and Neville. Bulgaria entered the war on October 14, 1915, with a declaration of war against helpless Serbia. Greece, torn by internal dissensions, inclined first to one side, then to the other. The occupation of Saloniki by French and British expeditionary forces finally swung the archipelago to the Allies. A British Mesopotamian force under General Townsend, poorly equipped and unsupported, was cut off in Kut el Mara and surrendered to the Turks on April 29, 1916. The Italian forces, under General Cadorna, made a sensational advance terminating in the capture of Gorizia. Portugal entered the war on the side of the Allies after it had refused to give up to Germany several German ships interned in Portuguese ports. An object lesson in German submarine possibilities was given America when the Deutschland, a super submarine cargo vessel, arrived in Baltimore, Maryland, on July 9, 1916. The Deutschland later was converted into a naval submarine and revisited American shores, sinking a number of merchant vessels. 
It was one of the German submarine fleet that surrendered to the Allies in November 1918. Russia proved itself to be a military ineffective. German armies under von Mackensen and von Hindenburg occupied Warsaw, Brest, Litovsk, Lusk, and Grodno. Grand Duke Nicholas was removed from the command of the Russian armies, and Tsar Nicholas assumed command. Germany's pretensions to sea power ended with the Battle of Jutland, May 31, 1916, when its high seas fleet fled after a running fight with British cruisers and destroyers. Never thereafter, during the war, did the German ships venture out of the Bight of Helgoland. August 1, 1916 to August 1, 1917 This year was marked by two dramatic episodes. The first of these was the sudden entrance and the equally sudden exit of Romania as a factor in the World War. The second was the appearance of the United States, which became the deciding factor in the war. Romania created enthusiasm in Allied countries when it declared war on Austria-Hungary, August 27th. A sudden descent by a Romanian army into Transylvania on August 30th was hailed as the harbinger of further successes. These hopes were turned to ashes when von Mackensen headed an irresistible German and Austrian rush which fairly inundated Romania. The retreat from Transylvania by the Romanians was turned into a rout. Bulgarian forces invaded the Dobrodia region of Romania, and on November 28th, the seat of the Romanian government was transferred from Bucharest, the capital, to Yasi. Romania ceased to be a factor in the war on December 6th, when Bucharest fell to von Mackensen. Emperor Franz Josef of Austria-Hungary died on November 22nd, while Austrian hopes were at their highest. America's appearance as a belligerent was forecast on January 31, 1917, when Germany announced its intention of sinking all vessels in a blockade zone around the British Isles. Count von Bersdorf was handed his passports on February 3rd, and on April 2nd, President Wilson, in a remarkable address to Congress, advised a declaration of war by the United States against Germany. This was consummated by a formal vote of Congress declaring war on April 6th. This action by America was followed by the organization of a Council of National Defense. Under this body, the resources of the nation were mobilized. The Council was later virtually abandoned as an organizing factor, its functions going to the War Industries Board, presided over by Bernard Baruch, the Fuel Administration, under Dr. Harry A. Garfield, the War Trade Board, with Vance C. McCormick at its head, and other governmental bodies. George Creel headed the Committee on Public Information. Conscription was decided upon as the foundation of America's war-making policy, and the training of officers and privates in great training camps was commenced. Great shipping and aircraft programs were formulated, and the nation as a whole was placed upon a war footing. The Russian Revolution began in bread riots in Petrograd, spreading throughout that country, with the result that Russia disappeared as one of the Entente Allies. From August 1, 1917 to November 11, 1918. America's might and efficiency were revealed in the speed and thoroughness with which her military, naval, and civilian resources were mobilized and thrown into the conflict. Under the supervision of the Chief of Staff, two million American soldiers received the final touches in their military training and were transported safely overseas. They became the decisive factor in the war during the summer and fall of 1918. To their glory be it recorded that they never retreated. Chateau Thierry, Saint Mihel, Sicapre, Vorechet Wood, Cantini, Belial Wood, the Argonne, Sedan, and Stanny are names that will rank in American history with Yorktown. New Orleans, and Gettysburg. The land of dollars became overnight the land of high ideals to the civilized world. Lightless nights in cities, restriction on the use of gasoline on Sundays, and daylight savings legislation linked civilians to soldiers in war effort. Italy suffered a severe reverse beginning October 24, 1917, when the German forces rushed through a portion of the Italian army that had been honeycombed with pro-German socialistic propaganda. Canada again emblazoned its name in history through the heroic capture of Pascandela on November 6, 1917. The Russian Revolution turned to the Bolsheviki when Lenin and Trotsky, at the head of the Reds, seized Petrograd on November 7th and deposed Alexander Kerensky, leader of the moderate socialists. 
The Tsar Nicholas was executed by the victorious Bolsheviki, and the imperial family made captives. The British Mesopotamian forces advanced into Palestine and Mesopotamia, destroying the Turkish army under Ahmed Bey in a battle terminating on September 29, 1917. General Stanley Maud, the leader of the expedition, died in Mesopotamia November 18, 1917. General Allenby, commanding British and Arabian forces, routed and destroyed three Turkish armies in Palestine, capturing Jerusalem, which had been held by the Turks for 673 years. The turning point of the war came on March 29, 1918, when General Folk was chosen commander-in-chief of the Allied forces. This followed Germany's great drive on a 50-mile front from Arras to La Faire. Successive German thrusts were halted by the Allied forces, now strongly reinforced by Americans. Folk, patiently biding his time, elected to halt the German drive with Americans. The Marines of the United States forces were given the post of honor, and at Chateau Thierry, the counterthrust of Folk was commenced by complete defeat of the Prussian Guard and other crack German regiments by the untried soldiers of America. From Chateau Thierry to the armistice, which went into effect at 11 o'clock on November 11th, was only a short span of time but in it was compressed the humiliation of arrogant Teutonic imperialism, the destruction of militaristic autocracy, and the liberation of the world. End of chapter 56「Behind America's Battle Line General March's own story of the work of the Military Intelligence Division, of the War Plans Division, of the Purchase and Traffic Division, how men, munitions, and supplies reached the Western Front. It is important that a general summary of America's military preparations, a detailed description of the operations behind the battle line, and a detailed chronology of America's principal military operations in France during the year 1918 should be presented to the reader. Such a summary is afforded by the report of General Peyton C. March, Chief of Staff, United States Army, for the last year of the war. Addressing the Secretary of War, General March wrote in part, The signing of the armistice on November 11, 1918, has brought to a successful conclusion the most remarkable achievement in the history of all warfare. The entry of the United States into the war on April 6, 1917, found the nation about as thoroughly unprepared for the great task which was confronting it as any great nation which had ever engaged in war. Starting from a minimum of organized strength, within a short period of 16 months, the entire resources of the country in men, money, and munitions have been placed under central control, and at the end of this period the nation was in its full stride and had accomplished, from a military standpoint, what our enemy regarded as the impossible. The most important single thing, perhaps, in this record of accomplishment was the immediate passage by Congress of the draft law, without which it would have been impossible to have raised the men necessary for victory. In organizing, training, and supplying the vast numbers of men made available by the draft law, very many changes have been made necessary in the organization of the War Department and in the methods existing therein, which were inherited from the times of profound peace. Shortly after my installation as Chief of Staff, I adopted the principle of interchange of the personnel of the various staff corps of the War Department with men who had training in France, and in the application of this principle placed as the heads of various bureaus, officers selected on account of their ability and experience in the system of warfare as conducted in France. At this time, also, I found that the divisions organized in our armies were still regarded as separate units, designated by different titles in accordance with their origin. This made three different kinds of divisions in the United States Army, the Regular Army, the National Guard, and the National Army Divisions. All these distinctions were abolished and the entire army consolidated into a United States Army without regard to the source from which drawn. The source of supply of all replacements for the various elements of the army without regard to their origin was drafted men, and the titles had no significance whatever and were a source of possible disturbance from the standpoint of military efficiency. There was, in fact, no actual difference between these divisions with respect to efficiency. All have done high-grade work from whatever source drawn. 
all have shown courage and capacity for quick absorption of the fundamentals of modern military training and irresistible dash and force in actual fighting when i returned from france on march first nineteen eighteen i came back with the belief that the most fundamental necessity both for the american expeditionary force and for the success of the allies was that the shipment of troops to france should be vastly increased and should have priority over everything else and as this policy became effective a study was instituted looking to our putting in france if that was possible enough men to bring the war to a conclusion in the shortest period possible after a study of the entire situation including as accurate an estimate of the potential strength of our allies on the western front and of the probable german strength as was possible i came to the conclusion that the war might be brought to an end in nineteen nineteen provided we were able to land in france by june thirtieth of that year eighty american divisions of a strength of three million three hundred and sixty thousand men on july eighteenth nineteen eighteen i submitted to you a formal memorandum accompanied by a study of methods by which the men could be obtained the supplies procured and an analysis of the shipping which must be obtained in order to accomplish this very large military program this was accompanied by an estimate of the cost of the proposed program in this study i recommended to you the adoption as the american program of eighty divisions in france and eighteen at home by june thirtieth nineteen nineteen based on a total strength of the american army of four million eight hundred and fifty thousand men this was approved by you and by the president of the united states and adopted as our formal military program to carry this program into effect required the adoption by congress of a change in the draft ages so as to include men between the ages of eighteen and forty-five years and also created a deficiency over the enormous appropriations already made by congress of some seven billion dollars the presentation of the program to congress accompanied by the statement that this increase in the army if laws were passed by congress which would make it effective would lead to success in nineteen nineteen produced prompt and favorable consideration by that body up to the signing of the armistice troops were being transported to france monthly in accordance with that program the results speak for themselves during the year the most important in the history of the country both from a military and civil standpoint there have been four heads of the general staff major general hugh l scott from the outbreak of the war until his retirement september twenty second nineteen seventeen general tasker h bliss from that date until may nineteenth nineteen eighteen major general john biddle acting chief of staff at periods during the absence of general bliss in france from october twenty ninth nineteen seventeen to december sixteenth nineteen seventeen and from january ninth nineteen eighteen to march third nineteen eighteen i assumed the duties of acting chief of staff on march fourth nineteen eighteen became chief of staff may twentieth nineteen eighteen and have continued on that duty since it was evident as the war progressed that the general staff was acting under an organization and in accordance with regulations which were not only unsuited to the duties and responsibilities confronting it but were wholly out of date and were not suited to any general staff organization successive revisions of the orders under which the general staff was acting were made as events demanded until the experience of the year crystallized the organization of the general staff into that set forth in general order number eighty of the war department this order divides the work of the general staff into four primary divisions one operations two purchase storage and traffic three military intelligence four war plans each of these divisions is under the direction of a director who is assistant chief of staff and is a general officer operations division the operations division is under the charge of major general henry jervey united states army as director of operations and assistant chief of staff this division is a consolidation of the former operations committee and equipment committee which pertained to the war college under the previous organization the operations division has had charge of the increase in personnel of the army during the year on june thirty nineteen seventeen the regular army consisted of two hundred and fifty thousand three hundred and fifty seven officers and enlisted men on august fifth nineteen seventeen three hundred and seventy nine thousand three hundred and twenty three officers and men of the national guard were drafted into the federal service 
there were a few special drafts of small numbers of National Guardsmen into the Federal Service after August 5, 1917. During the period covered by this report, this division handled the calls into service of men obtained under the draft, the organization of these men into divisions and units necessary for the Army, and turned over for shipment overseas up to November 8, 1918, 2,047,667 men. The grand total of men in the Army from returns for the period ending October 15th is 3,624,774. The force was organized into divisions, the proper proportions of corps, army, and service of supply troops, and of replacement camps and training centers for infantry, field artillery, and machine guns in the United States. Central officers' training schools were organized at each of the replacement camps. Replacement camps and training centers for the various staff departments were also organized. Development battalions were organized at all division camps, and large posts and camps for the purpose of developing men of poor physique and the instruction of illiterates and non-English-speaking men of the draft. During the fiscal year, 5,377,468 officers and men were moved by railroad to and from the camps. The Operations Division has, during the year, also handled all matters connected with the adoption of new types of equipment, fixing allowances for various units, the preparation of tables of equipment for them, and the distribution and issue of equipment, and the determination of priorities of such issue. It has supervised and studied the needs of camps and construction work therein, and this work in general has been characterized by marked ability and devotion to duty. Purchase, Storage, and Traffic Division The Division of Purchase, Storage, and Traffic is under the charge of Major General George W. Guttals, United States Army, as Assistant Chief of Staff and Director of Purchase, Storage, and Traffic. This division was organized by merging divisions previously created, and which had been called Storage and Traffic and Purchase and Supply. The new division thus organized was subdivided into Embarkation Service, Storage, Inland Traffic Service, and Purchase and Supply Branch. Embarkation At the outbreak of the war, the Quartermaster's Department had charge of the transportation of troops and supplies, and continued to exercise these functions until August 4, 1917, when they were transferred to a separate division of the General Staff, specially created for the purpose, and designated as the Embarkation Service. As already noted, this was subsequently merged with the Storage and Traffic Division. Two primary ports of embarkation were established, one with headquarters at Hoboken, New Jersey, and the other at Newport News, Virginia, under the command of a general officer. The quartermaster's department was operating a service to Panama from New York, but with the shipment of troops to France, a new condition arose, which was met only in part by taking over the Hoboken piers, formerly owned by the Hamburg American and North German Lloyd steamship companies, and the magnitude of the undertaking necessitated additional facilities. The situation at New York is complicated by the large amount of general shipping using the port, the diversified interests, even those of the government, and the complicated jurisdiction. An effort was made to bring about such a consolidation and unification as to secure greater cooperation with increased efficiency. To this end, the War Board for the Port of New York was established in November 1917. It was vested with full power and authority to make rules and regulations for operating the facilities of the port, to determine priorities, and to do what was necessary to provide for the prompt and economical dispatch of the business of the government in and about the port. Mr. Irving T. Bush was selected as the board's representative with the title of Chief Executive Officer. In addition to representing the board, he was to arrange for the cooperative use of piers, warehouses, lighterage, terminals, railroads, trucking, and all other transportation facilities in and about the port. In addition, the need was felt for having a shipping expert closely associated with the embarkation service, familiar with the facilities at various ports, so that he could properly assign ships, select ships for the cargo to be moved, and arrange for their loading. Mr. Joseph T. Lilly was selected for this work and appointed director of embarkation. In February 1918, the available cargo ships were not sufficient to carry the supplies needed for maintaining the troops overseas. To secure the requisite additional tonnage necessitated taking ships from the existing trade routes 
and determining from what imports and exports they could best be spared without interference with those which were absolutely necessary. This brought about a new situation which could be handled only by those having a knowledge of the trades as well as the characteristics of various ships serving them, since some of them were suitable for War Department needs and some were not. It had happened that an advantageous exchange of ships could have been made with the Allies by which valuable time could have been saved in getting over cargo, but there was lack of knowledge as well as lack of authority. The whole situation was gone over at a conference between the Secretary of War and the Chairman of the Shipping Board, as a result of which the Shipping Control Committee was created, consisting of Mr. P. A. S. Franklin, Chairman, Mr. H. H. Raymond, and Sir Connop Guthrie, representative of the Allies' shipping interests. The allocation and distribution of available tonnage, as well as questions of exchange of ships, was vested in this committee. So far as the work of the War Department was concerned, the committee was charged with the loading and unloading cargo, coaling, supplies, repairs, and, except where vessels were commanded by the Navy, of inspection and manning. They also have charge of the management and operation of docks, piers, slips, loading and discharging facilities under the control of the department, or of any board, officers, or agency operating such facilities, together with the direction and management of minor craft to be used in connection with the handling of steamers and their cargoes in port. The amount of cargo shipped overseas, the efficiency of the loading, and the reduction of time of stay in the ports attest to the efficient manner in which the committee has operated and it is not too much to say that they are to be largely credited with the results that have been accomplished. Expeditionary depots were operated at Boston, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Baltimore, Maryland, primarily for the movement of freight. When cargo ships having accommodation for troops were loaded at these ports, troops for the available space were sent from the camps under the direction of the commanding general at Hoboken. Similarly, shipments of troops were made from Montreal, Canada, and Halifax, Nova Scotia, when practicable. Cargo shipments were also made from other points on the Atlantic and Gulf coasts. On May 25, 1918, the Water Transport Branch of the Quartermaster's Department was transferred and made a part of the Embarkation Service. In April, conditions abroad necessitated the speeding up shipments of troops and brought to the service such transports as the British government could spare for the purpose, which have been continued in use. The Army transports are officered and manned by the Navy, as is the greater number of the cargo ships. The arrangements for transferring ships to naval control, as well as for convoys for troop and cargo ships, are handled through the Chief of Operations of the Navy, who has given every assistance. The way in which the work has been handled by the Navy is shown by the loss of no troop ships which were under their protection on the eastbound trips. Inland Traffic the Inland Traffic Service was established on January 10, 1918. As the government had taken over all of the railroads, the necessity for working in harmony with the organization that was placed in charge was apparent, and the Railroad Administration was requested to recommend a competent traffic man to handle the work. This resulted in the selection and assignment of Mr. H. M. Adams as chief of the section. He in turn secured his expert assistance through the Railroad Administration. At the time the section was formed, approximately 15,000 carloads of War Department property held in cars were congesting various Atlantic ports. Steps were taken which relieved this condition and brought about an orderly movement of the traffic when and in the quantities desired. The value of the inland traffic service was soon demonstrated and led to a reorganization with authority to take over the transportation organizations of the various bureaus of the War Department, both at Washington and throughout the country, so that as now organized, the Chief of the Inland Traffic Service exercises direct control of the transportation of troops, of the supplies of and for the various bureaus of the War Department, and for the contractors working for the several bureaus. This control extends over the entire country through the medium of representatives stationed at various traffic centers. Working in conjunction with the Railroad Administration has resulted in minimizing the burdens of the carriers. The work has been performed most efficiently. More than five million troops have been moved from their homes, from one camp to another, and from camps to the points of embarkation within the period covered by this report. Arrangements have been made by which this branch will take charge of all express movements for the War Department, as well as the tracing of all movements of all War Department property, 
including the contractors and others for the various bureaus. Purchase and Supply The Purchase and Supply branch is organized into the following subsections. Supply Program, Purchase, Production, Finance, and Emergency. Military Intelligence Division The Military Intelligence Division has as Director Brigadier General Marlborough Churchill, United States Army, Assistant Chief of Staff. This division, which had been a branch, first of the War Plans Division and then of the Executive Division of the General Staff, was separated completely and made an independent division by general orders, which reorganized the General Staff, thus putting the Military Intelligence Division on a par with similar services of General Staffs of other nations of the world. The duties of the Military Intelligence Division consist, in general, in the organization of the intelligence service, positive and negative, including the collection and coordination of military information, the supervision of the department intelligence officers and intelligence officers at posts, stations, camps, and with commands in the field, in matters relating to military intelligence, the direction of counter-espionage work, the preparation of instruction in military intelligence work for the use of our forces, the consideration of questions of policy promulgated by the general staff in all matters of military intelligence, the cooperation with intelligence branches of the general staffs of other countries, the supervision of the training of officers for intelligence duty, the obtaining and issuing of maps, and the disbursement of and accounting for intelligence funds. One of the important functions of the Director of Military Intelligence Division is that of coordinating the work of this service with other intelligence agencies. Possible duplications of work and investigation by the State Department, Treasury Department, Department of Justice, Navy Department, War Trade Board, and the War Department are avoided or adjusted at weekly conferences held at the Department of Justice and attended by representatives of these departments who consider matters of common interest. For a similar purpose, the Director of Military Intelligence is a member of the Fire Prevention Committee, the War Industries Board, and the National Research Council. For the purpose of securing close cooperation between the military intelligence services of the nations associated in the war, the British and French governments were requested by the United States to send officers to this country for liaison duty. These officers have been of great assistance in accomplishing this end because of their knowledge of the details of intelligence work in Europe. For the performance of the service for which the Military Intelligence Division was developed, eight sections have been established, each dealing with its peculiar problems and working in close liaison with its fellows. It may not be amiss to call attention to the enthusiastic cooperation which this division has consistently received from the various other intelligence agencies, civilian and others, the American Protective League, the Department of Justice, the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Customs, the War Trade Intelligence, have all cooperated in the heartiest manner with each and every effort of the Military Intelligence Division. Indeed, it is hardly saying too much to state that the success of the Military Intelligence Division has in a very large measure been due to the loyal assistance which it has received at all times from the various agencies whose functions are similar to its own. War Plans Division The War Plans Division of the General Staff is under the direction of Brigadier General Lytle Brown as Director and Assistant Chief of Staff. A very large volume of work has been accomplished by this division during the year, exclusive of subjects pertaining to the historical branch, the inventions section, and routine matters. 9,287 cases were handled by the division during the year. These included studies as to policies for defense and the organization of the military forces in general, as published in the Tables of Organization, completed studies on the policy and plans for training the Army in general, training replacement troops, training cadres, training centers, training schools, schools for senior and staff officers, and plans for physical reconstruction and vocational training of wounded soldiers. In addition, through the training section, the War Plans Division has supervision of training in general and has kept in touch by inspections by its officers with methods used and progress made. The Legislative, Regulations, and Rules branch of the War Plans Division has handled numerous changes in Army regulations and War Department orders made necessary by the present emergency and has considered bills before Congress pertaining to the Army. 
The historical branch of the General Staff was organized on March 5, 1918, to collect and compile the records pertaining to the war under the approved policy, and satisfactory progress is being made. To June 30, 1918, 67,022 photographs and 2,590 feet of motion picture film have been received. The Inventions section was organized April 16, 1918. This section has taken over from the different agencies of the government the preliminary consideration of inventions and ideas of inventions of a military nature, with a view to placing before the proper bureaus of the War Department those having sufficient military value to warrant test and development at the expense of the government. From April 16, 1918 to June 30, 1918, 4,645 cases were handled a number of which were of exceptional merit and have already been put to use. The Chief of Staff has as his principal assistant Major General Frank McIntyre, United States Army, who acts as Executive Officer for the General Staff and also for the Chief of Staff in his absence. Beside the General Staff divisions, which have been referred to in the foregoing, there has been established in the General Staff a morale section under charge of Brigadier General E. L. Munson, United States Army, which has for its object primarily the stimulation of morale throughout the Army and maintaining a close connection and liaison with similar activities in civilian life. This section had only gotten fairly into operation before the signing of the armistice, but had already shown its value as a military asset. Another important addition to the organization of the General Staff has been the establishment of a personnel section under charge of Brigadier General P. P. Bishop, United States Army. In this section has been consolidated the handling of appointments, promotions, and commissions of the entire official personnel of the United States Army. This section has proved to be of the greatest value and has come to stay. The signing of the armistice has interrupted the conclusion of the organization now underway for the consolidation of procurement and storage under the Director of Purchase, Storage, and Traffic, but the principle is sound from the standpoint of organization and extremely economical in its results. The supply of officers for the very large military program has been throughout one of the most important problems which confronted the general staff. I have already indicated in the statement of the functions of the operations division of the general staff the organization of central training camps for officers throughout the United States. When, however, we embarked upon the final program of placing 80 divisions in France, and 18 at home by June 30, 1919, which involved an army of approximately 4.8 million. The problem of the supply of officers became so serious that an understanding was obtained with the great mass of educational institutions throughout the United States, resulting in the development of the Student Army Training Corps. This scheme absorbed for military purposes the academic plants of some 518 colleges and universities throughout the country and for vocational training in the Army embraced some 80 more. This corps was put under the charge of Brigadier General Robert I. Rees, United States Army, and in its development we have had the energetic cooperation of college presidents and responsible college authorities throughout the entire United States. At the same time, in order to increase the supply of officers, the course at West Point was cut down to one year's intensive training with the idea of placing at the disposal of the government 1,000 officers a year graduated from that extremely efficient plant, rather than the graduation of about 200, which had been the case previously throughout the war. The separation of the Air Service from the Signal Corps, under the provisions of the Overman Bill, and the establishment of a Bureau of Military Aeronautics, under Major General William L. Kenley, United States Army, and of a Bureau of Aircraft Production, under Mr. John D. Ryan, marked an extremely important step forward in the development of this portion of the military establishment. The armistice closes out this matter with the two branches of the Air Service in a state of marked efficiency, and establishes unquestionably the necessity for the permanent separation of the Air Service from the Signal Corps in the reorganization of the Army. During this period, another new agency created in the War Department by executive order was the Office of the Chief of Field Artillery. This office has been filled by Major General William J. Snow, United States Army. This establishment was accompanied by the creation in the American Expeditionary Force in France of the Office of Chief of Artillery on General Pershing's staff, having similar relation to all the artillery of the Expeditionary Force 
which the chief of field artillery has toward the mobile artillery at home. The work of this office has been accomplished by a marked increase in the efficiency of the training system in the various field artillery camps, and the office itself has proved to be of distinct value. I have directed the divisions of the general staff concerned to study and submit for your consideration a plan for the reorganization of our army, which will take advantage of our experience in this war, which has brought about many changes in organization of all arms of the service, and has developed new arms not known when the war started. The air service, the tank corps, the development of heavy mobile artillery, the proper organization of divisions, corps, and armies, all will be set forth in the scheme which will be submitted to you with the recommendation that it be transmitted for the consideration of Congress. The conduct of the American troops in France, their progressive development in military experience and ability, the fine staff work, and the modesty and gallantry of the individual soldier is a matter of pride to all Americans. General Pershing and his command have earned the thanks of the American people. The work of General Tasker H. Bliss as military representative of the War Department with the American section of the Supreme War Council at Versailles has been of the greatest value to the War Department. I cannot close this report without making of record the appreciation of the War Department of the work of the many trained and patriotic officers of the Army whom the destiny of the war did not call to France. These officers, forced to remain behind in the United States by the imperative necessity of having trained men to keep the machine moving, have kept up their work with such intelligence, zeal, and devotion to duty as to show a high order of patriotism. The officers and men who have not been able, on account of the armistice, to be transported to France deserve also, with their comrades in France, the thanks of the American people. End of chapter 57「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーミッシュ」「ピーimmediately upon receiving my orders i selected a small staff and proceeded to europe in order to become familiar with conditions at the earliest possible moment the warmth of our reception in england and france was only equalled by the readiness of the commanders-in-chief of the veteran armies of the allies and their staffs to place their experience at our disposal in consultation with them the most effective means of cooperation of effort was considered with french and british armies at their maximum strength and all efforts to dispossess the enemy from his firmly entrenched positions in Belgium and France failed, it was necessary to plan for an American force adequate to turn the scale in favor of the Allies. Taking account of the strength of the central powers at that time, the immensity of the problem which confronted us could hardly be overestimated. The first requisite, being an organization that could give intelligent direction to effort, the formation of a general staff occupied my early attention. General Staff A well-organized general staff, through which the commander exercises his functions, is essential to a successful modern army. However capable our division, our battalion, and our companies as such, success would be impossible without thoroughly coordinated endeavor. A general staff broadly organized and trained for war has not hitherto existed in our army. Under the commander-in-chief, this staff must carry out the policy and direct the details of administration, supply, preparation, and operations of the army as a whole, with all special branches and bureaus subject to its control. As models to aid us, we had the veteran French general staff and the experience of the British who had similarly formed an organization to meet the demand of a great army. By selecting from each the features best adapted to our basic organization, and fortified by our own early experience in the war, the development of our great general staff system was completed. The general staff is naturally divided into five groups, each with its chief who is an assistant to the chief of the general staff. Group 1 is in charge of organization and equipment of troops, replacements, tonnage, priority of overseas shipment, the Auxiliary Welfare Association, and cognate subjects. Group 2 has censorship, enemy intelligence, 
gathering and disseminating information, preparation of maps, and all similar subjects. Group 3 is charged with all strategic studies and plans, movement of troops, and the supervision of combat operations. Group 4 coordinates important questions of supply, construction, transport arrangements for combat, and of the operations of the service of supply, and of hospitalization and the evacuation of the sick and wounded. Group 5 supervises the various schools and has general direction and coordination of education and training. The first chief of staff was Colonel, now Major General, James G. Harbord, who was succeeded in March 1918 by Major General James W. McAndrew. To these officers, to the Deputy Chief of Staff, and to the Assistant Chiefs of Staff, who, as heads of sections, aided them, great credit is due for the results obtained not only in perfecting the general staff organization, but in applying correct principles to the multiplicity of problems that have arisen. Organization and Training After a thorough consideration of Allied organizations, it was decided that our combat division should consist of four regiments of infantry of 3,000 men, with three battalions to regiment and four companies of 250 men each to a battalion, and of an artillery brigade of three regiments, a machine gun battalion, an engineer regiment, a trench mortar battery, a signal battalion, wagon trains, and the headquarters, staffs, and military police. These, with medical and other units, made a total of over 28,000 men, or practically double the size of a French or German division. Each corps would normally consist of six divisions, four combat, and one depot, and one replacement division, and also two regiments of cavalry, and each army of from three to five corps. With four divisions fully trained, a corps could take over an American sector with two divisions in line and two in reserve, with the depot and replacement divisions prepared to fill gaps in the ranks. Our purpose was to prepare an integral American force, which should be able to take the offensive in every respect. Accordingly, the development of a self-reliant infantry by thorough drill in the use of the rifle and in the tactics of open warfare was always uppermost. The plan of training after arrival in France allowed a division one month for acclimatization and instruction in small units from battalions down, a second month in quiet trench sectors by battalion, and a third month after it came out of the trenches when it should be trained as a complete division in war of movement. Artillery, Airplanes, and Tanks Our entry into the war found us with few of the auxiliaries necessary for its conduct in the modern sense. Among our most important deficiencies in material were artillery, aviation, and tanks. In order to meet our requirements as rapidly as possible, we accepted the offer of the French government to provide us with the necessary artillery equipment of 75s, one 55mm howitzers, and one 55 GPF guns from their own factories for 30 divisions. The wisdom of this course is fully demonstrated by the fact that, although we soon began the manufacture of these classes of guns at home, there were no guns of the calibers mentioned manufactured in America on our front at the day the armistice was signed. The only guns of these types produced at home thus far received in France are 109 75mm guns. In aviation, we were in the same situation and here again the French government came to our aid until our own aviation program should be under way. We obtained from the French the necessary planes for training our personnel, and they have provided us with a total of 2,676 pursuit, observation, and bombing planes. The first airplanes received from home arrived in May, and altogether we have received 1,379. The first American squadron completely equipped by American production, including airplanes, crossed the German lines on August 7, 1918. As to tanks, we were also compelled to rely upon the French. Here, however, we were less fortunate, for the reason that the French production could barely meet the requirements of their own armies. It should be fully recognized that the French government has always taken a most liberal attitude and has been most anxious to give us every possible assistance in meeting our deficiencies in these as well as in other respects. Our dependence upon France for artillery, aviation, and tanks was, of course, due to the fact that our industries had not been exclusively devoted to military production. All credit is due our own manufacturers for their efforts to meet our requirements, as at the time the armistice was signed we were able to look forward to the early supply of practically all our necessaries from our own factories. 
the welfare of the troops touches my responsibility as commander-in-chief to the mothers and fathers and kindred of the men who came to france in the impressionable period of youth they could not have the privilege accorded european soldiers during their periods of leave of visiting their families and renewing their home ties fully realizing that the standard of conduct that should be established for them must have a permanent influence in their lives and on the character of their future citizenship the red cross the young men's christian association knights of columbus the salvation army and the jewish welfare board as auxiliaries in this work were encouraged in every possible way the fact that our soldiers in a land of different customs and language have borne themselves in a manner in keeping with the cause for which they fought is due not only to the efforts in their behalf but much more to other high ideals their discipline and their innate sense of self-respect it should be recorded however that the members of these welfare societies have been untiring in their desire to be of real service to our officers and men the patriotic devotion of these representative men and women has given a new significance to the golden rule and we owe to them a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid combat operations during our periods of training in the trenches some of our divisions had engaged the enemy in local combats the most important of which was seizure prey by the twenty sixth on april twentieth in the tool sector but none had participated in action as a unit the first division which had passed through the preliminary stages of training had gone to the trenches for its first period of instruction at the end of october and by march twenty first when the german offensive in picardy began we had four divisions with experience in the trenches all of which were equal to any demands of battle action the crisis which this offensive developed was such that our occupation of an american sector must be postponed on march twenty eighth i placed at the disposal of marshal folk who had been agreed upon as commander-in-chief of the allied armies all of our forces to be used as he might decide at his request the first division was transferred from the tool sector to a position in reserve at chaumont et vienne as german superiority in numbers required prompt action an agreement was reached at the abbeville conference of the allied premiers and commanders and myself on may second by which british shipping was to transport ten american divisions to the british army area where they were to be trained and equipped and additional british shipping was to be provided for as many divisions as possible for use elsewhere on april twenty sixth the first division had gone into the line in the montdidier salient on the picardy battlefront tactics had been suddenly revolutionized to those of open warfare and our men confident of the results of their training were eager for the test on the morning of may twenty eighth this division attacked the commanding german position in its front taking with splendid dash the town of cantini and all other objects which were organized and held steadfastly against vicious counter-attacks and galling artillery fire although local this brilliant action had an electrical effect as it demonstrated our fighting qualities under extreme battle conditions and also that the enemy's troops were not altogether invincible the germans aisne offensive which began on may twenty seventh had advanced rapidly toward the river marne and paris and the allies faced a crisis equally as grave as that of the picardy offensive in march again every available man was placed at marshal folk's disposal and the third division which had just come from its preliminary training in the trenches was hurled to the marne its motorized machine-gun battalion preceded the other units and successfully held the bridgehead at the marne opposite chateau tire the second division in reserve near montdidier was sent by motor trucks and other available transport to check the progress of the enemy toward paris the division attacked and retook the town and railroad station at bruche and sturdily held its ground against the enemy's best guard divisions in the battle of belleau wood which followed our men proved their superiority and gained a strong tactical position with far greater loss to the enemy than to ourselves on july first before the second was relieved it captured the village of vaux with most splendid precision meanwhile our second corps under major-general george w reed had been organized for the command of our divisions with the british which were held back in training areas or assigned to second-line defenses five of the ten divisions were withdrawn from the british area in june three to relieve divisions in lorraine and the bosquet and two to the paris area to join the group of american divisions which stood between the city and any further advance of the enemy in that direction 
The great June-July troop movement from the states was well under way, and although these troops were to be given some preliminary training before being put into action, their very presence warranted the use of all the older divisions in the confidence that we did not lack reserves. Elements of the 42nd Division were in the line east of Reims against the German offensive on July 15th and held their ground unflinchingly. On the right flank of this offensive, four companies of the 28th Division were in position in face of the advancing waves of the German infantry. The 3rd Division was holding the bank of the Marne from the bend east of the mouth of the Sumerlin to the west of Maisy, opposite Chateau Thierry, where a large force of German infantry sought to force a passage under support of powerful artillery concentrations and under cover of smoke screens. A single regiment of the 3rd wrote one of the most brilliant pages in our military annals on this occasion. It prevented the crossing at certain points on its front while, on either flank, the Germans, who had gained a footing, pressed forward. Our men, firing in three directions, met the German attacks with counter-attacks at critical points and succeeded in throwing two German divisions into complete confusion, capturing 600 prisoners. The great force of the German Chateau Thierry offensive established the deep Marne salient, but the enemy was taking chances, and the vulnerability of this pocket to attack might be turned to his disadvantage. Seizing this opportunity to support my conviction, every division with any sort of training was made available for use in a counter-offensive. The place of honor in the thrust toward Saison on July 18th was given to our first and second divisions, in company with chosen French divisions. Without the usual brief warning of a preliminary bombardment, the massed French and American artillery, firing by the map, laid down its rolling barrage at dawn while the infantry began its charge. The tactical handling of our troops under these trying conditions was excellent throughout the action. The enemy brought up large numbers of reserves and made a stubborn defense, both with machine guns and artillery, but through five days fighting the 1st Division continued to advance until it had gained the heights above Soissons and captured the village of berzy le sec The 2nd Division took beau Repair Farm and Virzy in a very rapid advance and reached a position in front of Tini at the end of its second day. These two divisions captured 7,000 prisoners and over 100 pieces of artillery. The 26th Division, which, with a French division, was under command of our First Corps, acted as a pivot of the movement toward Soissons. On the 18th it took the village of Torcy, while the 3rd Division was crossing the Marne in pursuit of the retiring enemy. The 26th attacked again on the 21st, and the enemy withdrew past the Chateau Thierry Soissons Road. The 3rd Division, continuing its progress, took the heights of Mont Saint Pierre and the villages of Chartaves and Yogon in the face of both machine gun and artillery fire. On the 24th, after the Germans had fallen back from Trugny and Epides, our 42nd Division, which had been brought over from the Champagne, relieved the 26th and, fighting its way through the Fort de Ferre, overwhelmed the nest of machine guns in its path. By the 27th it had reached the Orc, where the 3rd and 4th Divisions were already advancing, while the French divisions, with which we were cooperating, were moving forward at other points. The 3rd Division had made its advance into Roncheret Wood on the 29th, and was relieved for rest by a brigade of the 32nd. The 42nd and 32nd undertook the task of conquering the heights beyond Sergue, the 42nd capturing Sergi, and the 32nd capturing Hill 230, both American divisions joining in the pursuit of the enemy to the Vesla, and thus the operation of reducing the salient was finished. Meanwhile, the 42nd was relieved by the 4th at Sherry Chartueve, and the 32nd by the 28th, while the 77th Division took up a position on the Vesla. The operations of these divisions on the Vesla were under the 3rd Corps, Major General Robert L. Bullard commanding. Battle of Saint Mihiel with the reduction of the Martin salient, we could look forward to the concentration of our divisions in our own zone. In view of the forthcoming operation against the Samuel salient, which had long been planned as our first offensive action on a large scale, the First Army was organized on August 10th under my personal command. While American units had held different divisional and corps sectors along the Western Front, there had not been up to this time, for obvious reasons, a distinct American sector, but, in view of the important parts the American forces were now to play, 
it was necessary to take over a permanent portion of the line. Accordingly, on August 30th, the line beginning at Port sur Ciela, east of Moselle, and extending to the west through saint Miel, thence north to a point opposite Verdun, was placed under my command. The American sector was afterwards extended across the Meuse to the western edge of the Argonne Forest, and included the 2nd Colonial French, which held the point of the salient, and the 7th French Corps, which occupied the heights above Verdun. The preparation for a complicated operation against the formidable defenses in front of us included the assembling of divisions and of corps, and army artillery, transport, aircraft, tanks, ambulances, the location of hospitals, and the molding together of all the elements of a great modern army with its own railroads, supplied directly by our own service of supply. The concentration for this operation, which was to be a surprise, involved the movement, mostly at night, of approximately 600,000 troops, and required for its success the most careful attention to every detail. The French were generous in giving us assistance in corps and army artillery, with its personnel, and we were confident from the start of our superiority over the enemy in guns of all calibers. Our heavy guns were able to reach Metz, and to interfere seriously with German rail movements. The French independent air force was placed under my command, which, together with the British bombing squadrons and our air forces, gave us the largest assembly of aviation that had ever been engaged in one operation on the Western Front. From Les Epagres, around the nose of the salient at saint Miel to the Moselle River, the line was roughly forty miles long, and situated on commanding ground greatly strengthened by artificial defenses. Our first corps, 82nd, 90th, 5th, and 2nd Divisions, under command of Major General Hunter Liggett, restrung its right on Point a Masson, with its left joining our 3rd Corps, the 89th, 42nd, and 1st Divisions, under Major General Joseph T. Dickman, in a line to Sivray, were to swing in toward Vinules, on the pivot of the Moselle River, for the initial assault. From Sivray to Muley, the 2nd Colonial French Corps was in line in center, and our 5th Corps, under command of Major General George H. Cameron, with our 26th Division and a French Division at the western base of the salient, were to attack three difficult hills, Le Parra, Comre, and Amarantha. Our 1st Corps had in reserve the 78th Division, our 4th Corps the 3rd Division, and our 1st Army the 35th and 91st Divisions, with the 80th and 33rd available. It should be understood that our corps organizations are very elastic, and that we have at no time had permanent assignments of divisions to corps. After four hours' artillery preparation, the seven American divisions in the front line advanced at 5 a.m. on September 12th, assisted by a limited number of tanks manned partly by Americans and partly by French. These divisions, accompanied by groups of wire cutters and others armed with Bangalore torpedoes, went through the successive bands of barbed wire that protected the enemy's front line and support trenches, in irresistible waves on schedule time, breaking down all defense of an enemy demoralized by the great volume of our artillery fire and our sudden approach out of the fog. Our first corps advanced to Thay Court, while our fourth corps curved back to the southwest through Nonsard. The second colonial French corps made the slight advance required of it on very difficult ground and the 5th Corps took its three ridges and repulsed a counterattack. A rapid march brought reserve regiments of a division of the 5th Corps into Vernoulet in the early morning, where it linked up with patrols of our 4th Corps, closing the salient and forming a new line west of Thiercourt to Vernoulet, beyond Fresnay and Wauvre. At the cost of only 7,000 casualties, mostly light, we had taken 16,000 prisoners and 444 guns, a great quantity of material, released the inhabitants of many villages from enemy domination, and established our line in a position to threaten Metz. The signal success of the American First Army in its first offensive was of prime importance. The Allies found that they had a formidable army to aid them, and the enemy learned finally that he had one to reckon with. Meuse Argonne Offensive, First Phase On the day after we had taken the St. Mihal salient, much of our corps and army artillery, which had operated at St. Mihel, and our divisions in reserve at other points, were already on the move toward the area back of the line between the Meuse River 
and the western edge of the forest of Argonne. With the exception of saint miel the old German front line from Switzerland to the east of Reims was still intact. In the general attack all along the line, the operation assigned to the American army as the hinge of this Allied offensive was directed toward the important railroad communications of the German armies through Miseris and Sedan. The enemy must hold fast to this part of his line, or the withdrawal of his forces with four years' accumulation of plants and material would be dangerously imperiled. The German army had as yet shown no demoralization, and, while the mass of its troops had suffered in morale, its first-class divisions, notably its machine-gun defense, were exhibiting remarkable tactical efficiency as well as courage. The German general staff was fully aware of the consequences of a success on the Musa argonne line, Certain that he would do everything in his power to oppose us, the action was planned with as much secrecy as possible, and was undertaken with the determination to use all our divisions in forcing decision. We expected to draw the best German divisions to our front line and to consume them while the enemy was held under grave apprehension, lest our attack should break his line, which it was our firm purpose to do. Our right flank was protected by the Meuse, while our left embraced the Argonne Forest, whose ravines, hills, and elaborate defense screened by dense thickets had been generally considered impregnable. Our order of battle from right to left was the Third Corps, from the Meuse to the Malancourt, with the 38th, 80th, and 4th Divisions in line, and the 3rd Division as Corps Reserve, the 5th Corps from Malancourt to Vacroix, with 79th, 87th, and 91st Divisions in line, and the 32nd Corps in reserve and the 1st Corps from Vaucroix to vina le chateau with 35th, 28th, and 77th Divisions in line, and the 92nd in Corps Reserve. The Army Reserve consisted of the 1st, 29th, and 82nd Divisions. On the night of September 25th, our troops quietly took the place of the French, who thinly held the line in the sector, which had long been inactive. In the attack which began on the 26th, we drove through the barbed wire entanglements, and the sea of shell craters across no man's land, mastering the first-line defenses. Continuing on the 27th and 28th, against machine guns and artillery of an increasing number of enemy reserve divisions, we penetrated to a depth of from three to seven miles, and took the village of Montfaucon and its commanding hill, and Exermont, Gercourt, Quisi, Sepsarge, Malancourt, Ivory, Epignaville, Epinonville, Charpentry, Viry, and other villages. East of the Musa, one of our divisions, which was with the 2nd Colonial French Corps, captured Marcheville and Rivilla, giving further protection to the flank of our main body. We had taken 10,000 prisoners, we had gained our point of forcing the battle into the open, and were prepared for the enemy's reaction, which was bound to come, as he had good roads and ample railroad facilities for bringing up his artillery and reserves. In the chill rain of dark nights, our engineers had to build new roads across spongy, shell-torn areas, repair broken roads beyond no man's land, and build bridges. Our gunners, with no thought of sleep, put their shoulders to wheels and drag poles to bring their guns through the mire in support of the infantry, now under increasing fire of the enemy's artillery. Our attack had taken the enemy by surprise, but, quickly recovering himself, he began to fire counter-attacks in strong force, supported by heavy bombardments with large quantities of gas. From September 28th until October 4th, we maintained the offensive against patches of woods defended by snipers and continuous lines of machine guns, and pushed forward our guns and transport, seizing strategical points in preparation for further attacks. Other Units with Allies Other divisions attached to the Allied armies were doing their part. It was the fortune of our Second Corps composed of the 27th and 30th Divisions, which had remained with the British to have a place of honor in cooperation with the Australian Corps on September 29th and October 1st in the assault on the Hindenburg Line where the San Quentin Canal passes through a tunnel under a ridge. The 30th Division speedily broke through the main line of defense for all its objectives, while the 27th pushed on impetuously toward the main line until some of its elements reached Goye. In the midst of the maze of trenches and shell craters, and under crossfire from machine guns, the other elements fought desperately against odds. In this and in later actions, from October 6th to October 19th, our 2nd Corps captured over 6,000 prisoners, 
and advanced over thirteen miles. The spirit and aggressiveness of these divisions have been highly praised by the British Army commander under whom they served. On October 2nd to 9th, our 2nd and 36th Divisions were sent to assist the French in an important attack against the old German positions before Reims. The 2nd conquered the complicated defensive works on their front against a persistent defense worthy of the grimmest period of trench warfare, and attacked the strongly held wooded hill of Blanc Mont, which they captured in a second assault, sweeping over it with consummate dash and skill. This division then repulsed strong counterattacks before the village and cemetery of St. Etienne and took the town, forcing the Germans to fall back from before Reims and yield positions they had held since September 1914. On October 9th, the 36th Division relieved the 2nd and, in its first experience under fire, withstood very severe artillery bombardment and rapidly took up the pursuit of the enemy, now retiring behind the Aisne. Meuse-Argonne Offensive, Second Phase The Allied progress elsewhere cheered the efforts of our men in this crucial contest as the German command threw in more and more first-class troops to stop our advance. We made steady headway in the almost impenetrable and strongly held Argonne Forest, for, despite this reinforcement, it was our army that was doing the driving. Our aircraft was increasing in skill and numbers and forcing the issue, and our infantry and artillery were improving rapidly with each new experience. The replacements fresh from home were put into exhausted divisions with little time for training, but they had the advantage of serving beside men who knew their business and who had almost become veterans overnight. The enemy had taken every advantage of the terrain, which especially favored the defense, by a prodigal use of machine guns, manned by highly trained veterans, and by using his artillery at short ranges. In the face of such strong frontal positions, we should have been unable to accomplish any progress, according to previously accepted standards, but I had every confidence in our aggressive tactics and the courage of our troops. On October 4th, the attack was renewed all along our front. The Third Corps, tilting to the left, following the brulieu cunel Road, our Fifth Corps took Gesne, while the First Corps advanced over two miles along the irregular valley of the Era River, in the wooded hills of the Argonne that bordered the river, used by the enemy with all his art and weapons of defense. This sort of fighting continued against an enemy striving to hold every foot of ground, and whose very strong counterattacks challenged us at every point. On the 7th, the First Corps captured Chatel Chiret and continued along the river to Cornet. On the east of the Musa sector, one of the two divisions cooperating with the French captured Consevoya and the Haumont Woods. On the 9th, the Fifth Corps, in its progress up the Ere, took Fayville, and the Third Corps, which had continued fighting against odds, was working its way through Brilou and Cunel. On the 10th, we had cleared the Argonne Forest of the enemy. It was now necessary to constitute a second army, and on October 9th, the immediate command of the first army was turned over to Lieutenant General Hunter Liggett. The command of the second army, whose divisions occupied a sector in the Wolvra, was given to Lieutenant General Robert L. Bullard, who had been commander of the first division and then of the third corps. Major General Dickman was transferred to the command of the first corps, while the fifth corps was placed under Major General Charles P. Summerall, who had recently commanded the first division. Major General John L. Hines, who had gone rapidly up from regimental to division commander, was assigned to the Third Corps. These four officers had been in France from the early days of the expedition, and had learned their lessons in the school of practical warfare. Our constant pressure against the enemy brought day by day more prisoners, mostly survivors from machine gun nests captured in fighting at close quarters. On October 18th, there was very fierce fighting in the Corée Woods, east of the Musa, and in the Ormont Woods. On the 14th, the 1st Corps took St. Euvin, and the 5th Corps, in hand-to-hand -hand encounters, entered the formidable Kremhilde Line, where the enemy had hoped to check us indefinitely. Later, the 5th Corps penetrated further the Kremhilde Line, and the 1st Corps took Champignuela and the important town of Grand Pré. Our dogged offensive was wearing down the enemy, who continued desperately to throw his best troops against us, thus weakening his line in front of our allies, and making their advances less difficult. Divisions in Belgium Meanwhile, we were not only able to continue the battle, but our 37th and 91st Divisions were hastily withdrawn from our front and dispatched to help the French army in Belgium. 
detraining in the neighborhood of Ypres, these divisions advanced by rapid stages to the fighting line and were assigned to adjacent French corps. On October 31st, in continuation of the Flanders offensive, they attacked and methodically broke down all enemy resistance. On November 3rd, the 37th had completed its mission in dividing the enemy across the Escalt River and firmly established itself along the east bank included in the division zone of attack. By a clever flanking movement, troops of the 91st Division captured Spital's Boschen, a difficult wood extending across the central part of the division sector, reached the Escot, and penetrated into the town of Odenarda. These divisions received high commendation from their corps commanders for their dash and energy. Musa-Argonne, Last Phase On the 23rd, the 3rd and 5th Corps pushed northward to the level of Bentheville. While we continued to press forward and throw back the enemy's violent counterattacks with great loss to him, a regrouping of our forces was under way for the final assault. Evidences of loss of morale by the enemy gave our men more confidence in attack and more fortitude in enduring the fatigue of incessant effort and the hardship of very inclement weather. With comparatively well-rested divisions, the final advance in the Musa argonne front was begun on November 1st. Our increased artillery force acquitted itself magnificently in support of the advance, and the enemy broke before the determined infantry, which, by its persistent fighting of the past weeks and the dash of this attack, had overcome his will to resist. The Third Corps took Ancreville, Dulcon, and Adavana, and the Fifth Corps took Landra et Saint Georges and pressed through successive lines of resistance to Bayonville and Chennery. On the second, the First Corps joined the movement which now became an impetuous onslaught that could not be stayed. On the 3rd, advanced troops surged forward in pursuit, some by motor trucks, while the artillery pressed along the country roads close behind. The 1st Corps reached Othe and chatignan sur bar the 5th Corps, Fossa and Nuart, and the 3rd Corps, Hallis, penetrating the enemy's line to a depth of 12 miles. Our large calibered guns had advanced and were skillfully brought into position to fire upon the important lines at Montmide, Lugion, and Conflans. Our third corps crossed the Musa on the fifth, and the other corps, in full confidence that the day was theirs, eagerly cleared the way of machine guns as they swept northward, maintaining complete coordination throughout. On the sixth, a division of the first corps reached a point on the Musa opposite Sedan, twenty-five miles from our line of departure. The strategical goal, which was our highest hope, was gained. We had cut the enemy's main line of communications, and nothing but surrender or an armistice could save his army from complete disaster. In all, forty enemy divisions had been used against us in the musa argonne battle. Between September 26th and November 6th, we took 26,059 prisoners and 468 guns on this front. Our divisions engaged were the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 26th, 28th, 29th, 32nd, 33rd, 35th, 37th, 42nd, 77th, 78th, 79th, 80th, 82nd, 89th, 90th, and 91st. Many of our divisions remained in line for a length of time that requires nerves of steel, while others were sent in again after only a few days' rest. The 1st, 5th, 26th, 42nd, 77th, 80th, 89th, and 90th were in the line twice. Although some of the divisions were fighting their first battle, they soon became equal to the best. Operations East of the Musa On the three days preceding November 10th, the 3rd, 2nd Colonial, and 17th French Corps fought a difficult struggle through the Musa Hills south of Stine and forced the enemy into the plain. Meanwhile, my plans for further use of the American forces contemplated an advance between the Musa and the Moselle in the direction of Longvy by the 1st Army, while at the second time the 2nd Army should assure the offensive toward the rich coal fields of Brie. These operations were to be followed by an offensive towards Chateau Salins, east of Moselle, thus isolating Metz. Accordingly, attacks on the American front had been ordered, and that of the Second Army was in progress on the morning of November 11th, when instructions were received that hostilities should cease at 11 o'clock a.m. At this moment, the line of the American sector, from right to left, began at Port sur Ciela, thence across the Moselle to Vendires, and through the Wouvre to Bisonvaux in the foothills of the Musa. Thence, along the foothills and through the northern edge of the Wouvre forests, to the Musa at Musée, 
thence along the Musa connecting with the French under Sedan. There are in Europe altogether, including a regiment and some sanitary units with the Italian army, and the organizations at Bramansk, also including those en route from the States, approximately 2,053,347 men, less our losses. Of this total, there are in France 1,338,169 combat troops. Forty divisions have arrived, of which the infantry personnel of ten have been used as replacements, leaving thirty divisions now in France organized into three armies of three corps each. The losses of the Americans up to November 18th are killed and wounded, 36,145, died of disease, 14,811, deaths unclassified, 2,204, wounded, 179,625, prisoners, 2,163, missing, 1,160. We have captured about 41,000 prisoners and 1,400 guns, howitzers, and trench mortars. Finally, I pay supreme tribute to our officers and soldiers of the line. When I think of their heroism, their patience under hardships, their unflinching spirit of offensive action, I am filled with emotion which I am unable to express. Their deeds are immortal, and they have earned the eternal gratitude of our country. End of chapter 58